Calypso to Collapso The Resurrection of Vivian Stanchel By Jeffrey Giuliano Stephen Galbraith Avalon Giuliano A miracle has occurred, one I never thought I'd see, but one my daughter was desperate for. Rupert, Silky, and I are becoming a family again. We would do nothing to damage this healing. A long time ago we were angry and hurt. And now we fear to find that hurt in your book. I do not doubt that you love Vivian. Kai Longfellow Stanchel, 2009 Personally, I don't think I am bizarre. It would be silly to say I don't notice that I'm different from other people, but my difference is a result of me being ruthlessly myself. I don't from day to day strive for effect, but I am not unconscious of the effect which I cause. Perhaps it would be more comfortable if I normaled up. Then I wouldn't get touched and gawked at, and that would alleviate things, but I would be losing points personally, you see? Vivian Stanchel He was like a medieval storyteller musician. You know, the fourteenth-century fools who'd breeze into your life with a lute. Rodney Slater Vivian was a one-off. He found the root which brought together elements of the intellectual with rock and roll and comedy and poetry. He was incredibly well-read. And it was just a unique combination. He couldn't possibly create a niche or an art form because no one else was clever enough to do it. Steve Winwood Vivian was one of the most talented, bizarre, absurd, unfathomable, and magnificent Englishmen ever to have drawn breath. Stephen Fry Dedicated to my son, Eden Garrett Giuliano. So happy you're here, Egg. Jeffrey Giuliano, Patia, Thailand, 2009. Contents. Author's Note. Serpent of the Perfumed Parlor, Stephen Galbraith. Bad Blood, Jeffrey Giuliano. Chapter 1. The Odd Boy. Viv Begins, 1943-1960. Chapter 2. Fate Plays the Straight Man, Early Years, 1961-1965. Chapter 3. Dada for Now, Bonzo Barks, 1966-1967. Chapter 4. Howling Like a Hypocrite at the Auto de Fe, Bonzo's in Motion, 1968. Chapter 5. Busted, The Cracks Are Showing, 1969-1970. Chapter 6. The Strain. Bedtime for Bonzo. 1971-1973. Chapter 7. The Mr. Hyde in Me. The Decline. 1974-1976. Chapter 8. Wolves Mate for Life. Vivian and Kai. 1977-1978. Chapter 9. Sir Henry at Rawlinson's End. Masterwork. 1979. Chapter 10. King Cripple. The Fall. 1980-1983. Chapter 11. Stinkfoot Cometh. Last Words. 1984-1987. Chapter 12. Bouts of Sobriety. The End of the Beginning. 1988-1994. Chapter 13. Calypso to Collapso. Our Friend Ends. 1995. Serpent of the Perfumed Parlor. Author's Note. Stephen Galbraith. Jeffrey and I first began work on our biography of Vivian Stanchel in 1997. Jeffrey had actually begun the project in the early 1980s as a book on the Bonzo Dog Band. I am particularly grateful for the opportunity to talk with members of his family and close friends, such as Mark Stanchel, Kai Longfellow Stanchel, Silky Stanchel, Sidney Longfellow, Mark Milmore, and Pete Moss. All were very generous with their time and spirit. When Chris Welch released Ginger Geezer, Jeffrey and I made the difficult decision to shelve our project. I honestly did not think we would ever have the chance to finish our work. 
Our goal was always to celebrate the life and art of Vivian Stanchel. Now we have the opportunity to share what we have learned with the people who love him the most, his fans. I do believe our book adds to Vivian's story, and I am thrilled with the possibility of finally sharing it with the worldwide Bonzo Stanchel community. Stephen Galbraith, September 2009 Bad Blood, Jeffrey Giuliano Vivian Stanchel, ex-Bonzo dogman, staggered by the abandoned church to the local outdoor as he'd done nearly every evening for the last year. Though winter was fast approaching and the weather grew increasingly bitter, he wore only a brightly colored dressing gown and sandals. A young couple with nowhere to go huddled on the steps of a nearby building. They slept here because it was a posh sort of area, and they had seen some good days begging for spare change. Stanchel caught their attention as he had several times before. He was one of the most unusual blokes they had ever seen, strangely regal despite being so obviously disheveled. His ragged appearance and tired visage reminiscent of some other old-timers they had seen on the streets. As he walked by, they didn't bother to ask him for change, and they weren't surprised when he didn't offer any. He never did. For some reason Vivian paused, turned, and looked up at them. Every time he walked by, he did the same. He'd stare as if in recognition, then continued on his way. He seemed to be about sixty. His hair was long and ragged, at least on the sides of his head. He had a menacing, untamed beard. His eyes were tired and red, but burned with inspiration. He smelled of booze, and his deep, raspy voice somehow slurred. A right pair you are sitting out on a night like this, likely to catch cold and die, or worse. If you need a place to stay for a few days, you are welcome to stay with me. Though obviously pissed and coughing fiercely as he spoke, he spoke with an air of nobility, the fearsome voice of an aristocrat marooned in London suburbia. There was a softness to his voice as well, and in his eyes perhaps even a hint of loneliness. They sized up their unexpected benefactor both as a friend and potential mark. They might have even felt some fleeting affection for this odd ginger-haired geezer who was willing to pull them off the street for the night. They nodded, gathered their stuff, and fell in behind him, walking to the rhythm of the odd gentleman's ivory-tipped cane as it struck upon the pavement. They followed him through the streets, and when he stopped in front of a building in a fairly posh neighborhood, they were somehow surprised, but followed him in. The stranger opened the door, and they climbed the long stairs to his apartment. Stanchel flung open the door. The flat was a mess. Stuff was strewn everywhere. The first things they noticed were the drawings and paintings. They were everywhere, covering all of the walls, piled on the floor. Only one sat neatly on an easel. Fierce and colorful, the work was grotesque yet humorous. A little while later, when they settled in, they would notice that nearly all were unfinished. Most of the paint was there, but there was always a corner somewhat left undone. The next thing they spied was the odd assortment of instruments. They recognized the banjo, the two guitars, drums, and tuba. Other instruments were unfamiliar to them, a French horn, a coronet, and a variety of ukuleles, euphoniums, and trumpets. Then they saw them, on the walls, several gold and platinum records. They had heard rumors that he had once been a prominent musician. Later, when they had a closer look, they would see that, unbelievably, they were for work with Steve Winwood. "'Does my apartment surprise you?' he asked. They didn't reply, but the Watusi spear that hung upon the walls certainly came as a shock. He assured them that it was made of the finest meteorite as he waved it at them, threatening to gore them if they should ever prove in any way uncivil. A huge false penis propped on the top shelf of the open closet. Letters, many unopened, bits of paper and keys with little labels strung about. There were several African carvings, a fish tank containing one large fantail goldfish, and on the wall a portrait of Jesus Christ hung in a horrid gold frame. There were numerous books as well, with titles like Heroes of Darkest Africa, 
An old printing press was pushed close to one wall. A set of dentures lay on a shelf. They are my father's, he remarked, noticing their stares. He watched them carefully the entire time through his clear plastic hexagonal glasses. More shocking still was a photo of the old boy with John Lennon. Could he have possibly known the Beatles? Careful to step over the flotsam and jetsam scattered about the floor, they walked gingerly, still overcome, not by the sloppiness of the place, but by the sheer richness of the cluttered tableau before them. When they eventually made their way to the bedroom, they found it to be equally scattered with belongings— Dry-cleaning, sheathed in plastic, hung all around the room, even more paintings, and an ornate, wicked-looking dagger on the wall. The bed, too, was piled with papers, a ceramic leg, scattered sheet music, and pill bottles. Directly above his pillow there was a skylight, and just above the headboard several more unfinished paintings. The flat was unworldly. If there had been a large pill which said, "'Eat me,' It would not have surprised them. Perhaps there was a bottle for that around here somewhere as well. It would take a couple of exhausting days to overcome their uneasiness and fascination, then a few more weeks to get to the point where they could actually begin to heartlessly and systematically clean him out. The two looked at each other, the same thoughts running through their minds. Who the fuck is this bloke? Chapter 1. The Odd Boy. Viv Begins. 1943-1961. You can trace our name back to the time of the Crusades. It either means Stone Hall or St. Anne's Hall. But there is only one family of stanchels running through from that time, so there are no offshoots. Occasionally, with a name like Stanchel, we used to get people writing us called Standstill or Sandstill, this sort of stuff. Vivian used to pass these to me and say, You reply to them, just in case they want to breed with us. Mark Stanchel. The doctors were absolutely gobsmacked. Aline Stanchel's soon-to-be-born baby boy was indeed humming in the womb, just as the expectant mother had been telling them. Vivian's earliest warblings, however, would only be experienced through the stethoscopes of a few nonplussed Tweedy M.D.'s. Baby Vivian made his first live appearance after twenty-two hours of crushing labor in the midst of a violent thunderstorm. It was March 21st, 1943, in pastoral Schillingford, Oxfordshire. He was christened Victor Arthur Stanchel, named indirectly after his father, Vivian George Stanchel, who preferred to be called Fick. Vivian's family nickname was Ansley, which is what his younger brother Mark calls him still. His mother would always call him Non or Nonny, even through adulthood. In his late teens, however, he legally changed his name to Vivian, his father's real name, and one that he had always loved. Almost immediately after his birth, Vivian and his mother evacuated their North London Walthamstow home to escape the daily bombing of the German Luftwaffe. Vic Stanchel, meanwhile, had enlisted in the Royal Air Force, where he quite happily taught the troops self-defense until the higher-ups moved him into the ciphers. In Vic's absence, the already intense bond between mother and son increased as the two enjoyed a good war in rural Schillingford, Oxfordshire. Vivian would warmly recall these idyllic years in his 1991 autobiographical playlet produced for The Late Show in London. The first two years of my childhood were wonderful, just me and mum and me and my voices, evacuated from the East End to Schillingford, Oxfordshire, idyllic. I remember everything. Bombs whumping and deranged cows budging into the kitchen, and Mum shuffling them out with a broom. And I was running, running, running. I had to be strapped into my pram. I can still smell that pram and feel the sticky blue leatherette of it. I hated it, and the tugging. At the bottom of the long garden, the Thames with paddle boats, sardine they were, with dancing, battle-happy on leave shoulders, and their girls dancing, laughing, and shouting back to me. 
The quaint quality of the Stanchel's pastoral life created an extraordinary closeness between mother and son, a closeness that Vivian's father would never share. When the war ended and Vic came home, the Stanchel family returned to Walthamstow to begin their new life together. For Vivian, it was the end of an especially idyllic time. Always needing to be the center of attention, Vivian found his father's presence intensely threatening to his relationship with his mum. Viv's distancing himself from his father had begun and would only dramatically increase as time passed. When Vivian was six, the Stanchels gave birth to their second son, Mark. Having already lost Vivian to an unbreakable bond with Aline, Vic immediately took the baby boy under his wing. Vivian and Mum must have bonded a hell of a lot, a rather difficult birth and all of it, Mark Stanchel explains. I think when I was born, I became the apple of father's eye and Vivian was shoved back a bit. I don't think he ever got over this. I don't think he ever got over being number uno of his ono. Sadly, this dichotomy within the Stanchel family would ultimately sour the lifelong relationship between both Vivian and his father, and to a lesser extent, Vivian and Mark. It has been said that Vivian was something of a child prodigy, but whether or not this was true is unclear. The only source documenting his prestigious behavior is Vivian himself. I was freakishly precocious, he declared. First words at four months, and I could have a conversation with you at ten months, and that's pretty scary. What's more, he also claimed to have memories reaching back to the age of just eight months old. Mark, though, remembers things rather differently. I don't think he hardly said a word until he was two, and then started speaking sentences. These are not the only childhood memories of Stanchel's which may be a tad skewed. Throughout his entire life, Viv would describe his father as a roller-skating eccentric. He worked in the city, but did not have a car and could not afford the train, so he would roller-skate to work in galoshes, he'd frequently tell friends and reporters. However, younger brother Mark politely disagrees, simply stating, Yes, he wore galoshes, but I don't think he actually roller-skated much. Perhaps Stancha was attempting to creatively alter his exceedingly normal surroundings. He would, after all, certainly take liberties with reality throughout his life. He was very creative. Let me put it another way, observes Vivian's second wife, author Kai, Pamela Longfellow. Was he a liar? No. Was he an embellisher? Did he make things larger, better, bigger, worse? Yes. But I don't believe he was ever lying. Truth is malleable. And that's how Vivian saw it. So was he lying? No, he was not. He used reality, whatever that is, in the same way that he used paint. In this way, Stanchel's remarkable life and art would be a vigorous campaign waged against all things bland and banal, as in the world of his parents, a world from which he would desperately try to escape. To this end, his imagination simply dabbed a bit of color on those he found annoyingly normal. In Vivian's young life, the primary source of irritating normalcy was his father. Vic Stanchel was painfully aware of his family as being absolutely middle class and set out to remedy it, even if only artificially. Though the family residing in North London Walthamstow, the Stanchels always contended they lived in nearby Chillingford, which was only a notch higher in the dreary world of suburban English post-war sensibilities. Furthermore, in a bizarre attempt at upward mobility, Vic began to affect a posh BBC accent and demanded his young sons do likewise. The change was terribly difficult for the boys, who often found themselves having their plummy accents thrashed into them by their determined father. I don't know at what point he affected this accent, but it's what I got, Vivian explained. All of my contemporaries in the streets of Walthamstow were ordinary. It was very difficult. Took me through a bit of a hard time, really. Such an unnatural change might be given to cause a severe identity crisis in a young man. My blood responses are to working-class people, Stanchel explained. But unless I affect a working-class accent, filter the accent somehow, it's also Dada. Though often at cross-purposes, both father and son were actively redefining their lives and inventing new ones for themselves. 
not something that happens every day in families as seemingly ordinary as the staunchly middle-class stanchels. But for the most part, Vivian had a rather typical upbringing, taking part in normal boyish behavior. I used to kick sand castles over when I was a kid. Horrible boy, he remembered. On the other hand, I suppose that's the closest people are going to ever come to sculpture in their lives, apart from their haircuts. He quite liked Rupert the Bear books and also reveled in the adventures of Desperate Dan. In his early teens, he and Mark kept toads and mice. Vivian often carried a favorite mouse in his pocket when he went to school. Stanchel began his education with a brief stay at a private primary school before enrolling in a convent school called St. Helens. The family was traditionally Catholic. There I was taught a lot of perverted, one-sided rubbish by nuns who were otherwise quite okay, he later explained. I got by as the clever boy who built matchbox galleons they could display on open days. He was later accepted into South End School for Boys. It was here that Stanchel had his first on-stage experience. I had written a play about Robin Hood, in which made Marion was a bird I rather fancied, he once recalled. In the play I got to kiss her, but the main thing was that I actually got to fire an arrow. For one moment I could fire an arrow perhaps fifty feet into the air just to menace the clouds. It was a divine moment. As well as excelling in the arts, Viv showed a keen interest in history and the sciences, particularly biology. Mathematics, on the other hand, was one subject he could never quite grasp or even see the need to. Although Stancho ultimately found success in the performance and recording of music and narrative, his heart was truly invested in being a painter. From the time he was just two or three, he was prestigiously producing rather sophisticated paintings. Of course, young Vivian also took a very strong interest in music. Although his father was relatively unmusical, his paternal grandfather's family owned a music shop in Walthamstow. It was a cobwebbed shop full of dusty mahogany drawers and cases out of which his grandfather sold sheet music, harmonicas, and all sorts of instruments. His mother's side of the family was also quite musical. They were a large family of nine with nearly every child playing a different instrument. His maternal granddad's specialty was the banjo, so there was always a couple available to muck around with. Vivian immediately took a liking to the instrument and enjoyed trying to play a few tunes on it. Like most families, the Stanchels had a large collection of 78 RPM records, which, when the boys weren't whipping them at one another in the garden, filled the house with the sounds of big band swing. Another Stanchel favorite were comedy albums from performers such as Leslie Cerrone and Flanagan and Allen. Hunting Tigers Out in India was an early favorite of Vivian's and would, of course, eventually find its way into the Bonzo's repertoire. As Mark Stanchel remembers, his brother had yet to be taken with the early sounds of rock and roll. He wasn't so strong on the guitar, which I suppose everyone was playing in the advent of Lonnie Donegan and Bill Haley but it was everything else but. One artist who left an indelible mark on Vivian was English legend and ukulele ace George Formby. Formby was an absolute favorite throughout his life. Vivian loved Formby's ukulele playing so much that the Hawaiian four-string became his principal instrument. Perhaps Stanchel's most beloved musician, however, was American guitarist Link Ray, who Vivian discovered later on in life I'd die and go to hell to play like that, Vivian revealed. Link Ray is the man. By God, he is the guitar man. When not listening to Formby or big band jazz, Vivian and Mark were often out treasure hunting at jumble sales and second-hand shops. The Stanchel boys were both habitual collectors of arty junk. Mark later went on to have several antique shops of his own. Vivian, of course, never stopped collecting. Such treasure hunting lent itself well to Vic's growing interest in music, as he began to collect any sort of instrument he could get his hands on, Mark remembers. When we went round to junk shops years ago, horn gramophones were a pound each. Musical instruments like trombones you could buy for just two quid. So we had lots of instruments knocking about. 
When the conventional instruments became rather too conventional, Vivian sought out the obscure and even took great fun in creating original musical compositions. He could pick up a piece of housepipe, stick a funnel down the end, and play that, remembers Mark. There was always something coming out of him. From the traditional to the obscure, Vivian snatched up most anything that produced sound and gave it a go. One particular instrument both Stanchel boys found quite fascinating was the phono fiddle. Mark remembers. We used to have phono fiddles, which you hold between your knees, and it's sort of one big long mahogany neck. It's literally got one string on it with a brass horn coming out from the sound box. It's played with a violin bow. They're rare now. They were quite fun. As he grew older, Stanchel continued to seriously collect instruments. Eventually, he would amass a rather famous and eclectic collection. Vivian also fell in love with fashion, buying second-hand clothes with the same verve as used instruments. On any given day, Viv could be seen warbling about on the streets of North London, decked out in full Victorian regalia, three-piece suits replete with high collars and old silk top hats, thank you very much. Now all of this did not sit very well with his father, a fairly well-known sportsman in North London. Vic Stanchel hoped his boys would be chips off the old block. Vivian, however, never particularly took to any sort of sport although he later admitted to enjoying discus and javelin throwing. Vivian's heart was firmly planted in the world of art, so sport, like mathematics, never really came into it. I got out of team sports by feigning sanity, Vivian once remarked. As Stanchel entered his mid-teens, he temporarily abandoned his natty Victorian garb and joined up with a local group of teddy boys, quickly adopting the greasy-haired James Dean Rocker image have a look at Vivian on the cover of his 1981 Teddy Boys Don't Knit LP. He joined his mates in waking up the sleepy neighborhoods with the roar of their motorbikes, 30 strong. Drinking and scrapes were the order of the day, though for Vivian such boorish behavior may have been more a matter of survival than lifestyle. Even when I was at school, I never looked normal, he admitted. To avoid being beaten up, I would have to devise gags and strokes and pranks or behave in an outlandish manner in order to be taken under the wings of the bullies. I was therefore purchasing, by my bad behavior, self-protection. Reminiscing about his teddy boy days, Stanchel openly conceded to never having been a proper teddy boy or even being very good at fighting. Oh, I'd never dream of beating up any human being, he revealed, just kittens or poodles. There one stands a fighting chance. Vivian ultimately found his place as the smart, witty joker of the gang, earning the nickname The Professor. The posh accent, which had been literally bashed into me, kept leaking out, he later explained. So in that particular gang, I was tolerated as an amusing mascot. Stanchel's new Teddy Boy lifestyle only served to further strain the rocky father-son relationship— well, of course, my father was terribly straight, remembers Mark Stanchel. You've got to realize he was a man that went to the city every day and caught the train at 8.15 wearing a three-piece pinstriped suit and in the early days a bowler cap and very shiny shoes. The last thing he wanted was a son with a couple of earrings who drove around on an AJS 350 motorbike with a pack of chums and was obviously not going to follow in his prestigious footsteps. Vic had lost all control over his eldest son, and it smarted. He would command Vivian to stay in his room only to have him slink down the drain pipe for another night of incautious revelry. In a desperate attempt to regain and assert control, Vic would occasionally unleash a walloping upon Vivian, which only served to distress Aline and had little or no effect on Vivian. At sixteen, Vivian got into some sort of disciplinary scrape at school and was slated to be expelled. Fortunately, his mother quickly intervened and persuaded the headmaster to recommend Vivian for acceptance into the local art school. It was a glorious turn of events for Stanchel. He was accepted into Walthamstow's art school and wished wholeheartedly to attend. 
His parents, however, had other, rather extraordinarily different ideas. Though his mother had been instrumental in getting him placed in the art school, she still firmly believed her eldest son to be religiously inclined and destined to become a priest. Vivian, however, had already long parted ways with Catholicism. His break with the church coincided with the translation of the Mass from Latin to English. I didn't understand it any more, he later recalled. It had no cadence. There was no longer any chime to me. I had been demystified to a point where it had been made base and ordinary, and certainly spiritual life should never be ordinary. He later put it more bluntly in 1991. Without the hallucinatory mumbo-jumbo, it became for me at best vulgar and far too dull for my kidney. I like my steak heretic and bloody. Clearly, Vivian was not on the path to becoming Father Stanchel, the profound blessing one is sure for the Catholic Church and the papal solidarity of the Vatican. Vic, meanwhile, was determined to see Vivian become a barrister. One could only imagine what sort of barrister Viv might have become. When asked if he had been a good one, Vivian once responded, No, it takes logic. Needless to say, Vivian was not going to pursue either vocation. My mother thought I was religiously inclined, he recalled, which is true, but not in the way that she could ever understand. She certainly wanted me to be a priest, the old man, on the other hand, was very keen on me being a barrister, but they both wanted me to be what they wanted me to be. And that could never be. Stanchel desperately wished to attend art school and tried to gain the permission and support of his father, who vehemently disapproved and showed no signs of being swayed. You've got to remember that father was sort of embarrassingly middle class, explains Mark Stanchel. Art school at that time was still considered far too beatnik and wild for anyone who was going to seriously take up a career. You obviously can't go into art school and turn up in insurance or shipping, which was what so many fathers think their children should be. Vic was so strongly against the idea that he flat out refused to lend any financial aid towards Vivian's education. He equated artists with gypsies and ne'er-do-wells, remembered Viv and wouldn't give the requisite amount to fund me to go through art school. If Stanchel wanted to attend art school, he would have to break away from his family and raise the cutter himself. In May of 1961, Stanchel threw everyone for a loop by signing up for a six-month stint as a steward aboard the SS Orsova, a cruiser on the P&O's Orient Line. A steward? Vivian was once asked. A skewered, he replied. It must have been a Greek ship. Yes, a Greek Catholic ship. Madonna kebab. Delicious. And delicious it was. Six months of world travel, or brawling and whoring my way around the world, as Vivian put it, provided the adventurous life he'd craved as a young boy when he'd imagined himself to be the hero of C.S. Forrester naval adventure and constructed models of Spanish galleons. Vivian often recalled his days aboard the Orsova with the salty ruminations of a sea-weathered Ahab, if by chance the first mate had been Lewis Carroll. Though perhaps prone to imagination and colorful exaggeration, aren't all good sea tales? Stanchel remembered. Great brawl in Port Said, pure Douglas Fairbanks. There was a bloke flogging squizzamaroos, a dirk in a plated leather scabbard, quid or something. Bloke did a switcheroo on the squizzamaroo. You bought the thing, and it was just the length of plated barrel boy. Tony, enormous arms, grabbed the first bloke. They're all in turbans. Expect we all look the same to them, too, and started thrashing him to get my squizzamaroo. Then all these dusky men started pouring out of the bordellos and windows, dropping down with daggers between their teeth, vegetables sprawling all over the quay. Great fight! Swam back to the ship in lukewarm water full of barracudas. Vivian also revealed this somewhat sordid tale. In Hong Kong, whatever you asked for, comma, rickshaw, or something to eat, they'd take you to a brothel, inescapable. 
Had them all on parade, feel their titties. I'll take that one. Absolutely no way I could get an erection. Strap a lolly stick to it, nothing. Not the slightest bit interested. Wound up with this woman doing an obscene suggestive dance while a toothless gaggle held a portable revolving fan over my penis. Aboard the SS Orsova, the world was Vivian's jumble sale. His fascination and assimilation of all things exotic was rejuvenated to the fullest as he patronized the shops and markets of ports of call in such exotic locations as Australia, Hong Kong, and Papua New Guinea. When Viv returned to England in October 1961, he was armed with two-toed Japanese boots, colorful saris, and a magnificent wardrobe of various exotic clothing. He spent a short time in the West Essex School of Art before enrolling at the Central School of Art the following autumn. Vivian was embarking upon a new life of personal and artistic freedom, a journey he would make without the support of his embittered dad, as Mark remembers. My father never really took him back in or wanted to have anything to do with him after that. In a way, however, the two were now inextricably free of each other and could both thus move on without interference with the other's dreams or dramas. A blessing for both, and a license for Vivian to embark upon a singular artistic journey that would very quietly perk up the entire lunacy-loving world of a generation of young people weaned on the goony, airy humor of post-war Britain and molded by the heady, unlikely times to come. Little did anyone suspect that like John Lennon, Samuel Beckett, Dylan Thomas, Harold Pinter, or perhaps the older René Magritte, Vivian was fated by his mile-high talent and singular vision never to follow anyone, but rather lead the way with a panache that was and still is as outlandish and ultimately important as the man himself. Vivian, like his mates Jimi Hendrix and John Lennon, was an entirely unique one-man species that had the unlikely gift of presenting his wildly intelligent, often hallucinatory vistas to a waiting world. Vivian Stanchel was more social critic than clown, more artist than pop star a liquid Hieronymus Bosch who spilled out onto his times, staining and coloring a colorless, conventional world. For Vivian, fame was to be fleeting, riches non-existent. His life to come would be an often torturous spiral of manic ups and hellish downs from which his great work was born and remains solid today. That only a select few ever really got it in the first place is now inconsequential. For those who do get it, the tribe of Sir Viv, who like their art with a capital F, who regularly holiday at Rawlinson's End, who keep their clips on and take the taxi to the tent, their lives will be forever colored by Vivian's work, making Viv all the more special. Few would have wanted to live Vivian's life, but it is a blessing for all of us that he had the courage to do so. Chapter 2. Fate Plays the Straight Man. Birth of a Band. 1962-1965. I had no intention of being a musician. I was to be a painter and sculptor, that was it. Painter. Full stop. It never occurred to me to be anything else. Vivian Stanchel. Vivian Stanchel was 19 when he arrived at the Central School of Art in London in the fall of 1962. The British art schools of the 60s hold a hallowed place in rock and roll legend. Nearly every great English band of the period had a significant art school connection. Notable art school alumni include Pete Townsend, Keith Richards, Eric Clapton, David Bowie, John Lennon, and Eric Burden. Art schools attracted students who, though talented, were academically unqualified for or simply uninterested in attending university. Most art students, while intensely dedicated to their art, also were practiced acolytes of serious decadence. Drinking, drugs, and sexual promiscuity were very much a part of the unofficial curriculum. Vivian was amongst kindred spirits at last. Freed from his father's restrictions and the divine expectations of his mother, 
Stanchel embraced a new life. Vivian's first passion was always painting. At first, it was the Dadist, the founder of the Cabaret Voltaire, who pushed anti-art in the early 1900s. Viv fell for the Dada artist like a love at first sight, and their genius was a lifelong inspiration. Along with the Dadists, Stanchel admired the works of Hieronymus Bosch and Claude Monet. He also had a passion for pop art, especially advertising graphics and comic books. Together, these influences formed an eclectic mix that would help define Stanchel's eccentric palette and his emergence as one of Britain's most original artistic personas. Vivian was a talented painter, more talented than he ever dared to feel. He consistently struggled with the medium, which would assail his confidence in his innate artistic abilities. Throughout his life, Stanchel began many paintings he would never finish, always a corner left untouched, or a bit missing here and there, as if he feared the criticism that came with completion. Vivian's inner struggles fueled his deep respect for the really first-rank painters which he held dear. He considered them to be true geniuses. Stanchel's artistic frustration also fueled a growing intolerance of the theories pushed by art schools of the day. In particular, he began to tire of the emphasis on the subjectivity of art. Art schools played up the idea that every student's work, viewed on a subjective level, had merit. Being an artist was simply a matter of enrolling. Vivian felt this attitude was superficial and pretentious. He became increasingly annoyed by the fact that the curriculum did not stress discipline, study, and the mastery of craft as essential ingredients in art. While Stanchel spent his days studying art and painting, he reserved nights for revelry. He would dress in grand Victorian style, emulating another of his influences, Oscar Wilde, and he would go out drinking in the local pubs, or perhaps to the Turkish baths in Holborn. His compatriot in many of these nocturnal adventures was a new acquaintance from Manchester by the name of Larry Smith. Mr. Stanchel was standing still on a traffic island in Oxford when we first met, recalls Smith. He was coming to town to buy some paint. Actually, we got on quite well from the start. Viv and Larry soon shared a tiny flat in Islington. Their landlord insisted on calling Vivian Mr. Standstill over his repeated objections. The nickname stuck. Another of Stanchel's companions during this period was fellow attractive art student Monica Pizer. When they met, Vivian fell for her almost immediately. The two began an on-again, off-again relationship, which would eventually lead to their marriage in 1968. With Larry or Monica in tow, Stanchel habituated the seedier side of London life. It was during one of these nightly excursions that a chance meeting occurred a meeting that would shape much of Vivian's professional life. Fortune's instrument was a young wannabe fascist named Rodney Slater. Slater first noticed Stanchel at a party in a renovated church. Evidently, Vivian made a strong first impression. In Slater's words, There was this big ginger geezer in a frock coat and a huge beard who got up in the pulpit and was acting away all night. Slater immediately decided that he should meet this odd fellow. The events of the evening conspired against him, however. What with the stabbings and the police raid and things, I didn't really get to talk to him that night. A few weeks later, Slater ran into Stanchel at the Pillars of Hercules pub. They talked over a few pints and quickly became mates. They hadn't known each other long, but Slater invited Stanchel, who was homeless at the time, to move in with him in West Dulwich. Viv later described his first visit to Rodney's flat. He had a huge swastika. The ceiling was painted red with a white circle swastika in the middle and all the rest of it. It was only years later that I realized he wasn't taking this very seriously at all, but it certainly had quite an effect on passers-by to see Rodney dressed as the Fuhrer, shouting obscenities and so on, accusing people of all kinds of racial discrepancies. Needless to say, Vivian accepted Rodney's invitation. Just in case future career opportunities in fascism didn't pan out, Slater was cultivating a musical career. He and a chap named Sidney Nichols were heading up a trad jazz band at the Royal College of Art, where they played regularly at the canteen. 
A talented multi-instrumentalist, Slater kept a rather large collection of musical instruments lying around the flat. Stanchel found the pile of instruments irresistible and began to fiddle around. Desperately in need of a tuba player and noting Vivian's interest, Slater approached him. "'Do you know how to play the tuba?' he asked. "'No,' replied Vivian. "'But I'll try.' Vivian gave it a shot and found that he could actually play it, after a fashion. "'I just found that I had a natural knack for the instrument,' Viv explained. "'So I can play any brass. I can play anything a bit.' Within the week, Stanchel found himself on stage, standing at the back of Slater's musical ensemble, farting away. Never content in the background, one night Stanchel asked if he could try singing a song. Now Vivian was an unlikely front man. At the time he weighed a hefty seventeen stone, had his head shaved, and wore a long, drooping mustache. Obviously more of a tuba player than a flash lead singer. The band, however, let him take a stab at it. Vivian was a natural, possessing the onstage presence of a seasoned entertainer with excellent vocal chops to boot. He would never again return to the role of anonymous tuba handler. Once in the spotlight, Vivian began performing neo-Dadist material, singing newspaper clippings and reciting ad hoc poetry. Many years later, Vivian would laugh at all of this art school nonsense. It was pretentious, he admitted, but also damn good fun. Sometime along the way, Stanchel and Slater decided to name the band to figure out how they turned to their beloved Dadaist. Tristan Thara, one of the founders of Dada, had composed poetry by cutting out words from newspapers and arranging them in random order. By juxtaposing random images, he composed poems such as White Giant Leper of the Countryside. Jean Arp, Dadist painter and sculptor, used a similar method in his artwork when he composed his famous collage According to the Laws of Chance. Arp explains the theory behind this work. I further developed the collage by arranging the pieces automatically, without will. I called the process according to the laws of chance. I maintained that anyone who followed this law was creating pure life. Stanchel and Slater had used similar methods in art school to come up with names for their paintings. Now they proceeded to draw random words from a hat according to the laws of chance. The result? The Bonzo Dog Dada Band. Bonzo Dog, a portly cartoon character, was the creation of illustrator George Ernest Studi. Bonzo's fame was at its peak from approximately 1910 to 1930, when his image could be found on a postcard, in books, on pin cushions, even molded into salt and pepper shakers. Stanchel had put Bonzo in the hat. Bonzo was straight out of the 1920s kitsch that he'd loved as a kid. Perhaps now he saw a bit of himself in Bonzo, a mischievous British bulldog who chased women and was always getting himself into trouble. The Bonzo Dog Dada Band appeared on the musical horizon at the advent of a British musical revolution. Even as the Bonzos were wreaking havoc at the Royal College, rock and roll was being imported from America, and the likes of the Beatles were preparing to conquer pop art forever. The early Bonzos, however, would not be influenced by rock, but rather by jazz, the art school music of choice in the late 1950s and early 1960s. The great musical debate at the time was over whether you preferred traditional or modern jazz. Trad jazz, associated with Count Basie, Duke Ellington, and Louis Armstrong, held sway prior to the 1950s. The rise of modern jazz or bebop in the late 1940s and 1950s, led by artists such as Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, and John Coltrane, threatened to overwhelm traditional jazz. In the art schools, the influence of modern jazz was particularly strong. Associated with existentialism and the avant-garde, the genre embodied the self-interested seriousness of the young, unaccomplished art student. They took their jazz very seriously, shunning the traditional jazz they considered deeply mundane. 
Surprisingly, trad jazz rebounded in the late 1950s, temporarily eclipsing modern jazz in popularity and achieving some commercial success. At the center of the revival were acts such as Acker Bilk, the Temperance Seven, and the Elberts. While Acker Bilk and the Temperance Seven chose to play straight jazz, others, like the Elberts, took trad and turned it on its head, using the music as a vehicle for their own dadistic and nonsensical artistic purposes. Without the Elberts, there would never have been a bonzo dog band. The Alberts had an iconoclastic visual slap happiness, explains Arthur Brown, leader of the crazy world of Arthur Brown, and one of the premier showmen of the period. I remember when we started at the UFO. At the time, there were the Alberts. They also had mechanical creatures, the robots, which Roger Ruskinspear took his inspiration from. The Alberts were of the same pedigree as the Bonzos. They were before the Bonzos, then the Bonzos took over. The leaders of the Alberts were Bruce Lacey, Tony Gray, and his brother Dougie Gray. They brought in various musicians to fill out the band for their gigs. Rodney Slater had gigged with them a couple of times. Bruce Lacey, a mechanical artist and former student of Roger Spear, future bonzo dog Roger Ruskin Spear's father, devised the Alberts robots and mechanical creatures, including a bubble-blowing machine, Lacey was also known for his interest in explosives. Roger Ruskinspear met Bruce Lacey through his father and credits Lacey's work as being a major influence. Yes, well, I do have to own up that Bruce Lacey was my inspiration. Lacey used to play with the Alberts. When I first saw them, I thought, wow, how can people get away with this? Because they used to play badly, and Bruce Lacey used to make all these contraptions which would explode. He was a demolition officer in the war, in charge of explosives. The same way the goons came out of the war as stand-up comics, the Alberts and Bruce came out of the war with X surplus equipment, which they performed with. I was very interested in radio and X surplus equipment, and came the same route and wound up in art school. In addition to the complex contraptions and explosives, a typical Albert show incorporated several neo dadist routines. A show at the establishment in Soho included a surreal quiz show hosted by question master Bruce Lacey. Lacey would ask the first contestant a question. Before the contestant would have a chance to answer, he would get a bucket of whitewash dumped over his head, to which the second contestant would reply, could you repeat the question, please? At first, the Bonzo Dog Dada Band was less a band than an angry mob of neo-musicians. Depending on the night, they were anywhere between seven to twenty members. The shows were chaotic, to say the least. At many of their performances, the stage was barely large enough to hold the entire band. Everyone and their brother would show up armed with whatever instrument they felt like playing. On some nights, they would get ten tubas and nothing else, forcing Stanchel and Slater to constantly learn new instruments to cover up for band members who didn't quite show up. A spectacle like this could not be ignored for long, and word about the over-the-top Bonzo Dog Dada band was beginning to spread. Over the course of the next year, the nucleus of the Bonzo Dog Band was beginning to gel. The precondition for joining the band was attitude. Musical proficiency was not important. New members were brought in regardless of whether or not they knew how to play an instrument. It was with this rigid criteria in mind that Stanchel recruited his old drinking buddy, Legs Larry Smith. If you want to join Bonzo Dog, said Viv, you better get off your ass, man, and get sucking a tuba. Okay, replied Larry. What does a tuba look like? In a 1983 interview with Jeffrey Giuliano, Smith and Stanchel remembered Larry's short tenure on tuba. Smith. Thanks to British Rail, Viv mailed one down immediately, and I sat on the carpet for a week trying to play the damn thing. Somehow I managed to get three notes out of it, so I was in. I wasn't really much good at actually playing it, you understand, but I could damn sure work up a great shine on the mother. I was very good at cleaning it. Stanchel. I brought him into the band by giving the bugger a tuba, on which he learned F and B, 
which means you press no valves at all. Of course, he forgot within a week and started waving and blowing kisses. Smith, who later dropped the tuba and became the band's drummer, got his nickname Legs from a flick entitled The Rise and Fall of Legs Diamond. The subject of the film was a gangster with a penchant for dressing sharply and dancing. Smith admired the character's attire and shared his enthusiasm for dancing, so he adopted the name. Tap dancing was one of Smith's most notable contributions to the Bonzo's live performances. Smith also played the part of the sequined pop idol singing Look at Me, I'm Wonderful with an enthusiasm that nearly betrayed the fact that he didn't really mean it. Martin Ash, also known as Sam Spoons, was the next to sign on. Spoons, as his moniker suggests, was known for his unique ability to play the spoons, but originally signed on as Bonzo's first drummer. An industrial art student at the Royal College of Art, Spoons was also an inventor of sorts. According to Legs, Sam Spoons was the first guy to design and construct a see-through plastic drum kit, available in four colors. Neil Innes and Vernon Dudley Bohe No were sharing a house in Blackheath when they heard about the Bonzos. Bohe No was the first of the two to meet and join the band. He initially played the banjo, but eventually moved to bass. He told Innes about the odd group of musicians he had met. Innes, who was attending Goldsmiths College, was intrigued and decided to check them out. He recalled his introduction to the Bonzos. Now Vernon met Rodney and Viv and said these two weird guys wanted to start the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, and they needed a pianist. I thought, well, that sounds silly enough. I'll come down and have a look. I met Rodney and Viv at a pub in New Cross. Rodney came in his usual geezer self, and Viv was rather portly in those days because he has an ability to be rather stout or very thin according to what mood he's in. This was obviously one of his plump moods, and he had on these horrid checkered trousers and little antique violet oval sunglasses and big false ears. No one could really play anything. It was just talked about and talked about and agreed to. Because they had bumped into a character called Sam Spoons, who could play the spoons incredibly fast, it seemed as though we should perhaps get together and actually rehearse. A gifted, multi-talented artist, Neil Innes was, like Stanchel, rapidly becoming disillusioned with the art business, or art-speak, as he refers to it. Artists, he explains, or people who make pictures, should never talk about art. They should leave that to the poets and writers. The Bonzos provided Innes with a way of escaping the high-flown pretensions of art school. In return, he provided them with a solid musical background. Innes had been trained in the classical method. His parents started him out on the piano when he was just seven and he continued to play until the age of 14. He joined the Bonzos on piano, eventually picking up guitar as well. Dodistic anti-jazz bands like the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band didn't really rehearse, or at least not too often, practice being detrimental to producing such an outrageous noise. The lads spent a couple of weeks playing Tuesday nights at the Royal College of Art Canteen before they decided to take their show to the local pubs. The pub seemed a very good alternative to the college. Aside from their eagerness to get on to honest drinking establishments, Neil Innes and Vernon Dudley Boheno were tired of traveling across town to practice. Transporting Neil's piano was murder. Soon the Bonzos secured regular gigs playing rooms and passing around the hat at the Bird in Hand in Forest Hill and at the Kensington Arms in Hackney. The Kensington Arms provided the backdrop for a meeting as fortuitous as when Stanley met Livingston. The Bonzos were in full swing one night when saxophonist and part-time demolitionist Roger Ruskin Spear popped in to check them out. At the time, Spear was heading his own band called the New Jungle Orchestra. One of his bandmates, Sidney Nichols, told him he had to check out the Bonzos. These guys are getting away with murder, claimed Nichols, and Spear just couldn't resist. He recalls what happened that night. There was Sam Spoons with this sort of pile of rubbish on a stick that just looked like a drum kit. 
There was someone playing incredibly bad clarinet, wonderfully out of tune. So we sat in and played, and Neil turned around from the piano and grabbed my arm and said, That's great, that's great, that's exactly what we want. Why don't you join the band? And I said, No, 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 I don't want to join a band ever again, but we'll turn up next gig, maybe. And then it just went on. We kept turning up for the next gig, over and over again. Less interested than even the other bonzos in musical quality, he actually preferred his music loud and awful. Spear fit in perfectly with the group. When he wasn't playing sax or keyboards, Spear opted for the less traditional vacuum cleaner or trouser press. When he tired of these, he wreaked havoc with his mechanical inventions and explosives. Spear saw his inventions as working paintings. Part of Roger's concept was to bring his art studio with him on stage. He constructed his machines and robots in the studio, and he continued to tinker with them on stage. Stanchel always thought Spear a rather queer fellow. Although Vivian was never really very close to Roger, from the onset he respected his art, confessing to having a childlike fascination with Roger's machines. Later on, Vivian liked to tell what he called Roger stories, and would often brag about a little gift Roger gave him, tinnitus. After being exposed to Spears' explosions for years on end, Stanchel's hearing was so bad that when he went to the doctors, they would invariably ask, Have you been in a war? The unusual Mr. Roger Ruskin Spear was the final ingredient in this highly volatile musical mixture. United by the need for an artistic outlet and their dedication to undermining music, the core of the Bonzo Dog Band was now forever assembled. Playing out seven days a week in the pubs, the bonzos slowly began to bring to life the most surreal, entertaining, bizarre, and balls-out stage show ever seen on the dreary shores of England or indeed the trendy USA. Little did aspiring painter Stanchel realize that the bonzos would consume the next eight years of his life. Chapter 3 Dada for Now, Bonzo Barks, 1966-1967 Why do you think I'm on television? Because I'm a great British eccentric? No, because I shit differently from other people. Vivian Stanchel Musically, the Bonzos could be nothing short of horrendous but their performances were always guaranteed to be entertaining, as Stanchel remembered. For quite a long time, in terms of musicianship, there were only about two people in the band who could actually play. Everybody else was just rasping and making noises. Innes has similar memories of the period. Sometimes the band was good, and sometimes it was, quite frankly, appalling. It really didn't matter, because we weren't pitching quality control. It was just for the sheer hell of it. It turned out to be very good drinking music, apparently. Drove the customers to drink, which made the publicans very happy. We used to jump in the car after college and drive to pubs in the east end of London, explained Larry. The Cockneys never took bullshit from no one, so we jump on stage and just play totally insane songs for an evening. People tended to get drunk and, strangely enough, seemed to enjoy themselves and us. We once played Brazil for twenty minutes, and we didn't even know the bloody thing. We thought, well, it's a nice summer evening. Why not? Unable to dazzle the audience with their musical brilliance, the Bonzos sought to outrage them with their audacious mixture of neo-dadist anti-jazz. Even as the band gigged and grew tighter, they consciously decided to retain some of the deliberately awfulness in their music. The bonzos would go from well-arranged numbers like Death Cab for Cutie into a big band blowout like Jazz Delicious Hot, Disgusting Cold, deliberately ragged musicianship being a profound counterpoint to their so-called straight music. Still, awfulness for its own sake can grate after a time. What really put the Bonzos beyond other bands was their incredibly bizarre stage show. Throughout their act, the stage was frenetic with activity. With two or three visual acts going on at once, there was always something to keep the audience's attention. 
Driven by a strong spirit of one-upsmanship, the Bonzos grew increasingly outrageous as their show expanded to fit the artistic impulses of its members. Bonzo gigs began innocently enough with the customary Rule Britannia. The song seemed to take ages, whizzing away until suddenly there came an enormous explosion and the band launched into their set. The effect devastated patrons in pubs. Neil Innes describes the shock. All these pints went up into the air, and all this beer came down on their best suits. From the opening explosion, everything else orally and visually was wonderful and purposeful chaos. Here was a grand and visual feast. Anything could happen at any given moment. Spear provided many of the visuals with his exploding robots and bizarre instruments. Stanchel described Roger as being on stage by himself. There were the bonzos, and then there was Roger blowing things up. All of the contraptions Spear liked to create, mechanical creatures, bubble-blowing machines, and the like, had a nasty habit of breaking down, so when Roger wasn't playing, he was dashing about madly, trying to keep them all running. In the midst of this premeditated smoke and din, Legs Larry would seize every available opportunity to play the smarmy showbiz star, or to demonstrate his tap-dancing prowess, often in a Shirley Temple outfit and false tits. The result was quite remarkable. Neil Innes recalls two such occasions. One was in the Durrigan Arms, where he was on the table, which had a dovetail joint. I was banging away at the piano, and Larry was going clickety-clack, clickety-clack, and I could see the table joint opening up. I was doing these stop chords yelling, Larry, Larry, but he couldn't hear anything. Oh, what the hell, it will get a laugh. And the table goes, ee, and Larry goes, oh, and a great cheer goes up. On the second occasion, Larry's taps got caught on one of the brass flips covering the power points on the stage, and Larry disappeared over the front of the stage. The wonderful thing was all the camaraderie and sympathy which Larry got. All that happened was the band stopped playing and fell about in hysterics. If it wasn't tap dancing, it was Sam Spoons playing his famous spoons. The spoons were always a particular crowd pleaser. Neil Innes also played his part, coming on stage with his head sticking through Da Vinci's Mona Lisa, a similarly odd smile on his face. At the center of all the chaos was Stanchel, the consummate frontman and towering bonzo ringmaster. Arthur Brown, no stranger to fiery performances himself, described Stanchel's electric stage presence. Vivian was such an engrossing performer. I mean, he used to wear Humphrey Bogart clothes as well as the old trad clothes. He was a very natty dresser. I mainly remember his remarkable rudeness, his acute funniness. Stanchel had an incredibly dynamic dramatic range. He played the effete dilettante, crooning music hall oldies, only to morph into a bellowing rock and roll beast moments later. Many who saw the Bonzos act vividly remember blood foaming from Viv's mouth during Can Blue Men Sing the Whites as his vocal cords tore from the harshness of his singing. The effect was produced with blood capsules, but the audience appreciated the effort. Stanchel was a very physical performer as well. Incredibly, he was able to dislocate both of his shoulders and knees at will. Viv used to dislocate himself so often that, according to his brother Mark, he referred to himself as a complete marionette. The experience was incredibly painful, but in the spirit of showmanship, he endured it. For their part, the audience assumed that Stanchel's agony was part of the show. Vivian once recalled, I was actually taken off in a stretcher, and I got the St. John's ambulance men to make it look as much like a straitjacket as possible, and they had to lift me over these huge dormitory tables. It was, as they say, rather a hoot. Also distinguishing the bonzos was the way they incorporated their diverse artistic backgrounds into their act. They found inspiration in traditional English music hall, the Commedia dell'art, with its tradition of improvisational dangerous physical comedy and the Cabaret Voltaire with its decadent surrealism. Stanchel would often do performances based upon paintings by enacting the paintings on stage. Once at a show, Vivian recalled, a girl came up to me and said, Were you thinking about Beardsley's monkeys when you did that? And I said, Why, yes, I was. 
Props, too, were always an important part of the Bonzo's manic performances. Early on, Stanchel introduced thought balloons, comic-style dialogue balloons the band members would hold above their heads. A single balloon, such as, Wow, I'm really expressing myself now, operates on a number of different levels. Check out the LP The History of the Bonzos, wherein Spear is holding this particular balloon above his head. The balloon is a simple joke, but also a satirical comment on the self-expression stressed all too seriously in art school. On yet another level, thought balloons were a way of transcending their artistic medium. Through their use, the Bonzos transformed themselves into living cartoons, the pop band as pop art. Stanchel also manufactured Zelda, the large dancing doll. During the harpsichord break in Equestrian Statue, Vivian and Zelda would do a manic waltz, which would climax in Zelda's falling apart on stage as Stanchel desperately tried to hold her together, preserved on film during their beat club performance of Equestrian Statue. Masks were also an important element in the Bonzo stage show. They ranged from the simple... Roger's flashing light bulb eyes or Vivian's Cheshire cat cartoon smile to the more complex, enormous Negro mask Vivian wore during Canyons of Your Mind. Occasionally they were maniacally elaborate. Pamela DeBard described one of Stanchel's more complex costumes in her autobiography, I'm with the Band, Confessions of a Groupie. It's impossible to describe their brilliance. Vivian came out in a massive moo-moo with a gigantic lion's head on, beating a hand-painted drum, and when he whipped off the lion's head, he was wearing a sheep's head, and he kept taking masks off until the finale, when he had bloodshot ping-pong balls stuck into his eye sockets. Stanchel explained the use of masks during an interview in Amsterdam in 1967. I think it's important to see that one is using masks to show the value of masks and the truth of masks. Of course, I know that it's creating an astounding effect visually, which I think is valuable in impressing our obscenities on the public. Masks had been a staple in the buffoonery of the Commedia dell'arte, a comedic tradition originated in Renaissance Italy. Apart from any visual influences the Bonzo may have picked up from the Commedia, they also drew heavily on its tradition of comedic improvisation. The Bonzos, however, didn't limit themselves to simple props and masks, they actually began to incorporate full theatrical routines straight out of English Music Hall and vaudeville into their performances. Amongst the Bonzo's routines was a mock ventriloquist act, Little Sir Echo, based upon a children's song which had a hit in 1945. Stancho would play the ventriloquist and Spear the dummy. The dialogue went something like this. Stancho, Little Sir Echo, how do you do? Hello, 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 and so on. The Bonzo's tour de force, however, was the head ballet, which was simply put, a ballet for human heads. Any written description certainly falls short of its visual impact. The Bonzo's would sit in a row, often at the edge of the stage, and perform a choreographed ballet with their heads. The effect was nothing short of surreal, but also strangely hilarious. Fortunately, a filmed performance of this piece has been preserved on a newsreel from the period and deserves to be seen. By the end of their art school studies, the Bonzos were playing four pubs a week to full houses and making a stir on the London music scene, though the boys still considered it all a lark. When approached by Reg Tracy, who wanted to be their manager and signed them to a series of gigs in the northern men's clubs during their Easter holidays, they accepted the offer. During the entire negotiation, they remembered, they were all thinking, who is this asshole? The Bonzo's act had gone down well in the art schools and London pubs, but the audiences in the working men's clubs of places like Newcastle were another matter entirely. The club audiences couldn't be expected to be as sophisticated, so the band anticipated a hostile, or at best, indifferent reaction to their material. To their surprise, the Bonzo's went over just as well. We shouldn't have gone down well at all, laughed Stanchel. I mean, jokes about Hieronymus Bosch, the secret Nazi? This was the sort of humor which these people presumably couldn't possibly understand, but we were a tremendous success. Unexpected as their success may have been, there were very good reasons why the Bonzos went down so well. 
Jokes about Bosch were punctuated by less subtle smoke bombs, explosions, robots, and mad tap dancing. Moreover, the rebelliousness of their art hit a nerve, just as Dada struck a sympathetic note with the lower classes of Berlin in 1919. The attitude of Dada engendered as much sympathy with the dispossessed as it provoked anger on the part of the establishment. More importantly, their act drew heavily on the old music hall tradition. One of the last holdovers of this tradition was the working men's clubs in the northern industrial areas. The fact is they were doing George Formby in the very area where Formby was still fondly remembered. Showmanship, too, was a key to the Bonzo's early success. Working in the northern clubs, the Bonzos had the opportunity to work with and learn from acts that had been in the business for years. They were doing two shows a night, 45 minutes each, so the gigs were rehearsed to be non-stop. The Bonzos were learning how to work their audience, building their enthusiasm as the show moved towards the climatic number and then, inevitably, the encore. Sometimes, however, working the audience took intense patience. Requests for songs off the pop charts did not go unheeded, even if the Bonzos didn't even know the song. Somebody would ask for something out of the top twenty, then we'd play it, and nobody knew the words, chords, or anything, remembered Stanchel in a 1969 interview. We played it very rudely and directly. We'd point at their faces, embarrassing them with the inane sickness of their choice. On another occasion, the club's waiters had to come through the band to serve food to the audience members. The bonzos seized upon the opportunity to announce each meal as it passed through, much to the enthusiastic applause from the audience and the dismay of the waiters who were forced to repeatedly endure the bad joke. Occasionally, they would be handed a request to perform Happy Birthday, a task that they made as unpleasant as possible for the person they were singing to. In the end, a certain give-the-audience-what-they-want attitude prevailed, although, like some sort of devilish pact, the audience rarely got exactly what they expected. Another concession the Bonzos made during this period was sacrificing the Dada part of their name. Nobody seemed to be able to get it right, and it was growing increasingly tiring explaining what Dada was. With only a slight alteration, they then became the Bonzo Dog Duda Band, reflecting the multiplicity of styles the band was now playing. The Bonzo's success in the northern clubs over the Easter holiday opened up the opportunity of turning professional when they graduated from school. For Stanchel, the decision to take up such a catastrophic nonsense as a profession was not an easy one. Viv still thought of himself as a painter. When an Italian advertising agency offered him a job as a graphics artist, he was tempted to take the position. In the end, however, the prospect of taking a regular office job paled in comparison to the musical anarchy of the Bonzos, and he turned down the offer. Thus began an entire year of working the Northern Clubs. It was the most perfect grad education anyone could ever want, remembers Innes. Having spent five years at art school with all this pomposity, delicate sensitivity, and intellectual hoo-ha, to be thrust into the red corpuscle area of life was quite good. For Stanchel, this was a wonderful time. The atmosphere of the often seedy public houses appealed to him. He fondly remembered the pleasure of club scenery. Just prior to going out, you often had contortionists sitting on the table, looking into one of these terrific sand-blasted mirrors at her G-string and turning her pubic hairs from the side and arranging her pubic hairs, this sort of thing, strippers running by and putting their nipples under the tap to harden them before they went on. Unbelievable. Once described in an offhand remark as a man who likes to fuck women, Stanchel was certainly not shy when it came to partaking of their pleasures. Viv would frequently attempt to pick up strippers, and was frequently successful. In the end, however, the club romances were just that. Stanchel's immense sexual desires were equaled only by his sense of romance. He was still very much in love with Monica, and continued his relationship with her despite the occasional affairs. Even outside of the clubs, Stanchel found ample opportunity to act outrageously, as Bohé Noel recalls. When we toured the North, We'd arrive in a town and immediately head for the laundry. So much stage gear, stiff white collars, and everything. At one town there was this extraordinary laundry, huge place with a sort of wishing well in the middle full of goldfish. Viv nipped out and bought some carrots. 
sliced them up into thin slivers, and then sat very conspicuously at the edge of the pond, occasionally snapping his hand into the water, bringing up a piece of carrot, shaking it, holding it up, leaning his head back, and dropping it into his mouth as if head first. All of the girls who worked there said, "'Hey, look, he's eating our goldfish!' And we said, "'Well, when you're on the road like we are, you tend to get rather hungry, and, you know, one likes a bit of raw fish now and again.'" The Bonzos were playing in yet another workman's dive when they heard that platinum blonde bombshell Jane Mansfield was appearing only steps away. Stanchel, never one to pass up anything of scholarly interest, decided to have a look. Arriving in the club with Innes in tow, Stanchel was quick to find a seat in the front row. At that time, Mansfield's act consisted of standing up on stage, breathing heavily, thrusting her huge tits at the audience, and perhaps singing a bit. To Stanchel's surprise, Mansfield came over and sat in his lap. Now, feeling a little uncomfortable and not knowing quite what to do, he reached around and put his hand on her back. Jane was so covered in sweat and makeup that his hand slid down the back of her dress, coming to rest in the cleavage of her famous ass. Stanchel was aghast, repulsed by the big mass of sweat, blonde hair, and makeup that sat on his lap. Jane, however, didn't think anything of it, and just giggled. It was one of the very few instances in which Vivian was shocked by someone else's outrageous behavior. Eventually, the dog band's endless nights in the men's clubs began to pay off. The buzz they were creating found its way to Parlophone Records, who offered them a record deal. The contract called for the Bonzos to produce two singles for the label. The April 1966 sessions for Parlophone at EMI's Abbey Road Studios were the first proper recordings of the Bonzos' music, though earlier recordings had been made. A friend of Spears, who knew a little bit about recording, had recorded a couple of live Bonzo tracks, Dr. Jazz and Laughing Blues. Both would later turn up on 1969's Tadpoles. The result of their first Parlophone session was a pair of singles, My Brother Makes the Noises for the Talkies, backed with I'm Going to Bring a Watermelon to My Girl, released in April 1966, and Alley Up, backed with Button Up Your Overcoat, released the following September. Over a decade later, Stanchel described the sessions. I remember going into the studio and knocking out half a dozen tracks in three hours. I think they were all mixed in the same afternoon. I heard them maybe six months ago. Roger does a divine balls up on Bring a Watermelon to My Girl Tonight, starts off in the wrong key, and saves himself brilliantly. Entertaining as the records may be, it's all fairly straightforward novelty jazz, a.k.a. Spike Jones. Vivian vocals are the highlight of the singles, however. His wonderful enunciation on My Brother Makes the Noises for the Talkies and I'm Gonna Bring a Watermelon to My Girl and his voiceover in the fading bars of Eliup are a prediction of things to come. Enamored of the Bonzo's originality and outrageousness, the music press was only too happy to review the singles. The write-ups were mostly kind, if not particularly enthusiastic. Despite all of this critical attention, however, the singles did terribly, failing to even threaten the charts. Some measure of success was achieved, however, when Button Up Your Overcoat became one of the battle songs of the East End mods. Ultimately, it wasn't what the Bonzo Dog Band did in the studio that spring that mattered, but what was going on in the studio across the hall. At the same time the Bonzos were recording their traditional jazz bit, the Beatles were next door recording George Harrison's I Want to Tell You for their groundbreaking album Revolver. Neil Innes recalled his first run-in with the Fabs. We saw the Beatles in the corridor, all wearing dark suits and sunglasses, rather like the Blues Brothers, and we could hear bits of George's I Want to Tell You. I thought, what on earth are we doing going back in time, doing my brother makes the noises for the talkies, and just across the hall somebody's really grinding away? That was quite memorable. Vivian, too, remembered his acute embarrassment at being faced with the monolith of the Beatles' impossible-to-match persona measured against the mad molehill of the Bonzo's music hall doodlings. I felt like such a fraud doing all this silly stuff when I could hear George in the next room. I want to tell you, twanging his sitars and being all cerebral. 
Ringo's drum kit, Stanchel fondly recalls, was heavily draped and nailed down so that people wouldn't discover the secret of the way he miked it. So Larry went over and put some meat in Ringo's kit. He slapped some meat in Ringo's drums to foil the Fab Four's sound. Larry also used to drape himself in meat in those days. He particularly liked to wear meat in sweaty hot clubs like the Marquis. It was something to do with the human condition. Buffoonery aside, the contrast was indeed striking. The Revolver-era Beatles were pushing music's limits, while the Bonzos were re-recording jazz bits from the twenties and thirties. The moment made quite an impression on the band, who found themselves asking, "'What the hell are we doing playing jazz?' The question haunted the Bonzos for months. In retrospect, this chance meeting was when the Bonzos' transition to rock and roll began. The great switch would be the result of a culmination of forces. Legs Larry is quick to take credit or blame for the Bonzo Dog's decision to turn to rock. We were constantly playing twenties and thirties novelty songs. Wonderful though they are, I wanted to move on and go electric, man. Just start playing a bit of rock and roll. One day Smith approached their manager, Reg Tracy. I want to add a couple of Elvis numbers to the set. Tracy's response was simple. Larry, if you want to play rock and roll, then I suggest you join a rock and roll band. Smith, however, persisted, and eventually Tracy and the rest of the band relented. At least, that's how Larry remembers it. Larry's burning desire to be a rock star, to have legs embroidered in sequins on the back of his jacket, and actually have people recognize him, may have been one of the reasons the Bondos eventually went electric. Still, the rest of the band wasn't really all that interested in feeding Smith's hungry ego. The simple fact was that Legs was not alone. Stanchel and Innes wrote the band's songs and were rapidly becoming the leaders of the band. They also wanted to change the musical direction. Emulating the Beatles, who were emulating their idols, Chuck Berry and Buddy Holly, Stanchel and Innes had begun writing their own material— Innes wrote in his self-conscious Beatlesque style, while Stanchel, far less a tunesmith than a lyricist, concentrating on writing surreal lyrics and coming up with basic tunes which Innes later arranged. It was becoming readily apparent that the wave of trad jazz that they had been riding was rapidly losing strength. As the commercial power of rock and roll was realized, trad was looking more and more like a dead horse. The Bonzo Dog Band's wildly popular live shows kept them alive in the clubs, but it was questionable whether they could get a hit while still playing jazz. Ironically, the Bonzos could have been successful if another band hadn't beaten them to the punch. Just as the Bonzos were about to record their second Parlophone single, Ali Up, in September of 1966, a group of studio musicians were busy cashing in on what was left of the trad jazz movement. Dubbed the New Vaudeville Band, the group had been assembled to record the single Winchester Cathedral. As the track climbed the charts, the producers realized that to capitalize on their success, they would need to put together a touring band and get them on the road. In an odd twist of fate, the Bonzo Dog Band was offered the opportunity to become the New Vaudeville Band. Fuck you, was their nearly unanimous response. The sole dissenter, trumpeter Bob Kerr, decided to accept the offer. Kerr quit the Bonzos, joined the new vaudeville band, and was soon touring America in support of Winchester Cathedral. The new vaudeville band's success and Kerr's defection certainly bothered the Bonzos. A group of studio musicians had achieved the success that eluded the hard-slogging Bonzos and had even captured the most sought-after prize, a five-star tour of the United States. But when the Bonzos finally saw the new vaudeville band live, they grew absolutely enraged. Not only had the new vaudeville band swiped their trumpet player, they had nicked much of their stage act as well. Bonzo staples such as spoon playing, thought balloons, homemade pyrotechnics were mysteriously appearing as part of the new vaudeville band show. For their part, the new vaudeville band denied stealing their act from anyone and claimed to be great fans of the Bonzos. In a public statement, their guitarist, Mick Wilshire, attempted to explain the situation. 
We have three things that the bonzos use, spoons, balloons, and bombs. But we are not stealing their audience, and they are not stealing ours. I like the bonzos, and I sincerely hope they get a hit. If Wilshire had chosen to stop at this point, the explanation might have played well in the press, but he continued. We have played the Palladium and the States. When did they play the Palladium and the States? We've already gotten rebooked into the Tropicana in Vegas, and we haven't even played there yet. The Bonzos were singularly unimpressed with both the new vaudeville band's act and Wilshire's public pronouncements. Stanchel was quick to respond to Wilshire's statements. We don't feel bitter about the vaudeville's record success, but obviously it does us harm when people see them first and then they think that we are copying them. Apart from that, they do our act awfully badly. To Stanchel, the new vaudeville band's thievery was painfully obvious. They actually come and watch our set and make notes on what to use next. As far as I'm concerned, next time I see them in the audience, we'll stop and put a notice up saying, We won't carry on until they've gone. Roger Ruskinspear also had doubts as to what was going on. They are pinching our act. One of the members of our band left to join the vaudeville band, and that's all that needs to be said. The Bonzo Dog Duda Band went into the studio in the fall of 1966 to record their first album, Gorilla, for Imperial Records. Years of gigging had gone into shaping the unique material on the album, so the tracks didn't really require a lot of rehearsal in the studio, and the recordings went fairly quickly. Dave Clegg, a bass player brought in halfway through the sessions when Boheno became ill recalls. Those sessions were quite organized. They were recording material already in the stage act. For the later sessions that became Donut and Tadpoles, the tracks were written more in the studio. This was more sitting around time while the guys tried to work things out. The Bonzo Dog Duda Band released Gorilla in November of 1967. Most critics consider Gorilla the Bonzo's seminal work. Many fans, and even the Bonzos themselves, concur. Gorilla is probably the best because it's the condensation of two years of live stage work, explains Spear. Gorilla documents the bonzos as they were making the transition to rock. The trad jazz is still there, but equally prominent are original compositions by Stanchel and Innes. Like the Bonzo Dog Band's stage show, Gorilla opens with Cool Britannia, a jazzed-up rural Britannia arranged by Stanchel and Innes at Roger Ruskinspear's instigation. Bored with the traditional version with which they originally began their shows, Roger suggested that instead of playing Rule Britannia proper, they should lead off with a rockin' Rule Britannia. Having dispensed with the formalities, Gorilla leads the listeners into an amusing, surreal world of the bonzos. The songs range from Tuneful, Equestrian Statue, Piggy Bank Love, and Death Cab for Cutie, to Bizarre, the intro and the outro, I Left My Heart in San Francisco, and The Sound of Music. Even the traditional jazz numbers sound vaguely surreal. Mickey's Son and Daughter is a delightful rendition of the Disney standard. Jollity Farm, written by Leslie Cerrone, as a response to a pathetic ballad, Misery Farm, was a childhood favorite of Stanchel's. He liked the way Cerrone had flipped it around, making it a jolly, bouncy song. Two of the songs had no lyrics. Music for the Head Ballet was written to accompany the stage routine, but it made it onto the album. Jazz, delicious hot, disgusting cold, was in Roger's words, terrible jazz played really loud. The track was recorded after three hours of rehearsal when the bonzos decided to play something daft to release tension. Spear explains the origin of the title. Up north, on one of our gigs, I noticed that they sold hot pies and cellophane wrappers, and it said, Try our pies, delicious hot. So I added underneath, Disgusting cold. This is how it normally worked out. People suggested things, and in the end, Stancho would put them all together. It ended up that it was Jazz Delicious Hot, Disgusting Cold, and it came from a meat pie in some dreadful cafe in the north of England somewhere. Even if the Bonzo Dog Duda band shared similar artistic goals, they obviously didn't necessarily understand each other's artistic impulses. Each band member, for instance, interpreted Neil Innes's equestrian statue differently. Innes. The whole idea of that song was an existentialist song, inspired by Jean-Paul Sartre's Nausea. 
wondering whether a lamppost exists more than you do. It's just another thing to be walking around with. I thought it was amusing, but it shows you how old the song is because I actually used the word gay, and in those days it just meant cheerful and happy. Stanchel. Neil wrote that. I don't know what the hell he was on about there. I thought for a while that it was something to do with an Oscar Wilde story. Spear. That was Neil listening to Penny Lane, so obviously we had to do the silly trumpet. Smith. Obviously Neil was into bestiality at that point. Stanchel contributed some of his best work to the album. Look out, there's a monster coming. Is a surreal, cautionary tale of loneliness and physical inadequacy set to a Caribbean beat. Big Shot is Viv's rendition of Raymond Chandler, a smooth piece that illustrates his flair for spoken word material. The track coined the Bonzo's catchphrase, Have you got a light, Mac? No, but I've got a dark brown overcoat. Vivian would hear this incessantly from fans. Stanchel's strongest contribution to the album is the classic The Intro and The Outro, arguably the most outstanding piece on the album. The idea for the intro and the outro came to Stanchel in a moment of wild inspiration, and the track was recorded the very same day. Vivian later recalled the song's genesis. It came about on the tube going to the studio. I thought of the thing in about four minutes. I didn't have it written. I think I did most of that off the top of my head. I just jotted down the first three or four, and I thought that'll be fine. It was partly predicated on the fact that someone was bound to be late, so I thought, whoever's there will just start it. And we charged into the thing on a four-track, which is why it deteriorates so rapidly. Certainly, it's no Sergeant Pepper. As Stanchel notes, the multi-layered piece was created on a four-track recorder. Neil describes the process. I think the engineer was sort of getting high in the experience. Do you realize we've got 26 tracks down here? We've never done this before. We just plowed into it on and on. It only took about three hours. The release of Gorilla would be delayed for a month when Quinton Hogg, Minister of Parliament, threatened legal action over his inclusion in the intro and the outro. In the original version of the song, Hogg was one of the introducees, and now, just arriving, Quinton Hogg on Piggy Grunt. Hogg politely suggested that the Bonzos would be better off being safe rather than sorry, and requested his name be removed. Not wanting to back down, the Bonzo's first instinct was to re-record the song, leaving the reference to Quinton Hogg in, but replacing the piggy grunt with, Sorry I'm late. Without the piggy grunt part, however, Hogg's inclusion was pointless, so they eventually deleted the reference entirely. Stanchel joked about the incident in the press. Mr. Hogg didn't exactly say what he'd do if we didn't change the song, but of course he might have hired Harold Wilson to take us to court reference to Harold Wilson's order to Quinton Hogg to obtain a high court order against the move. Having cleared up this mess, there was one last matter to deal with. Kerr's departure from the Bonzos occurred right before the time they were taking pictures for the album. When Gorilla was finally released, all of the photos of Bob Kerr and the album jacket were covered up by women's panties. The implication is obvious. Chapter 4. Howling Like a Hypocrite at an Auto de Fe. Bonzos in Motion, 1967-1968. The Beatles want Bonzo Dog for the Magical Mystery Tour, shouted somewhere in Manchester. No sooner had the Bonzos released Gorilla than they were surprised to receive an invitation from the Beatles, asking them to appear in their latest film project, The Magical Mystery Tour. The film was Paul McCartney's idea. The concept was devastatingly simple. The band would travel across the country on a bus filled with a wild assortment of bizarre characters and film whatever happened. When nothing particularly interesting did, several scenes had to be added so as to not put the audiences soundly to sleep. One of these scenes had the Beatles going inconspicuously into a men's club in Soho called the Raymond Review Bar to enjoy its exotic hospitality. The highlight of the scene was to be a striptease act by one Jan Carlson, and they needed an appropriately seedy band to provide the music. Once again the specter of the new vaudeville band reared its ugly head. 
John Lennon had seen them on tour and thought that they would be perfect. Just when it seemed the Bonzos would once again lose out to these seedy musical pretenders, Mike McGeer, Paul McCartney's kid brother and a member of the comedy music poetry group The Scaffold, intervened. As Roger explains, The scaffold was bubbling under, and we were bubbling under, and bands that are bubbling under tend to meet. So Mike McGeer said to his brother, You want the Bonzos. You don't want the vaudeville band. Paul reportedly had no idea who the Bonzos were. At the very least, he hadn't considered them for the role. He did, however, take his brother's advice. Over John's initial objections, the Bonzos were picked to do the bit. The good news reached the band in the midst of playing in a particularly dreadful part of Manchester. The Beatles want you to be in the Magical Mystery Tour, an excited Jerry Braun, their new manager, announced after one of their shows. Oh, dear, replied Viv with feigned disappointment. I guess we'll have to just break off this marvelous tour and rush over and do that dreadful Magical Mystery Tour with those Beatle fellows. We were naturally quite delighted, joked Smith until we actually got to make the film and found out what the Beatles were really like. The Bonzos were, in fact, overjoyed. An appearance with the Beatles would be a real publicity coup. Despite the band's enthusiasm, however, the gig nearly didn't come about. It was as if fate was conspiring against them. First of all, the dogs had a date booked on the same day as the filming— the club manager wasn't terribly sympathetic, informing them that if they wanted to get out of their commitment, they needed to find a replacement act. Making matters worse, the night before the shoot, someone broke into the group's van and nicked most of their equipment. Brian Somerville, the Bonzo's publicist and former Beatles promo man, was frantic, urging them to find a way to do the gig. Guys, you've got to do this. I'll never be able to get you a publicity party together like this again. The Bonzos then banded together and frantically went to work, ringing all the acts they knew and eventually found a replacement for their gig. They then spent a small fortune renting replacement equipment and paying for the trip to the location of the shoot. The Bonzos' appearance in Magical Mystery Tour was shot in one day in mid-September 1967. The scene begins with the Beatles sneaking into the club. The compare introduces the rollicking burlesque performance. Dressed in his famous gold lame outfit, Viv does his best Elvis, while the rest of the band groove in synchronized choreography. The Beatles themselves selected Death Cab for Cutie because, as Legs Larry explains, it was a nice, swingy, bouncy number, and we needed to see some bouncy boobs on it. For her part, the tit-tazzled stripper turns in a particularly spirited performance. John Lennon, however, wasn't particularly happy with the Bonzo's performance. Whether he would have been happier with a new vaudeville band is questionable. Lennon wasn't terribly excited about the film to begin with. Mystery Tour was Paul's project, and it was all John could do to muster up the energy to do the shoot at all. Rodney Slater responded to Lennon's sulking by printing a T-shirt that read, Lump it, John, which he dutifully wore on stage in the months to follow. Reaction from the other Beatles, however, was far more positive. George was particularly complimentary about their album and told them they ought to release Death Cab for Cutie as a single, to which Neil replied, Come on, George, what are you thinking about? Who would buy it? Paul was particularly impressed with the eerie harpsichord of Music from the Head Ballet. Irrespective of Lennon's feelings on the Bonzo's performance in Mystery Tour, he and Viv predictably got on quite well, meeting up at clubs and generally making the rounds of the hipper-than-thou spots in London. I got on with McCartney, Viv has said, and with Lennon particularly. I was living just round the corner from Joe Orton. Lennon was agitating for this homosexual madman, however. Brian Epstein had the wisdom to see that if any of the Beatles were involved with homosexuals, then it really wouldn't be very good for business. John couldn't give a shit. Orton lived just round the corner from my flat, and in that hideous Rolls-Royce, Lennon conked out at my place or dropped me off. It depended on how drunk he was. We had some terrible rows, but we got on... well, we just got on. Paul McCartney apparently agrees. Viv and I would just sit and talk of the inadequacies and insanities of the world and that Fred Astaire music hall sort of thing that we had in common. And Viv and the guys were heavily influenced by the goons, who were a very important thing for the Beatles as well. Not surprisingly, the Doodah Boys were invited to an exclusive screening party on December 17, 1967. 
Up to this point, the Bonzos really hadn't had much exposure to the rock and roll lifestyle. The party offered them the opportunity to socialize with the rock elite, an undiluted dose of stardom. If the Beatles had given the Bonzos something to think about when they bumped into each other at Abbey Road, the rap party would be an even stronger wake-up call. For the Bonzos, the allure of belonging to this elite crowd was irresistible. By almost all accounts, it was a regal bash, a costume party held at the elegant Lancaster Hotel. Stanchel wore one of the more memorable get-ups, gluing plastic fried eggs and chips of bacon onto a bright day-glow oilskin jacket. He went as a transport café. Legs Leary came dressed as a World War II officer, complete with U.S. Marine whites, a lovely little pork pie hat, and an equally lovely dog shit tattooed on his chest. Paul McCartney and Jane Asher came as buskers, John Lennon came as a rocker. Beatle wives Patty Harrison was an exotic belly dancer, while Maureen Starkey was a feathered Indian princess. But the prize for the best costume of the evening went to Beatles producer George Martin and his wife. Mr. Smith remembers, I think for me, the most wonderful costume event of the whole evening was their producer George Martin, who happens to look a lot like the Duke of Edinburgh. He and his wife storming through the cocktail area when everyone else was getting to the cocktails as Prince Philip and the Queen, and for a moment, just for a moment, everyone was aghast. I mean, they looked so right. It was wonderful. Indubitably, Larry was in his element, basking in the glow of rock and roll royalty. I went to the lobby, and I overheard Lulu saying, Oh, mother, I'm in London. I'm having a great time. I can't come home yet. I'm with the Beatles, and we're having a great party. Lulu made a lot of calls to my table that evening as well. When the evening concluded with the obligatory jam, Stanchel was one of the many who took to the stage. Viv and Larry remember. Stanchel. Well, I was up with Lennon doing vocals on Laudie Miss Claudie, Long Tall Sally, all the oldies, screamed our heads off. Bruce Johnson of the Beach Boys sang Joanna. And who was on the kit? Must have been Ringo, I should think. Klaus Vorman was on bass. Smith. I was playing a rather nice set of false titties that I had on that week. A more down-to-earth Roger Ruskin spear remembers the evening somewhat differently. It was just a booze-up with John Lennon throwing up in the loo and this sort of thing. It didn't really do us any good, but from then on I suppose we knew the Beatles. Roger also recalls the All-Star Jam as being something less than spectacular. We started doing our act, and Larry came on with these false boobs, and John yelled, "'Put him away, Larry, we've all seen him.' And from that we just thought, well, forget it. Then one of the Beach Boys got up, and then Lulu, so we just sort of went into a Beach Boys number." There was a stage full of people. I remember the guy from the Beach Boys, Carl Wilson, and I remember Lulu, but I don't remember actually seeing Ringo or anybody. They kept a fairly low profile. John Lennon was mainly on shouting. It was all he was capable of, really. Magical Mystery Tour was aired on Boxing Day 1967 to mixed critical reaction, the Bonzo's performance being one of the highlights of an otherwise mediocre film. Despite the film's lackluster reception, Stanchel was quite generous in his evaluation of the film, as he later told the editors of the Doodah fanzine. I think the film was unfairly slagged off. It was a good try, actually. He did, however, have one large regret about the whole episode. I do wish EMI had put us on the soundtrack. I was a bit cheesed off about that. The same day Magical Mystery Tour aired— A show called Do Not Adjust Your Set premiered. As a result of the notoriety they'd gained as a popular comedic act, the Duda lads had been offered a gig as the house band on the series. Stanchel explains, At the time, a very young and talented TV producer, Humphrey Barclay, was casting around for children's television, and he heard about this wacky kind of Dada band, and he brought us all together, you know. There were future Pythons Eric Idle, who came from the Cambridge Footlights, and there was Michael Palin and Terry Jones from Oxford, and more interestingly, there is Terry Gilliam from Hanging Out with Robert Crumb. The Bonzos spent two heady seasons on Do Not Adjust Your Set. Initially, they used the series to showcase cover versions of novelty songs such as Hunting Tigers Out in India and Monster Mash. Later, they began to feature original songs such as Beautiful Zelda, Mr. Apollo, and Urban Spaceman. Many of the performances involved elaborate staging. For Monster Mash, the entire band got dressed up in hammer horror fashion. 
A swank-hip Frankenstein's monster, Stancho, sings while Dr. Frankenstein, Spear, awakens his creature, Sam Spoons. The creature had been fitted with a brainiac device, which allows him to play the electric spoons. Something goes terribly wrong, and Dr. Frankenstein's machine explodes. The creature goes wild, playing the spoons more and more frantically, until he finally blows a fuse and collapses to the floor. Although Do Not Adjust Your Set was a show for mature kids, the bonzos were given the freedom to perform some fairly bizarre pieces. Take, for example, their version of Rogers and Hammerstein's The Sound of Music. Vivian wearing false eyeballs begins the narration. Life's like that, isn't it? I mean, only the other day I was walking in the West End when I was set upon by hordes of admirers and fans who wanted to touch my clothes. Wildly I sought sanctuary, and I found myself in the darkness of a cinema. Normally, of course, I wouldn't go there, but on that day I saw something rather special, something which really moved me. I want to share that experience with you. It was the sound of music. A meaningful pause, Vivian takes a deep breath, and the band bursts into song. The hills are alive with the sound of music. Vivian sings in a strong operatic voice, Roger accompanies him in a falsetto, badly out of tune. Neil plays seemingly random chords on the piano, accompanied by Rodney on saxophone and Sam on French horn. The cacophony is acid, stripping the song to its naked absurdity. The sound of music is reminiscent of the Dadaist work, based on the simultaneous use of the human voice and assorted instruments. It's also damn funny. For Stanchel, Do Not Adjust Your Set offered the chance to solidify his place as the band's leader, at least in the public's eye. Old clips from the show highlight not only Stanchel's outstanding vocal abilities, but also his charisma and presence as a lead performer. There was a remarkable difference between Stanchel's performances on Do Not Adjust Your Set and his performances on the cabaret circuit and in other arenas. On television, he was very proper and restrained, practically genteel, a proper children's show personality. Despite their continued frustration at not having a hit record, the Bonzos ended 1967 on a high note. Gorilla had earned them strong reviews and attention in the music press. Moreover, their appearance in the Magical Mystery Tour and their ongoing gig on Do Not Adjust Your Set gave them nationwide exposure. With these victories came a renewed determination to have a hit single and to reinvent themselves as a marketable rock band. The first major move occurred in the group's management. Just prior to recording Gorilla, the Bonzos bought out Reg Tracy for $2,000 and hired Jerry Braun as their new manager. It was felt that Braun would be more aggressive in marketing the band. He also had experience in the recording studio, something Tracy lacked. At about the same time, a movement had been formed within the band, largely at Stanchel's instigation, to make changes in the lineup. In the early days of the Bonzos, a come-one, come-all attitude prevailed. Anyone who wanted to show up for the gigs showed up. When the band went professional, however, all the people who had continued to show up subsequently played on their first few recordings. By the time the Bonzos began to record Gorilla, several members of the band, particularly Stanchel, Innes, and Smith, had begun taking the group and the prospect of real commercial success seriously. There was a growing feeling that it was time to give certain old dogs their pink slips. Stanchel took the lead. We're actually recording here, he explained. We're actually a group. We've got to get rid of some of these guys who won't stop showing up. Vernon Dudley, Bohe No, and Sam Spoons were singled out as excess baggage. Stanchel deemed Noel too old for the band, and showed even less kindness towards Sam Spoons, constantly harassing him about his appearance and the way he dressed. As Spoons recalls, I was too scruffy and looked like an art student. Viv was a nag like an old woman, always advising me to wear certain things, and I'd say bollocks. Years later, Vivian would be much more blunt about his feelings towards Sam Spoons. Vivian's second wife, author Kai Longfellow, recalls Vivian's feelings. Well, Sam Spoons was kicked out of the bonzos simply because Vivian found him physically repulsive and he stank. Vivian simply could not bear the stench. Their end came shortly after Gorilla's release. After Sam Spoons and Vernon Dudley Bohaino were immortalized in the intro and the outro, the Bonzos and Jerry Braun set about getting rid of them. 
First, Braun called Dave Clegg into his office and offered him Noel's position on base. Clegg quickly accepted the offer. I started on a regular wage like the others. Steady money was a big deal in those days. The first gig I did was opening for the Bee Gees at Brian Epstein's Seville Theatre on Shaftesbury Avenue in a borrowed survival suit. I knew some of the act already from the studio and picked up the rest on stage. Clegg, who had a habit of licking his mustache, was quickly dubbed Licky. It was an opportunity the other members of the band could simply not pass up. Next, Braun called Bohe, Noel, and Spoons into his office and let them know that they were out of the band. Neither were very surprised, except perhaps by the manner in which the deed was done. Noel had seen the move coming when Clegg stepped in for the guerrilla sessions. Similarly, Larry had taken over the drumming on the sessions. Spoons knew that his time was limited and was already working with another band. Still, he was understandably upset at the decision. I felt it was all rather underhanded. I don't think I deserved it. I was the person who held the band together at one stage. A lot of early publicity was all based around the silly spoon playing. I felt some of the band members could have showed some loyalty towards me. Relations with Spoon and Bohe Noel reflected the worst in Stanchel, who could be something of a bully when he felt others were standing in his way. In this instance, he used his predominant role in the band to help sack two of the founding bonzos. With the new lineup in place, the band did a quick tour of England, stopping briefly to make an appearance on the prestigious Beat Club television show. They also performed their first Top Gear session for Radio One, featuring Mickey's son and daughter and the priceless Craig Torso show. Determined to pursue rock and roll, however, the Bonzos decided to take the weeks around New Year's off to rehearse a new show with more rock and guitar content. Dave Clegg departed shortly thereafter, making his mark as the shortest-lived of all the Bonzo bass players. Taking his place was an American, Joel Druckmann. He recalls, I responded to an ad in Melody Maker. The Bonzo dog band needed a bass player. So I called up Stanchel on the phone and said, Hey man, I'm a bass player, and I want to play in your band. So I went over to his house, and he greeted me wearing a vest made of the stars and stripes. He said that they were playing the Royal Albert Hall, and then he played me Gorilla. I said, yeah, I can do this, and it kind of worked. Often referred to as the Lost Bonzo, Druckmann would add his bit to the band, holding together the rhythm section as they completed the transition from trad jazz to rock. He also played a part in one of the Bonzo's most notable creations, Mr. Apollo. On the way home from a gig in a working man's club in North Wales, the Bonzos, at Druckmann's suggestion, decided to pick up a hitchhiker and put him on. Joel recalls, The poor slob gets in the car, and we immediately start doing stuff. This guy doesn't have a clue. Someone I can't remember. It may have been Roger. Probably pretended they were deaf. Just totally deaf. And you'd get real close and yell as close as you could into their ear. Druckmann then began telling the poor sod about his master, Mr. Apollo, a flora humanist who could uproot trees with his bare hands, this while stripping himself in the back seat of the car, eventually climbing out to eat grass by the side of the road. Months later, Mr. Apollo would appear as the Bonzo's follow-up to Urban Spaceman. The Bonzo's were making a conscious effort to escape from the tragez reputation they had earned in the northern clubs, even going so far as to refuse to perform some of their early material. They were also using fewer explosives in their shows, a concession to the halls such as the Saville, which held the most upmarket rock shows. Unlike the pubs in which performers like the Bonzo's and the crazy world of Arthur Brown had artistic freedom to detonate explosives or set themselves on fire, the theaters were concerned with safety. Besides, the fuses were getting very expensive. After making the transition to rock, the Bonzos found getting gigs very easy. Their act was so different and bizarre, they appealed to a different part of the audience's psyche. Other bands didn't worry about the Bonzos upstaging them. The point is that we got on to so many heavy bills because we were not a threat, explained Stanchel. We were so removed, you see. We didn't have an absolute whiz-kid guitarist or an ace this or an ace that musically. We were not competition, even if we went down incredibly well. One of the bands that took the Bonzos under their wing was Cream. God knows how many concerts we played with Cream, remembered Stanchel. He recalled a 1967 show with Cream at the Saville. We were either on first or Ginger Baker was joining in or setting up in the back. 
Roger had constructed a particularly powerful explosive, which went off very soon after we began our show. This was encased in a dustbin, partly for safety reasons, but also because it amplified the explosion. In the course of his experiments, Spear had become adept at producing many different textures of sound. One trick was to put apples in a dustbin in order to create a duller, thudding explosion. Stancho continues. This one was so enormous that it blew the dustbin apart and the shards went through Ginger's kit, whereupon he fled to the dressing room, spending three quarters of an hour shaking, as I'm told. I think his demons had finally erupted at that point. Perhaps he'd taken some aspirin and Coca-Cola, or perhaps a thimble full of sherry. While Baker was recovering in the dressing room, the Bonzos continued their performance. Partly through the show, Legs Larry rushed up to the balcony to assault a heckler who had shouted, "'Rubbish! Get off!' On reaching the heckler's seat, he proceeded to heave the poor chap over the balcony, much to the predominantly peace-loving hippie audience's dismay. It was only when the heckler shattered on impact that the audience realized that it was all just a clever fake." Though the dog band had yet to produce a hit record, they enjoyed real popularity with other lauded musicians of the day and were allowed entrance into the hollowed rock social circles. As with art school social life, Stancho found himself becoming immersed in the scene. It was an explorative, optimistic period, remembers Stancho. It was actually going somewhere. The music then was so very different. It was actually possible to get things recorded and in front of an audience, whereas now you need an enormous amount of equipment and a great entourage of managers and agents. In addition to the immense musical freedom of the period, the pop community was a close one, regardless of who was selling the most records. In those days, it didn't seem to make any difference if you were in the charts or not, Stancho recalled. People sat in with each other, got drunk, and talked with each other. We all knew each other. It was horribly incestuous. Among the rock star elite Stanchel hung out with was Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix stayed at my place quite a bit, revealed Stanchel. Jim was very courteous and a gentleman. The stories of him turning up at clubs, even at the height of his fame, and just wanting to sit in with the band very humbly are all quite true. Hendrix and Stanchel got along really well and would jam together for hours. Stanchel admired Hendrix's musical genius and would try to follow him on the guitar, which, of course, was generally nothing short of impossible. Stanchel would compensate by switching to banjo or ukulele. Stanchel had also become good mates with John Lennon. It was a relationship forged out of mutual artistic respect. Often the two would find themselves getting pissed together at a local pub— since John had a chauffeur, he would invariably offer Stanchel a ride home, occasionally visiting just long enough to pass out at his place. In a 1994 interview with Roger Clark, Stanchel recalled a cautious night spent in drug-induced revelry with Lennon. We were smoking quite a lot of dope at that time, and we used to work out madness what we could get away with. We'd have four of us in a bed tipping telescopes through the sky— the more grandiose, Lucy in the sky with diamonds, blurg. They passed that off as something his son had concocted, but it was our idea. Ultimately, of all the rock musicians he would befriend, his friendship with the Who's Keith Moon would become the most infamous. Their relationship would become a study in rock lunacy as the two pushed the limits of what they could get away with without being arrested or worse, killed by the indignant victims of their pranks. Moon and Stanchel would not have the time to perfect their particular skills until after the group had broken up. While the Bonzos were together, Moon spent a great deal of time hanging out with Legs, who also had a taste for binging and pranks. Despite being in the midst of a rock scene and desperately wanting to be accepted as a rocker, Stanchel couldn't help but seeing rock from the point of view of an artist. He took the music seriously as art, and rated his fellow musicians by the artistic merit of their music. The musicians he held in the highest esteem he called the Big Boys. The Big Boys were a select group whose talent and originality Stancho highly respected. There weren't many. They were the likes of Jimi Hendrix, Steve Winwood, John Lennon, and George Harrison, musicians who, in Viv's opinion, possessed a certain genius. While Stanchel considered George Harrison and John Lennon big boys, Paul McCartney was relegated to a second group, the Lightweights. 
a collective of junior varsity musos that included Stanchel's bandmate, Neil Innes. It is interesting that McCartney and Innes both fall into the secondary group. It certainly points to Stanchel's lack of interest in lighter pop. Perhaps there was also a bit of jealousy in Stanchel's opinion. McCartney and Innes were both involved in penning and recording the Bonzo's most successful record. Stanchel was not. There was some reassurance, at least for McCartney and Innes, that they did not wind up in the last category, the contemptuous. Jim Morrison, whom Stanchel referred to as that jumped-up teenage idol, fell in with this lot. Vivian spat every time Morrison was called a poet, preferring complete and utter wanker. Once again, the Bonzo Dog Boys found themselves incredibly busy, playing gig after gig and appearing on television. But despite their hard work, they still weren't moving forward financially. Gorilla had been a critical success, but album sales were still relatively sluggish. With all this in mind, the Bonzo Dog Band returned to the studio determined to record a hit. This time they felt they actually had a potential hit, a tune written by Neil Innes entitled Urban Spaceman. After a few fruitless sessions, the Bonzos reached an impasse with Jerry Braun, their current manager and producer. Braun was keen on producing the Bonzos' next record, but the dogs weren't too keen on him producing them. Braun wanted to do the production in the least amount of time which would squash the group's more creative ideas. The Bonzos insisted that someone else be brought in to produce them in the studio. The person chosen was producer Gus Dudgeon, who would later gain fame producing David Bowie and Elton John. Despite Dudgeon's excellent production skills, the Bonzos still found themselves in an impasse in the studio. The Bonzos knew Urban Spaceman was a potential hit single, but they were having trouble putting the rest of the album together. According to Spear, We thought we had a good record, but no one quite knew how to do it. We did one mix and then another. It was like six artists trying to paint a painting. I wanted red over here. No, no, I wanted green. One evening, while Stancho was exorcising his creative tensions at a local club, Vivian ran into Paul McCartney. The two started talking, and the conversation turned to the music business. Vivian took the opportunity to express his frustration at the Bonzo's lack of a hit record to Paul, who lent a sympathetic ear. Soon afterwards, their recording sessions still going nowhere, they finally decided they needed outside help. Paul was the obvious choice. We decided to get Paul involved, explained Spear, because if Paul said do it, we'd all go, yes, 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 Paul, nice Paul. I just phoned him up and said, look, old boy, I think we could do with a hit record, remembered Stanchel. And he said, okay, what have you got? We sent him some stuff, and he said, I'll come and do it, fix up the studio. Unwittingly, the Bonzos would become the first audience for a musical landmark, as Stanchel remembered with some amusement. Just to put us at our ease, he sat down at the piano and said, I've just written a song, and was going, Hey, Jude, don't make it bad. I'm looking at my watch saying, Come on, Paul, who needs a ballad at a time like this? Can't we get on? Only when the record came out did I realize, Hey, that's what he played us in the studio that day. Isn't it funny how you don't really listen? After the serenade, McCartney quickly took charge of the studio, leading the bonzos through the session with incredible efficiency. All of the bonzos were impressed with his ability, according to Stanchel. He's got such magic fingers he could make practically anything a hit. He really is a whiz kid in the studio. He threw me off the drum kit, says Larry, and kissed me. No, we worked really efficiently. We did the whole thing in three hours. The coda of Urban Spaceman included a part for Garden Hose Plastic Funnel Trumpet, an instrument concocted out of a garden hose and funnel. They had been struggling trying to figure out a way they could properly record the instrument. Innes recalls how McCartney devised a solution to the problem. Viv wanted to do this big garden hose plastic funnel trumpet sound at the end, and the engineer was saying, Well, I don't really know if you can record a thing like that. Paul said, yes, you can. You just put a microphone at each corner of the studio. In addition to producing the song, Paul also played ukulele along with Stanchel. Jerry Braun's wife Lillian was in the studio that day, an imposing woman. She asked Paul, what have you got there, a poor man's violin? No, McCartney replied, a rich man's ukulele. 
Indeed, Lillian Braun was somewhat oblivious to the Bonzo sessions. Druckmann remembers hearing part of a telephone conversation that she had in the studio. No, I'm busy right now, she explained to the person on the other end of the line. I'm in the studio with the bongos. At the end of the session, the Bonzos thought about asking McCartney out for a drink or something. Paul, however, seemed to be in a hurry. Larry, recognizing his one shot at fame via proxy, made a point of following McCartney out the door. Spear remembers the incident vividly. Larry wanted to be seen next to Paul McCartney. I remember Paul saying, Cheerio, lads, it's been great. He was walking out of the room, and Larry was still walking beside him, not really talking about anything, but trying to say, Paul McCartney, look, I'm walking beside him. He carried on walking down the street, and the rest of us fell about in a heap, laughing. If Larry had a photographer, he would have paid him a thousand pounds for a picture. And that was that. Paul left, and we never saw him again. At the band's insistence, Paul agreed to produce Urban Spaceman under the name Apollo C. Vermouth. Stancho came up with the name. I didn't want the thing to sell on his name. It was nothing to do with anything contractual on his side. He was quite happy to have his name out there, but I just didn't think it would be fair measure. Released in October 1968, Urban Spaceman caught on quickly, receiving a great deal of airplay in England. Neil Innes recalls its rise in the charts with both pride and amusement. We went to Holland, and it was number 36. We came back, and it was 32. Then it got to be 24 or something. The powers that be couldn't resist it, and they leaked the fact that Apollo C. Vermouth was actually Paul McCartney, and it shot up to number four. Urban Spaceman remained in the charts for some time to come, selling over 250,000 copies in England alone. In terms of the charts, the Bonzos had reached their zenith. Fame, however, took the Bonzos off guard, as Neil explains. We never expected to have a hit, and it suddenly was a hit. One got to know all the things which happened when you had a hit record. You find new friends, you're able to cash checks, and people sing at you through car windows. If this was what success entailed, Innes quickly decided that one hit was quite enough, thank you very much. Quite frankly, he was rather glad when the follow-up single, Mr. Apollo, which clocked in at over four minutes, bit the dust. Contrary to the feelings of Innes, Stancha was disappointed when the follow-up single, Mr. Apollo, for which he had written most of the words, failed to chart. While Stancha appreciated the value of a hit record, he grew to hate Urban Spaceman. To him, the song was poor representation of the Bonzo Dog Band's music. It used to make me heartily sick when the first few toots of the record intro to that damned song hit the audience. Up until that point, I thought we were appealing to rather intelligent people here, and the audience would all erupt. I found it terribly depressing. Stancho grew especially angry when the audiences cheered the line, I'm the urban spaceman, I've got speed, assuming the song was drug-inspired. No doubt there was a certain amount of competition between Stancho and Innes, Stanchel, who had pretensions to being a great rock and roller, was pissed when an Innes composition turned out to be the biggest Bonzo hit ever. The group's second album, The Donut and Granny's Greenhouse, recorded at Chapel's Studio and Morgan Studios from the autumn of 1968, was a wonderfully eccentric collection of neo-psychedelic material honed to almost mathematical perfection, both lyrically and musically by Stanchel and his Bonzo cohorts. Viv remembers the genesis of the album's unusual title. A twit at a party approaches the host and says, I wonder if I could possibly use the smallest room. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Caroline's taking a nap in there. Oh, no, no, you don't understand what I mean. I'd like to go to the, mm, the tiniest, tiniest. I'm sorry, what do you mean? Like under the stairs? There's no light in there, you know. Would you like some more wine? No, 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 I'd like to do a jimmy. What do you mean? You'd like to hit a Scotsman? So eventually the chap indicates his genitalia and goes, pss, pss, pss. Oh, you want to sit on the donut in Granny's greenhouse. It's just a story about euphemisms, that's all. The Donut in Granny's Greenhouse, which was nearly called Rebel Trouser, a spear suggestion, clearly shows the Bonzo's move to mainstream mid-sixties British rock, bonzoized as it were. Their eccentric humor aside, musically the album has little similarity to Gorilla. 
On Donut, both Innes and Stenchel were coming into their own as songwriters, dominating the group on vinyl. Most of the songs are credited stanchel innes collaborations, but many stand out as being distinctly Neil's, Beautiful Zelda, Hello Mabel, and Rockalizer Baby, or Viv's Can Blue Men Sing the Whites, My Pink Half of the Drain Pipe, Rhinocratic Oaths, and Eleven Mustachioed Daughters. Can Blue Men Sing the White summed up Stanchel's take on the whole pathetic white boy blues controversy, which had many critics and fans wondering whether or not white man can really sing the blues. Vivian found the entire issue contrived and full of racism, echoed in the monologue at the end of the number. Lordy out there in the fields. The point was driven home in concert. As Stanchel bellowed the song, Spear would emerge from offstage, dressed in baggy shirt and jeans, a sock pulled over his head, to which was stuck stereotypical lips made of rubber. I'm the blues, was written on his shirt. Stanchel's most notable contributions to the album include My Pink Half of the Drain Pipe, Rhinocratic Oaths, and Eleven Mustachioed Daughters. My Pink Half of the Drain Pipe is a song about individuality, drawn from real-life experience. Stanchel explains, I remember my father actually did that. It wasn't just a metaphor for keeping to your side and how people don't like to get together. We're painting the house white, and he goes down white and leaves blue on that side. Crazy, bizarre. The generous way of looking at that was individuality. Innes, however, believes that my pink half of the drain pipe is stanchial at his best, an opinion that is difficult to argue with. If drain pipe was currently Stanchel's best effort, the delightful rhinocratic oafs and the brooding eleven mustachioed daughters was an indication of where Stanchel was heading with his music. Rhinocratic oafs is a stunning montage of nonsensical images, a powerful example of Stanchel's ability to paint with sound. Less accessible, Eleven Mustachioed Daughters is a wild musical incantation. Influenced by Stanchel's admiration for Arthur Brown's erudition and astonishing vocal powers, the song reflects Vivian's growing interest in dark imagery, in this case various aspects of Aleister Crowley and a growing interest in African images and rhythms. According to Stanchel, I wanted to make it something ludicrous and chuck in all the bits and pieces that I'd researched. Love it or hate it, the song is a display of his ability to channel his erudition into a tableau uniquely Stanchilian. Though the commercial essence of his art was light and comic, Stanchel reveled in dark imagery, a la Hieronymus Bosch. He would later return to this sound on his first solo effort, 1974's Men Opening Umbrellas Ahead. The rest of Donut is quite frankly a tour de force, the bonzos being in top form on Roger Ruskin Spears' classic Trouser Press. Now the trouser press was just that, an old contraption used to press pants. I originally found the trouser press in an attic of an old house which I'd moved into, explains Spear. Really, it's just old and rusty and squeaks. So I just put a contact microphone on it, and the rust and creaky noise as you open and close the flap produces a sort of musical sound. The trouser press became a focal point of the Bonzo's show, as Spear remembers. The stage show for the trouser press was me in spotted shorts taking off my trousers and putting them in the trouser press, and then I do the chorus. And in that time, of course, the trousers would overheat and go into flames. It was during the writing and recording of Donut and Granny's Greenhouse that Innocent Stanchel's songwriting partnership solidified, at least on record. While Stanchel was musically gifted, melodies and lyric writing came easily to him. He was a self-taught musician and could neither read nor write music. Innes charted most of the music and helped add form to Stanchel's wild creativity. Innes described his role to Robert Hanks in an interview in 1994. Stanchel had charm, but no shape at all. I could come up with the shape, and he could come up with the inspiration. It is, of course, tempting to lapse into the well-worn, critical cliché that their songwriting partnership reflected that of McCartney and Lennon, John doing a great deal of experimentation, and Paul with his wonderful sense of pop, always there to make sure he didn't go too far, anchoring the Beatles' commerciality and keeping the music accessible. There is no doubt that Innes served as Stanchel's creative foil, but his role was far more complex. 
To some extent, he did tend to keep Stanchel's music accessible when Stanchel's wild creativity moved a bit towards arcane musical areas, but more often than not, Innes simply attempted to add a bit of form. Eleven Mustachio Daughters has form, but it is hardly a concession to commercialism. Innes didn't necessarily limit or attempt to reshape Stanchel's creativity, but tried to capture his ideas musically. Vivian trusted Neil's basic instincts, trusted him to filter his ideas to make sure things did not go too far awry. Stanchel's effect on Innes's writing is less apparent. Innes's songs tend to be Innes's songs. Stanchel's contribution would seem to be his gift for lyrics. For Donut's release in the United States, Liberty Records decided to rename the album Urban Spaceman and add the hit single to the beginning of the album. Liberty's effort to capitalize on the English success of the single ultimately marred the record. Vivian explains, I deliberately started that thing off very low, so that people would think, Oh Christ, I've got a duff copy here. Wang the speakers up, and then when it came in with a crescendo, it was going to blow their heads off. Or so we thought. When Liberty put Urban Spaceman before We Are Normal, that made it so We Are Normal goes down. Shortly after the Bonzos finished recording Donut, Joel Druckmann left the band. The story goes that Druckmann had been asked to play the dummy in the Little Sir Echo routine and flatly refused, quitting the band rather than do the humiliating routine. But there were more underlying musical differences as well. Druckmann aspired to play with Eric Clapton, or at least a more traditional rock band, but definitely not the Bonzos. Druckmann eventually went on to play double bass with the more traditional San Bernardino Symphony Orchestra. Druckmann's departure both disillusioned and angered the Bonzos, who proceeded to give him the Bob Kerr treatment. Druckmann's bass playing on Donut went uncredited, although his picture appears on the album's cover. Moreover, his voice is heard on the album. He plays the role of the sissy at the beginning of Trouser Press, saying, "'Come on, everybody, clap your hands.'" Years later, when asked about Druckmann, Roger Ruskinspear would later remark, "'He's the reason I have no friends who are Americans. I think he was just over here draft-dodging.'" Druckmann returned the compliment. "'Roger has the mentality and the temperament that I could see him becoming an axe murderer without any problem, but he would be very polite about it.'" Initially, the Bonzos had no intention of bringing a new bass player into the band, but one evening, while Jerry Braun was walking past a club, he heard Dennis Cowan playing and promptly invited him to join the band. Cowan's arrival gave the Bonzos a permanent fixture at last for the bass position, a relief considering Druckmann had bowed out shortly before the Bonzos' first American tour. The chart success of Urban Spaceman and the success of The Donut and Granny's Greenhouse led to a barrage of offers from various sources. The Bonzos accepted another 14-week run on Do Not Adjust Your Set. More importantly, United Artists had begun to book their first tour of America for the spring of 1969. Even as the Bonzos were recording tracks for Donut, they were preparing a 50-minute TV special, filmed in Aston Somerville. This production, which they produced independently, was bought by the BBC and aired during the Christmas of 1968 as a special Color Me Pop appearance. Designed entirely by the band, the show featured several hilarious vignettes, including supper at the Spear household, with the entire family around the table eating a meal of scrap metal. A scene with Stanchel and Spear recording two rabbits chewing leaves, Legs Larry Smith doing his Look at Me, I'm Wonderful routine in a local pub, and Neil's poignant guitar work. The show ended with a version of the intro and the outro, in which the Bonzos were quickly overwhelmed by many of the guests which they were introducing, much to Stanchel's obvious bemusement. After recording the 1968 Christmas TV special, Do Not Adjust Your Stocking, the Bonzos were exhausted. Even in the midst of their success, cracks were beginning to show. Stanchel's nerves were getting frayed, and he was quoted as saying that there was a possibility the group would break up after Christmas. I shall go back to teaching or try to get a job as a disc jockey, he said. We're all nervous wrecks. We go on stage physically. Chapter 5. Busted. The Cracks Are Showing. 1969-1970.
The entire pop circuit is geared to everyone taking whatever they can. Agencies, management, and so forth want you to work as much as possible without much thought about its effect on you. The finest state is to flog something you feel really proud of. I haven't felt that way for years about the Bonzos. Vivian Stanchel, 1970 By all measures, 1969 looked to be another breakthrough year for the Bonzos. After years of intensely hard work, Urban Spaceman finally launched them onto the charts, selling enough copies to ensure a long-awaited American tour. Moreover, their overall lot improved dramatically with the hiring of Tony Stratton-Smith as their personal manager. Stratton-Smith was one of the best in the business. His great personal integrity, complete dedication to the band, and most of all, his keen appreciation of more complex musical concepts quickly won over the ever-cynical bonzos. Frustration was giving away to optimism, and the band was determined to take full advantage of their good fortune. Despite his near-perpetual exhaustion, Stanchel shared the group's optimism. Still, the cumulative pressures of the music business and his increased drinking were slowly undermining his ability to cope with what was going on around him. As the year progressed, his condition would steadily worsen. Little did anyone realize that by Christmas he would be in no condition at all to front a rock band. While the Bonzos eagerly anticipated their upcoming American tour, they were nervous about the prospect of playing for American audiences and genuinely concerned that they might not go over well. Most American rock fans were unaware of the Bonzos' music hall, trad, jazz, and dadistic roots. Moreover, American audiences might not appreciate the Bonzos' distinctly British comedic sensibilities. Monty Python's Flying Circus had yet to conquer America's public television stations. If American audiences knew the Bonzos at all, it was through Urban Spaceman. Thus, the Bonzos wondered how the rest of their music would go over. Other potential difficulties were considered. Two routines involved wearing Negro masks during Canyons of Your Mind. Viv would slip on a mask during the spoken, sobbing middle section, a takeoff on the more obnoxious doo-wop groups of the 50s. Roger's I'm de Blues bit during Can Blue Men Sing the Whites was also potentially controversial. Skeptics voiced the opinion that some Americans ensconced in the midst of a period of intense racial tension might not appreciate the spirit of the joke. Stanchel explained, When we went to America, people said, You're going to get shot for that in some alley. The flash of a stiletto, that's it. But it wasn't like that at all. Negroes obviously dig jokes about Negroes the same that we would dig jokes about white guys. So, I mean, it's good putting it on. The worse the joke, the more Negroes liked it. It's all working in reverse. Post-tour thoughts aside, Vivian shared the band's nervousness, but was eagerly looking forward to the tour and, oddly enough, his trip through customs. In the weeks prior to his flight across the Atlantic, Vivian had grown more and more anxious about making his entrance into the United States memorable, emulating his hero, Oscar Wilde. As Vivian once told a reporter, I did my thesaurus on Wilde at art school. Who, when customs officials asked him if he had anything to declare, he replied, Nothing but my genius. Stancho continuously reminded the others of his plan— when the grand moment finally came, however, Vivian's plans went awry as he found himself upstaged by an unlikely character, Legs Larry Smith's elderly father. The United States Customs Service has always been the thin blue line protecting the states from subversives, especially the long-haired English rock and roll sort. Unfortunately, Larry Smith's father, a very conservative yet quirky old boy, couldn't resist the temptation to cause a little trouble. When asked on his entrance form, do you intend to overthrow the government of the United States of America, he answered, yes. In response to the follow-up question, if so, how, he replied, with my bare hands. Mr. Smith and the rest of the band were detained for several hours of intense interrogation. Once past customs, the Bonzos embarked on one of the most remarkable tours of their career. Their first gig was a performance at Bill Graham's legendary Fillmore West, where they were part of a bill featuring the Birds and Joe Cocker. To their profound delight, American audiences did get it. They had no idea who the Bonzos were, but they immediately caught on. 
Langdon Winter was on hand to cover the show for Rolling Stone magazine. Bonzo Dog had just flown in for a one-night-only Sunday gig. They were apprehensive about how they'd go over with the American audience. Good luck, Viv. Luck, Neil. Real nervous. Naturally, they blew the place apart. Dozens of trumpets, tubas, saxophones, recorders, and other less easily identifiable instruments litter the stage, ready to be played at random. Band members rush hurriedly on and off the platform, changing into bizarre costumes for the never-ending stream of skits which punctuate the lyrics of the songs. Drummer Legs Larry Smith bursts forth in a star-covered white leotard and does a Shirley Temple tap dance, topless, with simulated boobs. The pace is unsettling. Some songs are four minutes long, others four seconds. That night at the Fillmore West they upstaged both the Birds and Joe Cocker, leaving a breathless audience of converts. Bill Graham was so impressed he made a note to book Bonzo Dog into both Fillmore's on their next tour. Everywhere they played, it was the same. They were so overwhelming, so brilliant, that the big-name bands they were opening for often paled in comparison. The only time the dogs failed to receive a standing ovation was at the Sports Palace in New Jersey, where they opened up for Sly and the Family Stone. Sly refused to let the bonzos use his sound system, and Stancha was reduced to singing through a megaphone to a stadium-sized audience. The crowd, mostly teenagers, couldn't hear the band, and thus didn't understand the grand spectacle unfolding in front of them. It was the only instance in which the bonzos bombed. Everywhere we went, I can't remember not getting an ovation, remembered Stanchel. It was extraordinary. In the midst of their success, Viv noticed that American audiences tended to respond differently to the bonzos than their English fans. Rather than reacting to the performance of each song, Americans tended to judge the show as a whole, much to Vivian's delight. He found this gave them more room to experiment on stage. We were developing mammoth shows, and so far as we were playing two and three hours, and some shows went on for almost four hours, it became freer and freer. We'd start off with some new melody which would suggest a routine or mime or something else. The freedom to innovate— to continually explore on stage made a strong impression on Stanchel. A memorable conversation Vivian had with a fan in Detroit made an equally strong impression, as he later recalled in an interview with Robert Chalmers. I remember coming off stage in Detroit, and there were 250,000 people there. I wore my gold lame jacket and went into the crowd to watch the next act. A bloke came up to me and touched me, as if I were some sort of demon. Then another said, You shouldn't be here, meaning there was supposed to be an essential division between artist and audience, and I thought, Well, there's something badly wrong here. Traveling around the United States provided its share of raw entertainment. Though the dog band had relatively little trouble with the powers that be, as so many British bands were in the U.S. in 1968-69, that law enforcement more than had their hands full. They did have their moments. At the Peace Bridge, just outside of Buffalo, New York, they ran into trouble when the New York State Troopers pulled over the Bonzo's roadies. Upon hearing the band was following close behind, the Troopers decided to wait for them. Surely they must be carrying something illicit. When at last they turned up, the troopers pulled them over. "'Okay, fellas, what drugs have you got on you?' asked one of the officers. "'Drugs, officer? Surely you jest,' replied Vivian, laying his best BBC British accent on thick. "'Come on,' said the cop. "'Be honest with us. We don't have any, really. So what weapons have you got, then?' "'Weapons?' replied in outrage Stanchel. "'I attack like an animal with fists clenched and eyes blazing. "'That's the English way. "'Now come on, you fellows must have some sort of weapons to protect yourself.' "'By this time Roger, who had traveled the whole of America "'with only a toilet bag and an army jumpsuit, was getting thoroughly annoyed. "'Well, I've got some nail clippers,' he quietly announced "'and proceeded to produce clippers from the bag.' "'Geez, how do you kill anybody with those?' asked the cop. "'Oh, like this. Clip, clip, clip,' demonstrated Roger. "'Oh, but it takes such a long time.' 
When the troopers then turned to Vivian and asked him how he protected himself in America, he replied, Good manners! Touring America also gave Vivian the opportunity to reacquaint himself with a few old mates who were also on the road. Living on about literally a dollar a day, the Bonzos were booked into some fairly illustrious dives. While staying at one particularly noxious hotel in New York, Stanchel bumped into Noel Redding, bassist for the Jimi Hendrix Experience, who was crossing the street with a shopping bag full of marijuana. The two chatted, Vivian mentioning the lovely accommodations afforded by less popular bands. The following day he was leaving his hotel when a sharply dressed man approached him. Vivian Stanchel, he said, your car awaits. God, I must have gotten really sloshed last night, thought Vivian, as he stared perplexed at a stretched limo sitting outside the lobby doors. As it turned out, Jimi Hendrix hired the limo for Viv for him to use for the week. Inside were all sorts of compartments and side pockets filled with joints and various pills. That sort of unspoken generosity to think of that, to just lay it on me, was so typical of Jimmy, remarked Stanchel. Weeks later, Neil Innes too met Hendrix, a dedicated Bonzo dog fan, at a post-party gig in Los Angeles. While standing next to each other in the loo, Jimmy quite unexpectedly turned to Neil and said, "'You know, we're doing the same thing.' "'Having a slash?' replied Neil." No, said Hendrix. You guys are doing it your way, and I'm doing it mine. All told, the Bonzos lost $24,000 on their first American tour. Not much of a surprise, really. For most British bands, the first U.S. tour was mainly a glorified publicity blitz, a chance to get the band known in America. The expectations was that groups would begin to turn a profit on their second or third tour. The boys in the band returned to England exhausted and in desperate need of cash. Almost immediately they embarked upon a touring binge to get themselves back into the black, or at least as close to the black as possible. We had to work our balls off for three months doing pointless, boring work in clubs, explained Vivian. It's a miracle the band managed to stay together at all. Perhaps the most memorable image of Vivian from this time was his appearance on the cover of the March 1969 issue of the counterculture magazine Oz. The photo depicts feminist author Jermaine Greer unzipping the striped pants of a rather nonchalant stanchel. The cover was the least shocking photo. Peppered throughout the issue are various pictures of Viv and a bare-breasted Greer striking curious poses. Vivian's mother was horrified. According to Kai, posing with Greer was the most shameful thing Vivian ever did to his mum. The summer of 1969 brought a series of three shows in Ireland with Yes and the Nice, two bands that were also managed by Tony Stratton Smith. On July 18th and 19th, they played successful gigs in Belfast and Dublin. The Cork show scheduled for the 20th, the day the American Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk upon the moon, had to be cancelled due to the overwhelming incompetence of the organizers. The lack of a proper stage and power supply was overshadowed only by the lack of an audience. The day ended with all three bands in hot pursuit of Tony Stratton Smith. Debag the rotter! was their rallying cry. That evening, the bands retired to a local pub for a big piss-up. When the nicest Keith Emerson commandeered the piano, the musicians made up for the lack of an earlier performance with what Chris Welch describes as the craziest concert I have ever seen. As Neil Armstrong was preparing to take that one giant leap for mankind, the drunken mob were confronting the locals with a rousing version of Give Booze a Chance, a classic later immortalized by the Bonzos on their Unpeeled album. Later that summer, the Bonzos played the legendary Isle of Wight Festival on August 29th through 31st, 1969. Though less celebrated than Woodstock, the three-day festival had an equally incredible lineup featuring, amongst others, The Who, The Moody Blues, Joe Cocker, The Nice, and Bob Dylan and The Band. The Bonzos played the first night of the festival, going on before The Nice, also managed by Tony Stratton-Smith. Shortly before they were to go on stage, Larry and Keith Moon, who were on a mutual bender, decided to fly off in a helicopter in search of drink. Bonzos had no choice but to go on without their drummer, forcing Stanchel to appeal to the audience. 
Have you got a drummer somewhere out there? Crowd surged forward as everybody who'd ever once held a pair of drumsticks volunteered to give it a whack. Luckily, just as the first batch of hopefuls began crawling up on stage, a number of real drummers came on from backstage. Amongst them was Jim Capaldi of Traffic, Vivian's all-time favorite percussionist. Capaldi took his place behind the kit. There was an explosion, courtesy of Roger, as the bonzos tore into their set. Driven by Cowan and Capaldi, the tightest rhythm section with which the bonzos ever played, the first few songs were blistering. Viv was ecstatic. Just as they got really rocking, however, Smith and Moon returned to Earth. Realizing his bandmates had gone on without him, Smith hurried on stage. As the band launched into the opening bars of Canyons of Your Mind, he politely tapped Capaldi on the shoulder and proceeded to kick him off the drums. I'd better take over now, dear boy. This one's a little tricky. Viv's ecstasy came to a rude halt. The bugger lands, pisses around with Keith Moon, kicks Jimmy off the kit, and gives him a tambourine, he later remembered. I could have killed the dear boy. Exhausted by the pressures of touring, the weary bonzos decided to fall back to safe ground for their next album. Released in August of 1969, Tadpoles is practically a greatest hits album. Only five songs are original compositions, three previously released as singles, Urban Spaceman, Canyons of Your Mind, and Mr. Apollo, plus a wonderful pair of spear compositions, Shirt and Tubas in the Moonlight. The rest of the album is filled out with novelty jazz tracks the Bonzos had performed on Do Not Adjust Your Set, and two tracks recorded back in 1965, Dr. Jazz and Laughing Blues. A surprising departure from Donut and Granny's Greenhouse, Tadpoles lacks the rocking surrealism that so wonderfully distinguished its predecessor. A surprising departure from Donut and Granny's Greenhouse, Tadpoles lacks the rocking surrealism that so wonderfully distinguished its predecessor. In spite of its rather haphazard composition, Tadpoles is still a remarkably coherent album. The songs ebb and flow from wonderful novelty songs to mellow jazz to fuzz guitar-driven rock. All told, the album balances the Bonzo's rock and jazz influences better than any of their other albums. Reviewing Tadpoles for Rolling Stone, Lester Bangs praised the band as outstanding musicians who've mastered every idiom of the 20th century even while admitting the album was a letdown from their previous LPs because it finds the Bonzos easing their satire and leaning a little too heavily to Cream Puff Camp. Banks' criticism is understandable. Many, if not most, of the dog's American fans were unfamiliar with Do Not Adjust Your Set. An album of novelty songs and jazz didn't really make sense to an audience expecting the exhilaration of Donut in Granny's Greenhouse. One of the factors causing the Bonzos to fall back on old standards for tadpoles was Stanchel's increasingly difficult behavior. Around Christmas 1968 and early 1969, there had been signs that the music biz was increasingly getting to Vivian. He was drinking heavily and also began experiencing severe bouts of depression. In the occasional interview, he would mention that the Bonzos were thinking about breaking up or that he might even leave the band. The first American tour lifted him up briefly, but afterwards he began to deteriorate quickly. In hindsight, many of Vivian's friends suggest that subtle changes began much earlier. In Spears' words, he was slipping from his limp-wristed, nasal, BBC, dance-hall figure-type nonsense things and degenerating into the weird, satanic stuff like Eleven Mustachioed Daughters. At the time, Stanchel's growing interest in the darker imagery was passed off as merely a change in artistic influences. The seamier side of human behavior had always fascinated him. It was natural that he would explore it in his art. Even his drinking could be written off as rock and roll excess, overindulgence being the norm in the music industry. During the recording of Tadpoles, however, Vivian's behavior grew increasingly disruptive. He was drinking heavily, and would often show up for sessions dead drunk if he bothered to show up at all. During the recording of By a Waterfall, Stanchel was completely pissed and fell off his stool twice before the track could be recorded. For Vivian, 
the mounting pressures of touring, recording, and the increasingly difficult burden of balancing his private and professional life grew troublesome to everyone in his orbit. On January 1, 1968, he had married Monica Pizer after she had become pregnant with his child. At first, Vivian was reluctant to marry her. He was living the rock and roll lifestyle and loved the freedom of being single. The strong Catholic influence of Vivian's parents, in particular his mother's insistence that they should wed, exerted significant pressure on him. Eventually, Viv gave in to his mum's wishes and proposed to Monica. Their son, Rupert, was born just six months later, on June 27, 1968. A hint of Stanchel's thoughts on the institution of marriage is offered in a press conference for the Bonzo Dog Band's first American tour. When asked about marriage, Vivian replies, the best ones are when you feel that you are not. Compounding Stanchel's anxieties were his growing concerns about the band's future. Urban spacemen had brought them international attention. They'd successfully toured America, but the band was still severely in debt, still running themselves into the ground with endless touring. The frustration which had eased with the first American tour returned. Tensions rose within the band. Ever since the Donut in Granny's Greenhouse, the Bonzos had been more stanchial and innocent than anyone else. Both Roger and Rodney were convinced that the end was near. Roger Ruskinspear didn't give a damn about rock and roll. His involvement in the studio was increasingly minimal as he grew ever more detached from the band. Rodney was completing a degree in social work in his spare time so that he would have something to do if and when the band folded. Only Dennis Cowan and Legs Larry soldiered on as if nothing were amiss. None of this sufficiently explains, however, what was happening to Stanchel and what finally caused him to have his first nervous breakdown, nor can any analysis describe the intense pain Viv endured during this period. Years later, Stanchel would confide in his second wife, Kai Longfellow, his emotional and spiritual state during these times, revealing what caused him to finally break down. It began during one of the Bonzo shows. For Stanchel, concerts were transcendental experiences. Prior to going on, Vivian would bellow like a Zulu warrior in the dressing room, building up his confidence and energy for his performance. On stage, he would shift into a different state of mind. Stanchel described it to Kai as leaning on the energy of the people, the love of the people. He felt he could lean forward into an audience and be held up, and that he could actually levitate on their energy. In this case, we are talking about an actual physical manifestation, explains Kai. We're not talking about an idea, or that it felt like that. He was sure that it was actually happening. One night, Stanchel's experiences took on frightening proportions. Leaning on the energy of the crowd, he suddenly found that he was going too far out into the audience, so that he was losing control. He confided in Kai that he had undergone an out-of-body experience on stage. It terrified him. Kai remembers. Vivian was in shock. He was having a nervous breakdown. His ego was shocked terrified, and threatened by having an out-of-body experience. After that concert, he locked himself in his room for days. He was babbling and rocking in a corner. Monica and his friends were terribly worried. Everyone was terrified he was going crazy, and so was he. They wanted to commit him, so he painted his room black and hid in it. Basically, he was having a major crisis of spirit and identity, he lost his personality. It was a disassociative experience. He didn't know who he was, but he was trying to put it back together as best he could. He had major panic attacks from that moment on, two or three times a day, after day, after day, unrelenting. He didn't know how to deal with it. He just did what any normal English lad would do. He went to the doctor. And the doctor gave him fucking pills. The doctor gave him Valium, and he was drinking, anything to stop this experience. That's how it all started. His nerves, too frayed to continue, Stanchel succumbed to his first panic attack at his home in East Finchley. 
He was rushed to the hospital, where a doctor administered a heavy dose of Valium to calm him. A devastating moment. It was the beginning of an unrelenting, lifelong dependence on the highly addictive drug. Stanchel hid much of his agony from the band. But by the time they were embarking on their second American tour in the fall of 1969, something was obviously very wrong. Neil Innes recalls the day they left for the tour. We went round to pick him up from his place in Finchley, the place where he had had the heads clipped like a human leg. He came out with a completely bald head, and we thought, what have you done? He'd always been a buffoon and a japer, but this started to look serious. There was a sudden character change around then, and I really didn't know what caused it. Stanchel's personal strength, supplemented by regular doses of Valium, enabled him to hide his pain. He was able to record tadpoles in Kingsham and tour the United States in the latter half of 1969, but he never fully recovered. According to Gus Dudgeon, who engineered tadpoles in Kingsham, he became more and more unhinged. He never stopped talking about the fact that he was hooked on tranquilizers, and he was very bitter about it. 1969 was a very big year for British bands to tour America, as Neil explains. Somebody got the idea to get every English band there ever was over to America that year. There were so many bands and not at all enough gigs. The bands who could actually hire the muscle men to hang people out of windows to get the gigs were getting the gigs. Still, the Bonzo had reason to be optimistic. Bill Graham's promise to book them at both the Fillmore East and West this time around still stood firm. Moreover, in July of 1969, Rolling Stone published an in-depth article on the Bonzos by Greg Marcus and Longding Winner. The article was a profound departure from previous coverage of the Bonzos in magazines such as Melody Maker and the New Music Express. While the authors wrote glowing reviews of both the Bonzo show at the Fillmore West and the recently released Urban Spaceman, they also included an examination of the artistic side of the group. Their keen analysis of their work was penetrating and insightful. The special talent of this group is its ability to penetrate the gobs of superficiality and find the ridiculous inner core of whatever it is they tackle. Whether it is to be maudlin nightclub acts, the films of Walt Disney, psychedelic rock, or the Englishman on vacation, Bonzo Dog is always able to capture the embarrassing essence. Stanchel was singled out as the prime mover of the band. Offstage, the young lead singer is the perfect model of politeness and quiet composure. But when confronted with a microphone, he becomes a wild, self-transforming demon, eyes flashing with maniacal brilliance and scraggly yellow hair falling into his eyes. He switches quickly from the voice of a 30s crooner to that of a BBC announcer or a 50s rock idol and bombards his audience with lines which range from the ridiculous to the repulsive. In the States, both the music press and fans were beginning to take notice of the bonzos, and it wasn't only for the toy hypodermic needles and Legs Larry's provocative leotards. By all measures, it seemed like they were on the verge of breaking into the U.S. market big time. If they get the right breaks, the Rolling Stone authors concluded, the bonzo dog may one day end up more popular than Judas. All that the band needed to do now was continue to be brilliant. United Artist and Premier Talent, who managed the tour, promised the dog band that the tour was securely booked and that they would receive strong promotion. Upon their arrival in America, the lads soon realized things had somehow gone terribly wrong, however. Tour dates had been changed, ticket prices inflated, and in many cases, their album was unavailable in the very cities in which they were playing. Oh, it was great fun doing a show in Chicago, for example, only to find out that there'd been no billing whatsoever and that we'd been advertised for the same evening in Detroit, remembers Larry. In Chicago, the place burned down two days before we arrived, says Stanchel. It was the sort of thing the promoters knew while we were in New York. I figured out halfway through our second tour that if we were very lucky and didn't eat, 
we would lose mm, about 6,000 pounds. Not only that, we'd be wrecks. The final insult came when Roger's wife had a miscarriage and fell seriously ill. The family tried to contact him in the States, but was unable to reach him at several hotels. Messages were left for him at Premier Talent, but the company, for one reason or another, was very slow to pass them on. Four days after his wife had been hospitalized, and shortly before their October 17th and 18th gigs at the Fillmore East, word finally got through to Spear. Stanchel remembers. Roger, bless him, said, well, look, I'll do this one and then I'm going. And I said, well, bloody well, right you are, son. Go now if you want. He played the Fillmore East show, then, with the band's blessing, he returned to England. Billboard raved about their performance that night. The Bonzo Dog Band, a millinery industrial complex of glad rags and gimmicks, wrapped Rock's knuckles with slapstick and burlesque at the Fillmore East, October 17th, upstaging the kinks and spirit, whose rock jazz specialty closed the bill with all dignity threatened at the evening's outset by the Bonzo's engagement. Frustrated by the tour and infuriated by the way Roger was treated, reportedly neither United Artists nor Premier Talent offered to pay for his flight home, the Bonzo Dog Band called a press conference and announced that they were returning to England. Several major appearances, including a performance on the nationally syndicated TV show Music Scenes and gigs in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Detroit, were all cancelled. We are going home, explained Stanchel, because we want to do what we consider our main purpose, which is to write, record, and perform. We're not interested in becoming commodities to be bartered about by leeches in any country. Who needs it? Shocked by the Bonzo's decision, United Artists and Premier Talent were quick to respond. Marty Hoffman, director of publicity for United Artists, argued that the company spent a lot of money promoting the Bonzo's gigs and advertising the record. He felt they simply expected too much from the record company. A lot of the British groups expect record companies here to be like those in England and act as managers, babysitters, and booking agents. But we don't do that. Our job is to distribute and promote records. A lot of record stores didn't want to stock the Bonzo albums because they are not a big group. They really hurt themselves by not going to Los Angeles to do those television shows. The president of Premier Talent also responded to Vivian's accusations. I think they're crazy for going home. I do resent what Mr. Stanchel is saying. We've worked very hard on them. The Bonzos, he explained, just didn't understand that the tour was an investment in the future and was bound to lose money. These English acts read inflated reports in the British trade papers that a lot of money is being made in America. A group like the Bonzos, who are not familiar with the touring scene here, come hoping to make all the money in the world. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Only months after publishing Greg Marcus and Langdon Winner's complimentary article, Rolling Stone published a piece entitled Bonzo Dog Runs, Fucks Itself. The author, Lorraine Alterman, echoed the popular opinion that the Bonzos had hurt themselves by leaving, but finished with a telling observation. Many groups got into this rat race, but they are unique in actually protesting it. Stanchel came back from America in a very bad way. The misery of the tour was heightened by his realization that the Bonzos would probably never go abroad again. Still recovering from his breakdown, Vivian was looking at the eminent destruction of his rock and roll dream, albeit with mixed emotions. It takes a long time to actually question what you are doing. America was the final realization that things had gone irreversibly sour. The Bonzos had lost touch with the artistic forces that had once united the band. Artistically, each member was moving in his own direction, to the point where everyone was standing in the other's way. Consequently, they began to resent each other. Viv admits that he was turning into a bastard fellow with a real veneer of malice. Despite the growing fiction, however, the Bonzos returned to the studio determined to hold it together for at least one last album. 
For the recording, the band stepped outside of themselves, transferring their tensions into one last ground musical allegory. We had all of these separate songs, explained Neil, and we thought it might be better if we had a story going through in which our whole existence was a dream and we were really patients in an asylum who had invented a band as a kind of group therapy. Stanchel elaborates on the plot. Idealistic, young, and hopeful. We then run into managerial problems, business hassles, clubs, and all the drudgery that goes with this profession. It turns us into the very things that we set out to destroy. We become sacred cows and get all of the decay kicked out of us. Towards the second half, we try to regain that which was lost. The track, I Want to Be With You, is representative of that. When you get too covered in sequence, you want to rush out and do very ordinary things. The result, Kingsham is an album which recalls the band's good old days in the Royal College of Art, when the Bonzos sincerely set out to express themselves and tear down the pretensions of the art establishment. The days before Sam Spoon and Bohe No were kicked out of the band because their images weren't right, before Legs Larry was following Paul McCartney down the street before they went to America, as in real life, the lads bravely tried to recapture that spirit. The allegory is pertinent to the band in that this LP was meant to be the final tattle, Stanchel explained, a last effort to get something out as we slowly cracked up. Before pouring everything into this record, we had all been down on one another and too busy with projects at home to repair relationships. Unfortunately, it doesn't really matter whether or not the songs on Kingsham serve to support the loosely constructed allegory. Kingsham is a brilliant album, which succeeds in recapturing the original irreverent spirit of the Bonzos. As with Tadpoles, it was solid from beginning to end. Like the hodgepodge found on previous Bonzo albums, there are wonderful rock numbers like Tent, You Done My Brain In, and the wonderfully absurd Mr. Slater's Parrot and noises for the leg. At times, Kingsham is also sublime. Innes's summertime walks and I want to be with you are overlooked gems. Kingsham was released in November of 1969, December in the U.S. Critical reaction to the album was generally enthusiastic. By December of 1969, Stanchel reached the point where he really couldn't go on anymore. As his condition worsened, Monica bore the brunt of Viv's instability. She would later reveal to journalist David Chalmers that unusual things were happening, and they would often become frighteningly normal. On one occasion, Monica came home with son Rupert to find that Viv had painted the living room black. On another, when her mother was over for Christmas dinner, Vivian arrived at the dinner table with his head shaven and bleeding. Roger was very blunt about the situation. Viv was obviously terribly fond of the band, but he was so schizophrenic and unstable that it shouldn't continue as a viable commercial proposition with him as the front man. And when at last the band was finally finished forever, the English rock press eulogized the Bonzos, while the reaction from the American media was significantly less maudlin. Rolling Stone, reflecting on the reasons for the breakup, suggested that a lack of financial success and exposure had brought the Bonzos to the point of concluding rather bluntly, Bonzo Dog is on its back, feet in the air. In an article entitled Doom Watch, Melody Maker's Chris Welch attempted to tackle the Bonzo breakup. The Bonzos were torn apart by their conflicting personalities and artistic ambitions, and the end certainly didn't come abruptly. It can be argued, however, that the Bonzos peaked as a creative, valid, worthwhile entity long before they broke up. They had reached their artistic peak when they were playing dadoist jazz in the clubs. The Bonzos first came together in 1962, disguised as a trad jazz band. In reality, however, they were a group of ambitious art students driven by their own muses. Stanchel, a painter and a poet, 
Speer, a mechanical artist. Innes, a musician and songwriter. Slater, a musician and would-be fascist. The force that brought them together, aside from a shared sense of humor and love of beer, was their mutual attraction for the neo dadaist philosophy of outrage. This expressed itself in their desire to undermine and defend. Innes once declared, We aren't doing the temperance seven, we are murdering them. In the years ahead, much more would be written about the breakup, articles that tried to explain the artistic inevitable. Twenty years later, Stanchel and Smith would discuss the breakup in more stark terms. Stanchel. Well, the money started to roll in about two months before we stopped it. When you've got to deal with your record company, and I remember this, while I don't remember numbers, at 35 of 1% of 90%, you're not going to make a lot of dough. And that's what we were getting off our records. Shall I repeat that for you? That's 1% of 35% of 1% of 90%. Do you know how much money I've made? Not counting the intro and the outro, which still gets a lot of daring and airing. 26 quid. That's it. That's the entire sum that I made in the Bonzo Dog Band. Don't believe me, but that's it. 26 quid in the whole of our career. I don't think Larry made anything, did you? Larry. Well, there was Veronica in St. Louis. Oh, yes, and Tammy and Dorothy and... Chapter 6. The Strain. Bedtime for Bonzo. 1970-1973. A dead mouse is a good model for a live mouse but not for long. Mother was Jewish, but she pulled out of it and married a Gemini, didn't she? Vivian Stanchel Vivian Stanchel put everything he had into the Bonzo Dog Band. He sacrificed a promising art career, his energy, ego, and to some extent even his sanity, trying to make the group successful and himself a heavy-duty rock star. In the end, it was a combination of his committed self-destruction and the group's separate artistic interests that made the band fall short. Stenchel would now spend the early 1970s dealing with the results of decisions he made in the 1960s, attempting to find his artistic way despite his personal instability. Stenchel was in very bad shape when the Bonzos broke up. 1969 had been a particularly grinding year. Pushed to the limit, Vivian had little time to recover from the savage panic attacks he suffered from earlier in the year. The breakup only made things worse. The band had given him much-needed support and stability. Without them, there was little to keep him from crashing. Vivian had also grown addicted to Valium as well as alcohol, on top of which he suffered from severe stress, exhaustion, and chronic depression. Under the circumstances, Stanchel might have been expected to take some time off at home with his family to recover. He was residing with his wife Monica and his son Rupert in his mother-in-law's place in Hampstead's Garden suburb, a home he christened Che Guevara. Here Vivian lived a surprisingly sedate life, surrounded by his family and beloved marine pets. He had become something of an expert on fish and reptiles, and kept numerous aquariums filled with turtles, catfish, and assorted aquatic life. On the bedroom balcony he had an old bathtub in which he raised snails to feed to the turtles. Aside from the smell it seemed a strangely quiet lifestyle for such a flashy musician. Despite his state, Vivian was still driven by his endless creativity. In the wake of the Bonzo's inevitable sinking, Vivian lunged into a multitude of artistic directions, a drowning artist reaching for a life-saving medium. Over the course of the next three years, he would form numerous bands, record yet another Bonzo album, release his first solo work, host his own radio show, spend a great deal of time getting drunk with Keith Moon, work with Arthur Brown on several unrealized musicals, do guest spots on other people's albums, perform live with The Scaffold, and, as always, continue to paint. In February of 1970, Stanchel formed the short-lived Sean Head Show Band with Dennis Cowan, 
Eric Clapton, and Remy Kabaka. The band released one delightful single, Labiodental Fricative, Paper Round, before disbanding. The song's unusual title was Stanchel's term for a tongue twister and one of the most tuneful and clever songs he ever wrote, an intriguing taste of the musical direction in which he might have gone. Soon thereafter he threw another group together, Vivian Stanchel and his gargantuan chums. Once again the result was a solitary single, Suspicion. The chums' existence was so fleeting that the flip side, Blind Date, was actually recorded by another of Vivian's bands, his most ambitious project of this period, Big Grunt, or in full, Vivian Stanchel's Big Grunt. Viv chose to spell the name so that you get GGR in the middle. Stanchel boasted the band would be a riot of vulgarity. I want to have floral cars to pull me off the stage, and I'll wear great tall wigs with flashing lights and have mice running through my hair. The band consisted of Dennis Cowan, Fred Borneo Munt, Roger Ruskin Spear, and Coventry rocker Bubs White. Stancher wanted to use the band as a vehicle to explore musical directions that were unavailable to him in the bonzos. He was especially interested in using African polyrhythms and speculated that the band might include an African drum section to ascend their theatrical performances. Big Grunt is going to be a rhythmic thing, with a uniform pattern running through it. There will be gags, both sound and visual, just as in dance, where body movements create movements linked with music. So you can do this with words as well. We'll be trying to keep the thing flowering, blossoming, suggesting what should come next. If Stanchel's musical plans were ambitious, so was his intention to be the band's manager, in addition to its songwriter and leader. Within weeks, however, Vivian could no longer handle the burden he placed upon himself. Big Grunt played just two gigs, and shortly thereafter, Vivian succumbed to a nervous breakdown and, for the first time, found himself in the mental ward of Hollywick Hospital. In the past, some writers have tried to label Vivian Stanchel's condition as schizophrenic manic depressive or even schizophrenic depression. To some extent, these pop psychology diagnoses are nonsense. They have a point in that Stanchel did display behavior that could be described as manic depressive or even schizophrenic, but whether he actually suffered from manic depression or schizophrenia is another far more serious matter. Vivian certainly had his demons, lots of them. He wasted half of his life addled by alcoholism and dependency on Valium. He could be emotionally abusive often alienating close friends with his erratic and selfish behavior. Perhaps the greatest tragedy of Vivian's condition was that he was acutely aware that his sensibilities were very much at odds with the world's. When, as Sir Henry, Stanchel observed, This is the future, and it hates us. He was not only playing a role, but expressing his view of the world around him. That Vivian fell out of sync with the world contributed greatly to his progressive downfall. Viv was confined to a hospital bed for several weeks. In an odd twist of fate, Stancho wound up in the same loony bin that Spike Milligan, who had also suffered periods of depression throughout his remarkable life, had been in only just days before. He remembers. Spike Milligan had just left, and the nurse said to me, "'Do you like greens?' I replied, "'Yes, I like greens.' The nurse then looked at me with a disapproving look, Mr. Milligan didn't like greens. I realized I was doomed. People who are off-center don't like greens was the first rule, and I had foiled it. During Stanchel's stay, Keith Moon visited frequently, watching over him and making sure he got the best accommodations under the circumstances. If there could possibly be a happy result of Viv being hospitalized, it was that it gave him time to develop his friendship with Keith. Vivian and Keith were kindred spirits. They shared a dedication for concocting elaborate schemes, for offending people, had similar senses of humor, and were both hopeless alcoholics. In Moon, Stancho found the perfect accomplice, ready to engage in all sorts of antisocial acts and endowed with the cash to pay for the damages. 
With Keith at his side, he launched into public performances he'd been rehearsing since he was a child, the tales of how Stanchel and Moon spent two years terrorizing the unsuspecting folk of England are nothing short of infamous. One of their more convincing schemes had Vivian dressing up as a vicar strolling down Oxford Street in London. Moon's limo would pull up and its occupants, dressed like gangsters, would pounce upon Vivian, dragging the seemingly helpless acolyte into the car. On one occasion they were a tad too convincing and a cop star stopped them before they spirited away. A variation on the vicar theme was set on a busy London street. Vivian, once again playing the pious cleric, would be casually strolling down the street when he would suddenly drop to the ground and clutch his shoulders as if he was having a heart attack. Viv recalled the scheme. I had a violent and dramatic heart attack. Keith was taking photographs and had a PA on his Rolls Royce and was saying, For God's sakes, help him, help him. And nobody did. With my hair pulled back, I made quite a convincing priest, so I kept having these heart attacks, and I had phony blood capsules and things, and nobody stopped. Occasionally they would choose to victimize innocent clothiers with a stunt called trouser testing. Keith would go into an upmarket boutique and announce he was looking for a particularly strong pair of trousers. He would then solicit help from someone nearby to test them out. Vivian, who had snuck into the store, would offhandedly volunteer, and the two would each grab a leg of the pants and pull mightily, splitting the trousers in two. The salespeople would stare in horror. Some even started to cry. Then the pièce de résistance. A one-legged chap, who they'd hired, would come hobbling into the store. Ah, he would shout, just what I have been looking for, one-legged trousers. By far their most infamous series of stunts involved their Nazi impersonations. Barry Wenzel, photographer for The Melody Maker, was hired to do some publicity photos and was shocked when the pair arrived dressed up in their finest Nazi regalia. Keith was dressed as the Fuhrer. Stanchel wore the outfit of an SS officer. Wenzel quite reasonably had mixed feelings about their choice of clothing, but he completed the photo shoot, capturing the two musicians clowning around in the track studio offices, offering their best Sig Heils and sticking pins into maps of Europe. Following the shoot, Stanchel and Moon decided that they should take their act on the road. The idea, explained Viv, was to confront the uniform of the speakeasy with another uniform, both uniforms being equally ridiculous. Declining Wenzel's offer to let them change in his nearby apartment, they proceeded to visit two German beer kellers in London's swank West End. In the first establishment, they walked in and ordered drinks, causing the landlady, spying their outfits, to immediately faint. They would later learn that her husband had died in a concentration camp. The pair was subsequently asked to sit by themselves in an alcove. Greatly inspired by the reaction their behavior caused, and too caught up in the fun to realize that they had transcended the bounds of good taste, they decided to head to a nearby speakeasy. When they entered the bar, the entire place went silent. The customers stared in disbelief. Soon Stancho found himself dancing with a lady accordionist who recognized them and got the joke. Moon, however, found himself face to face with a less sympathetic six-foot-inch German wearing traditional German lederhosen. Moon greeted him with a loud sigheil. Vivian takes up the tale. I noticed the Fuhrer was struggling at arm's length with this huge brute. He managed the stairs, holding Keith in one hand, and threw him out into the gutter. Keith kept running down the stairs, and the guy kept chasing him, yelling, Swine! The two wore their uniforms on and off for the next several weeks. Vivian eventually tired of the joke, but not Keith. Moon would occasionally don his uniform right up until his death in 1978. The joke reached its tasteless climax with a leisurely drive in an open-topped Mercedes through a predominantly Jewish neighborhood. As they drove, they offered salutes to the stunned onlookers. Keith also joined Viv for more constructive projects. In the summer of 1971, 
Vivian was offered an opportunity to explore a new medium with John Walters, a BBC radio producer, who gave him the opportunity to host John Peel's Top Gear radio show while Peel was on holiday. Walters produced some of the Bonzo's Top Gear sessions. He liked Stanchel and thought his humor would translate well on air. Walters expected that Vivian would add a few sardonic comments in between numbers, but to his dismay, he soon realized Vivian's vision was far more far-reaching, a development Walters might have anticipated had he paid attention to the Craig Torso bit the Bonzos did for Top Gear. As Walter later admitted to Keith Moon biographer Tony Fletcher, I opened the fucking floodgates there. Soon Stanchel was putting together elaborate shows, in between playing music by personal favorites such as Link Ray and George Formby, and the occasional request from Keith Moon such as Little GTO by Ronnie and the Daytonas, he was performing skits, doing on-site interviews, anything he felt like really. One of the more elaborate bits was a radio serial featuring himself as Colonel Knut and Keith Moon as his cockney sidekick, Lemmy. Like all of Vivian's spoken word material, the serials displayed his tremendous gift for wordplay. We take up the action in the middle of a typical serial. In this episode, Colonel Knut is playing his nemesis, the Scorpion, in table tennis. Knut is trouserless, having taken them off to play. The scorpion is using the game as a ruse to steal the trousers. In the meantime, Lemmy had snuck up the trestle to keep an eye on them both. Lemmy, Moon. Right, right, right and double right. That is the governor in his unmentionables playing ping pong with some weird looking geezer, isn't he? If he sees me like this, it could well put him off his stroke. Go on, Governor. Give him the old corkscrew, eh, eh? Scorpion. Ah, und love too. Colonel Knut, Stancho. I'd love to ram your socks down your smoking sardonic cake hole, though I don't fancy taking them off much. The blighter's got a club foot, don't you know? Don't suppose he washes it much. I'll let him have the old corkscrew then, shall I, eh? Scorpion. A most clever stroke, Colonel Knut. One, two. I too know something of spins. Try this one, Colonel Knut. In your gutter language, it is called the bizarre one. Colonel Knut. By all that's filthy, over the net, off the wall, three spins under the table, on to my side, and oh, bottoms, one, two, deuce. Scorpion. Deuce. My later trouserless Colonel Knut Deuce! <laughs> Colonel Knut. Deuce, you don't say. No, I'd rather have cornflakes. An active chap needs a bit of roughage, and since I've started, I've been regular as clockwork. The sound of a cuckoo clock and a flushing toilet. Scorpion. Thine last service, Colonel Knut! <laughs> Colonel Knut. Right, I'll get the ball. Great guns, it's one of your blasted apes watching us from the window. It's waving and winking at me, you unspeakable scoundrel. I knew that we weren't alone. Scorpion. My sincere apologies, Colonel Knut. The beast has no business here. Allow me to punish him. The sound of breaking glass being sprung. Let me. Blow me, Governor. I. Does this mean curtains for Lemmy? Has the scorpion finally done for our clean-cut cockney chum? Where are the ten strong men? Who is the belcher of Britain? How am I going to finish this rubbish next week? They'll all have to die. Yes, <laughs> die. Know all. Hear all. Find out in next week's episode. Radio Flashes was the perfect opportunity for Stanchel to show off his lyrical writing and innate acting ability. Unfortunately, after producing only a handful of shows, the strain of working regularly began to show up once again. As would happen on so many of Vivian's projects, he began Radio Flashes in top form, but soon faltered, his behavior becoming increasingly erratic. In an odd twist, 
Moon, who was equally renowned for his sky-high unpredictability, remained reliable. The drummer adored the radio shows and always showed up ready for work, Walters remembers. Viv became just fucking impossible. I remember producing the last Colonel Knut and Lemmy serial, and it was pretty much needed for the show the next day. We were running up against the wire. I remember being sat in the Beeb at twelve, and Moon turned up good as gold. Now, when you've got Mooney as the example of how it should be done, you realize what you're dealing with. By the time their run ended, Walters was having recurring nightmares about Stanchel and Colonel Knut. Still, the experience was not so problematic that Walters and Peel ever lost sight of Stanchel's brilliance. In a few months, they called Vivian back to do a second set of radio shows. Eventually, Stanchel and Moon would become estranged. During one of his occasional bouts of sobriety, Viv confessed that he was tiring of the constant binging and infantile pranks. Unlike Keith, Vivian did not feel obliged to play the rock and roll near do well for an admiring public. He had no desire to play the fool while killing himself in the process. Moon, on the other hand, simply could not stop. Once Keith's friendship with Viv became estranged, he found a new accomplice in Oliver Reed. Vivian never lost his affection for Moon, who would continue to be an indirect force in his life through the years. Still recovering from his breakdown, Stanchel spent the better part of 1971 hanging around his house, feeding his turtles, painting, and writing music on his ukulele. Prospective projects at the time included a musical called Warm Steps, a fantasy on drug use in various cultures, a pilot for a Scottish television show, and talk with BBC Radio about the format of a potential radio series. None of these projects, however, panned out. Removed from any sustained creative structure, Stanchel's artistic instincts ran wild, exposing his worst tendencies. Without focus, he would often go out on wild tangents, never having the discipline necessary to complete his increasingly ambitious projects. Since the Bonzos hadn't exactly raked in the money, times were perpetually tight for Stanchel. Facing the prospect of going broke, he began doing commercial voiceovers and various odd one-offs to keep his head above the water. Many of the projects were done for the checks, but others were more serious artistic endeavors. One of the more interesting projects Vivian pursued was a band called The Human Beings. Not strictly a band by definition, but rather a loose-knit group of artists, the Bean's concept grew out of a gig Stanchel played at the Edinburgh Festival. Vivian's backing band for the gig, hastily dubbed Vivian Stanchel and Friends, had been thrown together at the very last minute. With little time to rehearse, the band sounded exceptionally raw and dynamic, falling back on improvisation and experimentation on stage. In this loose-knit organization, Stanchel found the same sense of unpredictability that had characterized the early bonzos. Stanchel composed a list of artists that included musicians, poets, and mimes, artists that, in his words, had a good cerebral relationship with each other. Members included the likes of Neil Innes, Andy Roberts, and Liverpool poet Adrian Henry. When the human beings were offered shows, he would call everyone on the list, and whoever was available would show up for the performances. Stancho wanted the sets to be loose enough to include as wide a range of activities as possible, music, mimes, stories, poetry, and more, so that each individual would get his rocks off. He decided that the human beings would concentrate on playing obscure venues, the sort of places which rarely saw concerts, let alone acts this outrageous. As Vivian explained, We did one gig in this place in Scotland called Cumbernauld, which is completely isolated, but they've turned a big barn into a theatre called The Cottage. It was really good. We were playing to a whole community, mums and dads and everyone. It's easy to see why the concept appealed to Vivian, as it harkened back to the early days of the Bonzo Dog. It would have been fascinating to see how the concept might have developed. Unfortunately, the Beans only played a few gigs before the idea was abandoned, set aside in a wonderful bit of irony, so Stanchel could return to the Bonzos. The Bonzos rose or at the very least moaned once more in 1972, and for arguably all the wrong reasons. At the time of their breakup, the group was still under contract with the United Artists. 
When the UA representatives informed them of their obligations, the Bonzos basically told them to fuck off. United Artists decided to press the issue. The former Bonzos ran into legal problems when they tried to record on other labels. Hassles over royalties became commonplace. A year and a half later, United Artists offered the Bonzos a compromise. One last album, and their contract would be fulfilled. So, with the enthusiasm of a disinherited bastard son attending the three-day wake of a distant relative, the band turned up in the studio to record one final Bonzo album. Numerous legends surround the album, or more accurately, the album that Let's Make Up and Be Friendly could have been. Evidently, the original recording was done in one take with the entire band participating, as Viv recalled. We turned up and we set the old stopwatch, said ready in the box, right, got the level, and we just did it. Forty-five minutes, non-stop, straight off the cuff, extemporaneous nonsense. Complete improvisation, all of it. The result, the tape of which may or may not still exist, reflected the boys' anger at having to record another album at all. We were all furious, all out of our minds with rage, explained Stanchel. The session, while cathartic, was hardly presentable. The band realized they couldn't put the album out at all. After all, Stancho later reflected, you've got people who are your friends, in a way, waiting to buy the album. Not wanting to disappoint their fans, the Bonzos regrouped and wrote new material for the album. Let's Make Up and Be Friendly bore the Bonzo Dog Band's name, but the album was, in reality, only very loosely a Bonzo record at all. Vivian and Neil composed nearly all of the material on the album. Legs Larry added the unusual Rusty Champion Thrust, and Roger Ruskinspear, the magnum opus, Waiting for the Wardrobe. Rodney Slater appeared only in spirit. Vivian and Neil were the only bonzos to appear on all of the songs. Most of the backing instrumentals were provided by Huey Flint, Bob's White, Dave Richards, Dick Perry, and Andy Roberts. Stancho referred to Let's Make Up and Be Friendly as the Get Out of the Contract album, an accurate enough description. The album is so uninspired, one begins to wonder whether the original recording might have been preferable after all. Several tunes, however, do stand out. Waiting for the Wardrobe is a first-rate Roger Ruskin Spear composition that should have been saved for his brilliant solo albums Electric Shocks or Unusual. Innes's slush is a piece screaming to be stuck in at the end of Donut. Fresh Wound is a tuneful number with a clever bridge between lyrics. Still, inevitably, most songs fall flat. Try convincing people to listen to the bonzos by playing Turkey's Don't Get Me Wrong or Rusty Champion Thrust. Stanchel's Rawlinson's End, however, is the album's centerpiece. The Rawlinson's once a brief mention in the intro and the outro, were rapidly becoming Viv's masterwork. By the time of Let's Make Up and Be Friendly, he had created an entire world for the eccentric Rawlinsons to inhabit, Rawlinson's End, where they lived in upper-class Victorian absurdity, blissfully unaware of the present. Stanchel first encountered the Rawlinsons on the road somewhere between endless northern gigs. Rodney Slater tells the story. We were in the van with the radio on, and you know those awful plays they have on there? One of the lines was something like, And the Rawlinsons are coming. Everyone burst into laughter. Viv got a hold of it, and it appeared as the Rawlinsons on trombone in the intro and the outro. When the Rawlinsons first surfaced on the intro and the outro, great to have the Rawlinsons on trombone. It was the name and its association with those awful plays and its hint of elitism that appealed to Stanchel. By the time another Rawlinson appeared on rhinocratic oaths from Donut in Granny's Greenhouse, the character Percy Rawlinson had taken on the upper-class eccentric persona which would characterize Sir Henry. After Donut, it would be a few years before the Rawlinsons would again show up on vinyl. In the interim, Vivian would take that simple line he and the other Bonzos had found so amusing and turn it into something quite extraordinary. Rawlinson's End, truly spawned from the nexus of Stanchel's interest, the lyricism of the spoken word, the silliness of class structure, Victorian England, darkest Africa, the British Empire, and, of course, Dada. 
With Radio Flashes, John Peel encouraged Vivian to explore his interest in spoken word pieces, allowing Viv to begin amalgamating all of his pastimes together. The debut of the violently eccentric Sir Henry Rawlinson and Rawlinson End was the real breakthrough. Sir Henry, who bragged with great bluster about his experiences on the dark continent and greeted new neighbors with both barrels of a shotgun, was less a creation than a personification of Stanchel's bombast. Indeed, there was a bit of Vivian in all the characters which inhabited Rawlinson's end. It was a relationship he'd explore for the rest of his career. Let's Make Up and Be Friendly was released in March 1972. The Bonzos deserve credit for their effort and for the few gems that do show up in the album, but it is painfully obvious that everyone was far more interested in their solo projects. Not surprisingly, critical reaction was mixed. Melody Maker responded very favorably to the Bonzos' new offering. I insist, writes the interviewer, that you buy this appallingly beautiful album, Hail Bonzos. Rolling Stone, however, didn't quite get the Rawlinson end bit and summed up the album's impact thusly. No one seems interested, the performances sound perfunctory, and the production is shallow. In sum, a pale twilight shadow, an ill-advised and unnecessary postscript to an otherwise unique and brilliant career. The legendary first session, with all its anger, might have been a better release, both artistically and aesthetically. Even if many found Let's Make Up and Be Friendly to be a duff album, the LP was indirectly responsible for the most successful project in which Stanchel would ever be involved. Chance once again intervened in Vivian's life. As it turned out, the Bonzos were due in the studio after a young musician named Michael Oldfield had been given free studio time by Virgin Records to record what would become his mammoth best-selling work, Tubular Bells. Oldfield, a Bonzo Dog fan, was in awe of the band, who were often waiting outside of the studio for their sessions to begin. For the ending of the first half of Tubular Bells, Oldfield planned for a master of ceremonies to introduce each instrument one by one as they joined in the piece. Stanchel's voice was exactly what he needed. Oldfield's engineer, Tom Newman, approached Vivian with the idea and Viv agreed to help out, according to Oldfield. It was like a playwright getting somebody like Anthony Hopkins to be in their first play. He was, admittedly, a little bit worse for the wear for his drink at the time, and he was extraordinary looking. Hippie clothes, some kind of cowboy hat, bearded, and a neckerchief type of thing. I hardly looked at him. I was panicking so much. Tubular Bells was a smash hit, reaching number one in both the United States and England, staying on the charts for over five years and selling 16 million albums. Stanchel was heard worldwide. However, he never requested to be paid, and therefore never saw a cent from his contribution. After the release of Let's Make Up and Be Friendly, the Bonzos began to bandy about the idea of reforming. Frankly, all of the lads were struggling to get along with their various musical careers, except perhaps for Neil Innes, who was gradually parlaying his numerous talents into several successful solo projects. What's more, the Bonzos also felt an obligation to help Stanchel out of his seemingly unending binging, as Legs explained at the time in an interview with Roy Hollingsworth. His life is Bonzo Dog. He'll die if we don't get together. It's his world, old boy and despite all of our own little things, it's our world as well. For God's sake, won't someone dry the man out? It's all he needs. Of course, we want the Bonzos to exist again, but we have to be very careful. Offers were soon pouring in from would-be managers and prospective record companies, but cynical after their conflicts with management in the past, the Bonzos either laughed at the offers or approached them with extreme caution. It is now rather hard to tell how serious the Bonzos were about reforming the band. Larry seems to have been the most enthusiastic. Innes, Spear, and Stanchel, on the other hand, all had significant solo projects in the works. At this stage in their careers, it was rather doubtful that they would be willing to shelve their personal interest to get back into the rock. Chapter 7 the Mr. Hyde in Me, Cracking Up, 1974 
1977. Thank God they all have heads of wood. I dread the day I'm understood. Vivian Stancho Having exorcised the last vestiges of the Bonzo Dog Band with Let's Make Up and Be Friendly, Vivian now turned his full attention to completing his first solo album, Men Opening Umbrellas Ahead. For well over a year, Stancho poured all of his talent and torment into the album, writing uncompromising songs about his emotional state and even taking the occasional laugh at his own steady degeneration. Released in August of 1974, many consider Men Opening Umbrellas Ahead to be Vivian's seminal work. Supporting their argument, they point to the music's stark and intensely personal nature. Indeed, the album is dark, brooding, and emotionally honest. It only hints at the off-the-wall humor that once characterized his early writing. For the recording, Stanchel managed to obtain backing from Warner Brothers and used the cash to lure the best musicians possible into the studio. Among those appearing on the album are traffic members Steve Winwood, Jim Capaldi, Rebop Ba, and Rick Gretsch. Stanchel was still interested in African polyrhythms, so he brought in numerous African musicians as well, an idea that yielded an amazing track, Dead Eyes. The most successful songs on the album are those in which Stanchel bears his personal angst to the listeners. Of all these tracks, Dead Eyes is the most accessible. It is a singularly powerful piece of music with slicing lyrics. Tomorrow, when you're old and your mouth is paved with gold, you begin to feel the cold outside. The sickness in your blood soon will swell and overflood and asphyxiate all self-identity. Bouts of Sobriety is a brutally straightforward depiction of Vivian's acute alcoholism. Get home early morning, and I throw myself in bed. Asleep, my mouth wide open. Me woman thinks I'm dead. She kicks me. I start grunting. She knows that I'm all right. Disgusting in the darkness. I've been boozing through the night. Perhaps the most powerful track on the album is Yelp, Bellow, Rasp, etc., with its guttural howling and primal scream lyricism. Stanchel also takes the opportunity to castigate himself and other rock musicians in the satirical song Red Eye. The characterizations are both succinct and scathing. On John Lennon. Here comes old Hawkeye. See his skillful squint, his ready intelligence. You'll see it in print each day. Flits into Amsterdam, flies back to New York, in comfy first-class compartment, yet he can still talk about the people. What kind of people? And on himself. Here comes old Red-Eye, he's full of drink, mouth in his mouth off, to a load of kids, saying nothing personal, but he's up the creek. While you're home asleep, he's down at the speak. Easy now, here comes the avant gardener, pruning his beard, proposing philosophies like you've never heard. Even in the guttural there is genius. How the zebra got its spots, a lyrical ode to his penis, follows in the path of works such as the strain. All eyes turn to his erection, as Stanchel nearly transforms it into an object of wonder with his romantic yet comic realism. O oh, prong, you are so strong and long. O oh, prong, cold, blue-veined as marble, fierce thruster of the clef, flesh ferret. Ho there, where is Prince Nostril, he of the horny hands and erectile tissues? I am here, O oh, Randy One, muscular and well-primed for the pussy. Men Opening Umbrellas Ahead is a challenging album. Previously, Vivian had been able to combine the exploration of his anxieties and still entertain. This record is undeniably brilliant, dark, and totally unforgiving. It is as if Stanchel is issuing a challenge, daring the listener to deal with and accept his great pain. A close listen reveals a very remarkable album. In his review of Men Opening Umbrellas Ahead, Bill Henderson comes fairly close to the mark. With his similar black vision, Stanchel corresponds to a contemporary Jonathan Swift, a satirist in the true sense. 
and it is a literary-minded work here, using wordplay a great deal. Umbrellas is perhaps pessimistic, but understandably and even necessarily so. Listen to this album. The executives at Warner Brothers, however, did not appreciate the artistry of the album. One listen was enough to prove that the album, for all its tortured brilliance, was commercially stillborn. The label promptly turned its back on the work. Only 5,000 copies of men opening umbrellas ahead were ever issued. None of them reached the American shores. Adding insult to injury, Warner Brothers also managed to lose the original master. The B-side had to be cut from an acetate. When called in to discuss the matter, Stanchel, enraged by Warner's lack of support, proceeded to destroy their elegant boardroom. Later, he exacted his unique brand of personal vengeance on the president of Warner Brothers, releasing thousands of maggots behind the radiator in his office. Regretfully, he wasn't there to see them hatch. The men opening Umbrella's Ahead affair ended badly, but the period was not without its high points. It was during this time that Stanchel forged a musical relationship with Pete Moss, Moss, an extremely talented musical director and multi-instrumentalist, was making a name for himself in London's musical community. While working in the first run of the Rocky Horror Show in the summer of 1973, Pete befriended ex-Bonzo dog Dennis Cowan, who'd been playing bass for the production. Cowan introduced Moss to Stanchel, who immediately began to make use of Moss's talents. One of the first projects he found himself working on was certainly an appropriate introduction to the world of Viv. One beautiful morning in the summer of 1974, Vivian rang Pete. "'Come on down, come on down, old bean, we're making a record, a jolly good record.' Vivian had decided that the next great single of the day was going to be a remake of The Trail of the Lonesome Pine, a song from Laurel and Hardy's classic 1937 film, Way Out West. The session took place in a studio belonging to Tubular Bell's producer Tom Newman, which happened to be located on a barge on the Grand Union Canal. Because it was a beautiful Sunday morning, Stanchel insisted upon running a microphone up to the top of the boat so that he could sing in the sunshine while the rest of the band, including Pete Moss on double bass, plugged away below deck. All of these people are walking past on the side of the lot going off to the pub, laughs Pete. And everybody was looking at him strangely and bumping into trees with glasses of beer in their hand, looking at this lunatic on top of this boat whistling the trail of the lonesome pine into a microphone with a ukulele. And, of course, he's starting and stopping and saying hello to people, and we can't see what the hell is going on. The track came out surprisingly well, but when Stanchel shopped it to Warner Brothers, it received a cool response. Months later, United Artists unearthed Laurel and Hardy's version of The Trail of the Lonesome Pine and released it as a single, beating Vivian to the punch. The track was a fluke hit, reaching number two in the UK charts. Stanchel was understandably flabbergasted. Viv continued to work with Pete Moss, forming a fruitful, albeit chaotic musical relationship that would span two decades. In addition to playing just about any instrument Stanchel required, Pete would act as Vivian's musical director, earning him the moniker the M.D. Stanchel also dubbed him the Dot Mat. Vivian, unable to read or write music, thrashed out home recordings of his songs on the ukulele, then turned the tapes over to Pete Moss, saying, "'Do the dots, dear boy!' He would also call Pete the Sergeant Major, though no one really knows quite why. Like Neil Innes, Pete provided a solid musical grounding that allowed Vivian to safely go out on a creative limb. This tempering force was well needed, as Vivian zealously believed in creative spontaneity and would often have great difficulty organizing his ideas and conveying them to musicians with whom he was working. An extremely patient yet imposing M.D., Pete was able to organize Vivian's art while allowing the spontaneity that Viv demanded. Really, my job was essentially to hold everything together, to try and keep Vivian on the straight and narrow, explains Pete. It's all very well being artistically all over the place, but if you've got four or five men behind you trying to hold some sort of continuity, somebody has to lead it. Stanchel used to love to go out on a tangent, you know. 
Needless to say, holding everything together was no easy task, and the two would often find themselves pushed to the ends of their respective tethers. I suppose if the term love-hate relationship comes to mind, laughs Pete, Vivian and I probably had one of the original versions of the love-hate relationship. In addition to becoming Stanchel's musical right-hand man, Pete Moss also had the fortune, perhaps misfortune, of residing in Hampstead, which was only just down the road from Viv. Of course, this was wonderful for Vivian, who had an unquestionable knack for getting himself into all sorts of strange and sticky situations. Soon enough, Pete regularly found himself receiving distressed phone calls from his neighbor. One day, Viv rang Pete. "'I say, old bean, come up. Come up and help me. I've got a terrible problem here.' Thinking his friend was in great trouble, Pete rushed over to Viv's house and knocked upon the door. Soon the mail slot opened, with Viv looking out through the crack. "'Go back down the path,' he whispered. "'And when I say now, run hell for leather towards the front door and I'll open it.' Pete had no idea what the hell was going on, but he was game. Laughing to himself, he walked a few meters away and waited. Suddenly Viv shouted, "'Go!' Pete stormed the front door. I thought it wasn't going to open, remembers Pete, and all of a sudden it did, and I fell headlong first into the hallway, flat upon my face. I'm laying there laughing, and Vivian says, Thank God you're here. And I said, Well, what's the problem? And he said, The pythons escaped, and it's somewhere under the floorboards. Of course, I just leapt up off the floor like a lunatic. Another time, Vivian phoned Pete up and said, these damned reporters are coming round me again. Come up here and sort them out, because I'm going to beat them up. When Pete arrived, he found Vivian flanked by a reporter and a wannabe manager who was promising to rejuvenate Vivian's career. Vivian was very weird about all of this, recalls Pete. There was a man sitting there saying, Of course, Vivian, we'll do this for you, and we'll do that for you, and we'll take this amount of money as a commission. And the moment you started mentioning money around Vivian, that was it. He went, what, what, and went steaming out the door. Viv stormed into the kitchen, where he kept a gross of dead mice in the fridge, which he used to get from the Zoological Society of Regent's Park in order to feed his snakes. While Vivian muttered and groaned in the kitchen, the man said to Pete, "'Have I offended him?' "'Well, you'd better go,' Pete replied. "'I'll calm him down, but I think you'd better go. "'Don't talk about money and percentages in front of him.' "'Vivian returned with a dead mouse hanging from his right hand. "'He sided up to one of his tanks and dangled the mouse in the water. "'Suddenly there's this frothing of water, "'and his piranha are eating this mouse,' laughs Pete. "'The man's face went absolutely white. "'Vivian said, "'What were you talking about, money?' And the man just disappeared. He went out the front door, down the path, and was never seen again. In May of 1964, the inimitable poet-musician Robert Kelvert released his legendary album Captain Lockheed and the Starfighters. Part rock concept album, part radio play, Kelvert enlisted a cast which included such notables as Jim Capaldi, Arthur Brown, Brian Eno, and, of course, Vivian Stanchel. Calvert took full advantage of Stanchel's vocal talents, as Viv played nearly all of the lead roles in the album's intermittent sketches. Naturally, Stanchel felt quite at home, slipping in and out of numerous voices and accents which Calvert required. Stanchel and Calvert seemed an excellent artistic pairing, but their relationship wasn't always quite so plummy. Mutual friend Arthur Brown introduced them— Apparently the god of hellfire believed that the two, being of similar artistic temperaments, would meet and become mates. However, things did not go quite as smoothly as he had hoped. Vivian had just checked out of the hospital when he came to visit Arthur. He arrived in black leather, carrying a matching briefcase with his hair shaved to one-eighth of an inch in length. The two took the train to Puddletown. All the while, Vivian was doing push-ups in the aisle— you know, they pumped him so full of speed and all sorts of things in the mental home, recalls Brown, so he couldn't actually sit still or do anything except push-ups while he was talking to me. Then I took him into the pub, and he did some push-ups in the pub in the middle of the floor. 
Shortly thereafter, Robert Calvert was also discharged from a mental hospital and came to visit Brown. When Calvert arrived, he too was dressed in black leather, carrying a matching briefcase, with his hair cropped short. This seemed a remarkable occurrence, explains Brown. I thought, my goodness, I know what, I'll introduce Robert to Vivian. So I called up Viv's wife, who said, Vivian is in a real bad place at the moment. He's confined to his room, you know. Maybe it's a good thing, I said. Well, you know, Robert's a poet. They'll probably get along like a house on fire. A few days later, Brown and Calvert arrived at the Stanchel abode. Brown stayed downstairs to admire Vivian's turtles, while Calvert went upstairs to introduce himself to Viv. After about, I think it was, forty-five seconds or so, we heard something go through the window, and Robert came running down the stairs, remembers Brown. Something flew over his head, and there appeared Vivian, also running and shouting, "'Don't you come back here, you bastard!' I don't know what Robert said, but obviously he made a swift connection, and Vivian was right out of his depression for a short while." but it wasn't really a successful meeting. In September of 1974, Traffic released its final LP, When the Eagle Flies. Appearing on the album is Dream Gerard, a collaborative writing effort between Stanchel and Steve Winwood. In an interview with the author Alan Clayson, Stanchel explained the origins of the song. I was suffering a severe bout of depression when I was staying at Steve's house, and he said, Well, we're off to dinner. Are you coming? I said, No, I'm reading about this French poet, and I don't feel very well. So he went off, and I wrote not more than a quantrain about Gerard de Nerval. When he came back, he said, Right, that's a chorus. We're going to need a verse for that. And he went into the front room and started plonking away on the piano. Dream Gerard was the first collaboration in what would be an enduring and fruitful musical relationship. Winwood recalls how he and Stanchel became mates. I met him at a festival in the very early 70s, somewhere in the Midlands, I don't know where. We were both on the same bill and knocked around a bit together. I went up to the Edinburgh Festival with him, where he was doing something on the fringe, some sort of ferret-down-the-trousers act, definitely post-Bonzo. On the way back, we stopped off at this Highland Fair, and I remember some fella coming up and saying, I'm sure I've seen you before. And Viv said, No, I've never been up this way before. And the fella said, No, I'm sure I've seen you before. And Vivian said, No. And the fella said, Oh, I'm sorry, it must have been a goat. For Stanchel, the process of creative collaboration with Winwood refreshingly differed from what he'd previously had in the Bonzos. With Neil we bickered when writing together, or else I attended to the words and he provided the music, or vice versa, Viv explained. With Steve it was much closer because of our agreement spiritually. Although we have hardly anything in common, we go out for walks and we agree philosophically. We have a damned good sort out with each other before we approach whatever the damn thing means. This spiritual agreement proved beneficial for both sides. Through Winwood, Stanchel was allowed to remove the comedic mask and give voice to his more serious lyrics, an opportunity all too rare in his career. Through Stanchel, Winwood was provided with an extraordinary lyrical depth. He was very much a wordsmith, or a word chemist, really, commented Winwood in 1995. But there was a side of him that was much more pensive and sensitive than the world really knew, and I think he could really express that working with me. He believed in the phonetics as sound. That was the main thing. The intelligence, as he called it, would work on later. His words were very metrical. They had a rhythm of their own. In an interview with Winwood biographer Alan Clayson, Stanchel shed light on his process of writing lyrics. I've always felt a responsibility that you should know what you're talking about. I'm very careful with every word, mosaic work almost. For me it has to be as correct as I can make it, and I can justify everything. I weep blood when I write lyrics. There are quite a lot of people I wouldn't write for. I should also say that there are quite a lot of people who wouldn't ask me. Having been a hit in 1971 on the John Peel show, Stanchel was invited to return while Peel took a well-oiled alcoholiday, as Vivian put it. 
Both Peel and producer John Walters had enormous respect for Vivian's work, though Walters, as Pete Moss points out, was very clever because he never attended any of the sessions, which was the best way to deal with it absolutely. This, no doubt, was due to their reoccurring nightmares Walter received after producing Vivian's nerve-wracking 1971 Top Gear stint. Stanchel's new radio flashes continued on in serial spirit of the original run. This time, each segment featured an episode of Sir Henry at Rawlinson's End. From 1975 to 1980, Stanchel would produce eight equally insane and entertaining sessions for BBC Radio One. The first in the series was recorded on October 16, 1975. In addition to Pete Moss, there was Bubs White and Mox, an extraordinary harmonica player who played with Ike and Tina Turner. Speaking volumes of the respect Stanchel still commanded, there were always an abundant number of seasoned musicians more than willing to appear on Viv's projects. Amongst them, lending their talents to radio flashes were Zoot Money, John Kirkpatrick, bassist Danny McCulloch, and violinist David Swarbrick of Fairport Convention. Viv was in top form, which helped to produce a good amount of first-rate material, a good portion of which was wildly extemporaneous. Some of the extemporizing took place outside of the studio. In an interview with Robert Chalmers, John Walters recalled popping into the chemist with Viv one day on the way to the studio. The man in front asked for an insect repellent called waspies. Viv approached the counter and announced, apparently without thinking, that he was off on safari and worried about being plagued by big game. He asked for a pack of antelope, a liter of rhino, and a tube of repellent. He used that in the program. Although much of the episode's songs and skits are brilliantly spontaneous, a good portion of it was not quite off the cuff. Stanchel did, in fact, come into the Beebs somewhat prepared. In particular, a good bit of the music was sketched out beforehand, mainly due to the urging of Pete Moss. Pete explains, I actually said to him once, look, you can't just walk into the BBC with me and expect me to immediately grasp what's in your mind telepathically. I'll come around to your place and you tell me roughly what you want me to do. Quite often he used to moan at me and say, you're standardizing everything. But I mean, if there are four verses and each verse has its own length, it's very difficult to tell people like Dave Swarbrick or Danny McCulloch or any of this lot, that verse is going to be twelve and a half bars, verse two is going to be fourteen bars, etc. So you have to standardize things at least a little bit. This is not to say that all of Viv's material was mapped out or that the sessions ran smoothly. It was a bit like Geoffrey Archer parties, explains Pete Moss. He always said, the best part of the party is when it's all over. Stanchel's whirlwind of ideas was often impossible to contain. Just when it seemed as if they'd completed a few tracks, Vivian would have a flash of inspiration and request that a metal pole be struck with a mallet in a bucket of water and added to the first track. Trying the patience of the BBC crew, he'd ask to jump from track to track as new ideas popped into his head. At times there was little cohesion. At times there was no cohesion. Pete Moss would do his best to scribble down the general notes to help the exasperated BBC engineers who regularly turned to him with cocker spaniel eyes and asked, Where are we? Vivian's enthusiasm, however, was infectious. Even the notoriously stuffy Beeb engineers, who he generally drove up the wall, occasionally were convinced to join in the fray. Once, while recording a bit about an old soldier in the First World War, Vivian somehow managed to coax an engineer into a bit of role-playing. Moss remembers. We had a piece of classical music in the headphones. We got the BBC engineer on the studio floor and put the cans on him with the classical music, which had nothing to do with what we were recording. He had a blindfold on and had to march up and down playing a drum. The point was the cans with the music would disguise the real music so the drums would be totally out of time. And this poor bugger was walking up and down with the blindfold on. And this is a BBC engineer. He took it all in his stride. 
Despite the unending madness, confusion, and anguish mainly inflicted on the Beeb engineers, the end results were top-notch. Stanchel's radio flashes were always extremely popular. As John Peel pointed out in a 1995 Late Show obituary special honoring Stanchel, Whenever one of the irregular Rawlinson's end episodes had been broadcast, the following weeks were spent fielding letters and phone calls from astonished listeners who wanted to know what it was and where they could get it. Recordings of these sessions have understandably become must-haves for fans of Vivian's and are passionately sought after. Radio, however, wasn't the only medium graced by our ginger geezer, as BBC Two aired their oddest installment of a series entitled One Man's Week. Airing on April 9, 1975, the half-hour segment documented a week in the life of Vivian Stanchel, complete with a tour of his home, Che Guevara. According to the show's producer, Ian Kill, it was the most bizarre week of my life. Viewers witnessed, amongst other activities, Stanchel cycling around London, playing with his pet turtles, appearing on Radio 4's Today program, and watching the monkeys at the local zoo. As with radio flashes, Viv's One Man Week also became a must-have for collectors. Later that year, Vivian received an invitation from the Procol Harem to perform as an opening act on a brief tour of Britain. He immediately phoned up Pete Moss, and the two put together a band called Vivarium to take out on the road. The tour was a great time for Vivian, who soon found himself joining Procol Harem for their encores. Indeed, everything had gone swimmingly until the second-to-last gig, which fell on the Thursday before the final show on Saturday. As part of the act, Vivian resurrected the bonzo bit where the band pretended to get stuck like a skipping record until he jumped off stage with a kick got the band unstuck. It was still an exceptionally clever routine and always went down well with the audience. This night would be no exception. As the band played a cue from Vivian, set them repeating the same phrase over and over. The band was stuck. Then came the moment for Vivian to jump off the stage and crash. The trouble is, you see, he hadn't noticed how high this particular stage was, laughs Pete Moss. He leapt off of the stage, and what we subsequently found out was muscle around his shin bone had ripped a part of his shin off. Of course, he'd fallen over the first three people in the front row screaming with pain, and they're all on their feet, cheering. They thought that that was part of the show. Wonderful! For the unknowing audience, the entertainment level only increased as one of Vivian's bandmates came on the microphone and announced, Excuse me, is there a doctor in the house? Fortunately for the wounded Vivian, the band had the following day off. Hopefully he'd take the opportunity to have his injury looked at and treated. That afternoon, Pete Moss rang Vivian up to see if he was ready for Saturday's gig. "'Are you all right?' asked Pete. "'Yes,' replied Vivian. "'I've been to acupuncture.' "'You're mad!' exclaimed Pete. "'Why don't you go to the hospital?' "'Oh, no, 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 old boy,' explained Vivian. "'I've been to acupuncture.' Needless to say, Pete had his doubts. So the morning of the gig, he phoned once more to check up on Viv. Again, Vivian insisted that he was quite all right, thank you very much. I said to him, look, you can't even walk, recalls Pete. How are you ever going to do this? Get a broom and use a broom as a crutch, why don't you? He said, right, that's a very good idea. He phoned me back and said, right, I've done it. I've chopped a tree down. Apparently, he found this sort of catapult, Y-shaped thing, and he was going to use this. It should be noted that at this time Vivian's normal outfit consisted of a black nightshirt adorned with moons and stars, sandals, his hair tied back under a skull cap, his beard tied into a knot, and, as usual, his famous octagonal glasses. Now, completing the ensemble, of course, was a small tree for a crutch. Naturally, this in combination of Captain Morgan's rum Vivian kept religiously in his shoulder bag only seemed to spell trouble. Indeed, as Pete Moss was waiting to be picked up to go to the show, there was considerable misunderstanding. Moss remembers. I used to live in this really nice area called Hampstead, and there's a lot of Jewish people in it, which is no problem except that Saturday is their Sabbath. As the band turned up outside my door, Dean Ford, the singer from Marmalade, who used to live across the road, came out, and he's standing there laughing. He said, There's a lunatic up the road, I said to the roadie. 
Where is Vivian? He said, he's gone to show you how well he's coping on his crutch. Well, my number was 23, and he'd gotten the wrong number in his head. So they dropped him off at the top of the road, and he came down the hill and went into 43. He's walking down, and he's got this football sock and this football boot at the end of a crutch. He's been drinking heavily, and he knocked on the door, and apparently this Jewish lady came to the door. He leaned into her, lost his balance, and fell on top of her, screaming, "'Where's Peter?' Apparently she passed out. He got up, sort of scrambled up, and came hobbling down the road, having totally gotten the wrong address. Eventually, Stanchel would hobble on to the stage that night. Sadly, the show could only pale in comparison to his memorable performance on Pete's Road that afternoon. In the spring of 1976, Stanchel lent his narrative talents to Jack Lancaster and Robin Lumley's rock and roll refashioning of Peter and the Wolf. The music virtually ignored the original score, but Vivian's narration remained traditional, adding a backbone of familiarity to the otherwise avant-garde exploration. A cast of talent that included such luminaries as Manfred Mann, Cozy Powell, Elvin Lee, and Brian Eno pulled off the successful, irreverent interpretation of the opus. Stanchel was proud to have taken part in the project. This pride came from his desire to participate in what he often referred to as real artistic endeavors. Kai, Stanchel's second wife, remembers, Vivian always spoke of things like this as playing with grown-ups, real painters, real composers, implying that stuff that he and his friends were doing was perhaps more juvenile. This was all a part of his continuing struggle to produce what he considered serious art, a struggle Stanchel faced his entire life. Ignoring the obvious wealth of his diverse talents, record companies were only interested in a rehashing of the bonzos. Therefore, the opportunities for Vivian to record, exhibit, or publish his more serious work were few and far between. This becomes all too obvious when looking at his record releases. Stanchel, a most prolific and creative man, was limited to only two album releases in the 70s and another two thereafter. What's more, Stanchel was growing accustomed to watching acts that were very derivative of his work rise to the pinnacle of fame and wealth. Meanwhile, he struggled in relative squalor with little opportunity to release any of his work. For a long time, he affected a nonchalant attitude towards his imitator's success. When asked, he'd simply reply, Well, I've come to the obvious conclusion that I can always make more. But as time passed, Vivian would also come to voice occasional bitterness. In 1988, he stated, Maybe I should sell franchises. At least that way I could control the quality. While I am admittedly miffed about not having made millions, but at the moment I'm just grateful to be working again. The thought which has always sustained me throughout my life is that they can never do what I'm going to do tomorrow. Around the same time, John Peel voiced his frustration at his friend's artistic struggle. Viv is one of the few genuinely funny people in the country, at a time when performers are praised out of all proportion to their ability. Money and fame aside, all Stanchel craved was the opportunity to work, the opportunity to put out whatever he was creating, whether it be music, sculpture, screenplays, or painting. This lack of opportunity, coupled with his often debilitating mental state, led Stanchel to compulsively underestimate the value of his art and talents, especially his musical output. He believed he didn't have the musical goods to belong in the artistic elite he referred to as the big boys. To Stanchel, they were the real deal. He looked up to them. He longed to be in the same class as them, but believed his only chance at becoming one of the big boys was to establish himself as a painter. To this end, when he wasn't working with words or music, the projects that paid the bills, he'd pour his heart and soul back into painting, the medium he loved most. Yet he rarely had the courage to finish a project for fear that it wouldn't be good enough, that it wouldn't measure up. This tormenting insecurity led to an absolutely crippling perfectionism that affected his work for the rest of his days. One of the big boys Stanchel particularly admired was friend and collaborator Steve Winwood, or Winnie as he called him. He once confessed, the two people I always really wanted to write for were Joe Cocker and Steve Winwood. 
It was, in fact, mutual admiration, though Vivian's insecurities probably blinded him to it. In June of 1977, Winwood released his first solo album simply entitled Steve Winwood. Continuing the musical collaboration that had begun with Traffic's Dream Gerard, Stanchel and Winwood co-wrote the track Vacant Chair, a tune dealing with sorrow and strength in the wake of the death of a loved one. Both artists drew upon their personal losses from their lives. Winwood drew his emotional inspiration from the death of his close friend and fellow organist Graham Bond of the legendary Graham Bond organization, who may or may not have tragically taken his own life. Stanchel drew from the loss of bonzo bassist Dennis Cowan, who had died on June 4, 1974, of an infected pancreas. Vivian had grown very close to Cowan and was devastated by his sudden death at the young age of just 27. Vivian seemed, from what I could tell, to love him most of all, reveals Kai. I don't know what would have become of all of that, if he would have eclipsed Rodney later, or if their friendship would have faded, but Vivian thought he was the sweetest man. Stanchel's inspiration for Vacant Chair and its touchstone lyric, The Dead Are Weeping for the Dead, came from the conciliatory advice he had once received from musician Gaspar Lawal, as Vivian would later explain in a 1987 interview. Vacant chair has to do with the death of my best friend, Dennis Cowan. I was appallingly upset for a week, and I phoned Gaspar, and I was self-pitying, and he said in Nigerian, only the dead weep for the dead. So I said to Gaspar, that's very cool of you, and he said, no, just get on with life, that's all you can do. So the sentiment of the lyric is, although people must die, most of grief and mourning is pity for yourself. But it's called vacant chair because there are funeral parlors that actually sell floral chairs called vacant chairs. After several years of being confined to guest appearances and releasing less than stellar singles like the 1976 remake of Cliff Richard's Young Ones, Stanchel finally had the chance to record another solo album. A small company called Evolution, which has long since liquidated, approached Phonogram Records with a deal to produce a Bonzo Dog Band reunion album. Convinced they were getting the Bonzos, Phonogram gladly accepted the offer. In an interview with the Bonzo Dog fanzine Duda, Kai recalled the rather dodgy proceedings. They sold Polydor, Phonogram, on the idea that they were buying a Bonzo album, and Vivian was under the idea that they had bought a Vivian album. So when Vivian signed the contract, they tacked on the back that it was a Bonzo album. So Polydor, Phonogram, was pumping money into it. With generous finances in hand, Stanchel went into the studio with a stellar band, which consisted of mates Steve Winwood, Proko Harum drummer Barry B.J. Wilson, Gaspar Lawal, and the legendary Zoot Money. This was certainly not the Bonzo Dog Band, thank you very much. In fact, the only other Bonzo appearing on the album was Legs Larry Smith, who wrote and performed a track of his own, A Day in the Life. A full album was recorded and submitted to Polydor, evidently in early 1997. Upon hearing the album, the execs at Phonogram were understandably shocked. What's this? It isn't the Bonzos. The deal quickly folded while Evolution made off with Phonogram's loot. In the end, Phonogram honorably returned the tapes to Vivian, who tried unsuccessfully to shop them to various record companies. The only track ever released from the sessions was Legs Larry Smith's track, which was subsequently revamped as a B-side to his remake of Mel Brooks' classy Springtime for Hitler. Whatever did become of Vivian's album? Rumor once had it that the original tapes were lost or ruined when Vivian's houseboat sank in 1984, but evidently they are still safely intact. To this day, however, these lost tracks remain unreleased and sadly unheard. Now I'll tell you a secret, fab listeners. It is I, Geoffrey Giuliano, the author of this tome that has these tapes, and alas, for legal reasons, have not been able to release them. Let's hope. Chapter 8. Wolves Mate for Life. Vivian and Kai, 1977-1978.
Love can make a dog howl in tune. Vivian Stanchel Dog Howl in Tune Pamela Longfellow was born in New York City on December 9, 1944, coincidentally the very same day that Neil Innes arrived on the planet. A Navy brat, Pamela spent her childhood on the move, finding homes in New York, Hawaii, and eventually California, where she spent her early adult years. Contentious of the hippie scene and more interested in the pursuit of literature than recreational drug escapism, Pamela hung out with the likes of Jack Kerouac and Lawrence Ferlinghetti. She was a baby of a dying literary scene struggling to succeed as a writer. Having penned her first book at four, there was never any doubt in Pamela's mind she was going to become anything different. Later on in life, Pamela would take the name Kai. It was given to me by Vivian, she explains. He dreamt my name was Kai. Kai eventually fell in with the Fairport Convention crowd, married their manager, Robin G., and made her home in London. After the marriage fell apart, she returned to California, but would intermittently fly back to London to retain her right to live in Britain. During one such day in June of 1978, a friend of Kai's, Philippa Clare, rang to tell her of a lonely musician in desperate need of company and a good cheering up. Perhaps Kai could meet him for dinner, and of course she'd pick up the tab. Kai never heard of Vivian Stanchel or the Bonzo Dog Duda Band. Furthermore, she'd never been on a blind date and wasn't exactly eager to give it a whirl, but Philippa was insistent, and eventually Kai gave in. Oh, to hell with it. Let him ring me if he really wants to talk to somebody. Soon after, the lonely musician did phone, and Kai was immediately taken by his rich, articulate, dundee cake of a voice. She was pleasantly surprised indeed, and soon began thinking a date with Mr. Stanchel might just be fun after all, and arranged a meeting. Kai decided to meet her blind date at a bus stop below a friend's flat in Belsize Park. Unexpectedly, her chum was an enormous fan of Vivian, as she remembers. She started screaming and played me her collection of bonzo tapes, but mostly the intro and the outro. She said, if you don't want to go out with him, I'll meet him on the street corner. He'll never know. So I went down and stood on the corner, and he was late. I waited for exactly one minute precisely, and then went back into the flat. Then this cab pulls up. He got out and was wearing green velvet knickerbockers with a green velvet jacket. He had on silk stockings, I can't remember what color, shoes with buckles, and a floppy velvet hat, green, of course. He had a red beard about twenty-seven inches long, tied in a bow. So she threw me out the door, and I met this extraordinary man, who was very brittle, holding himself together with a great deal of difficulty. In truth, Stanchel was well pissed. Moreover, he was just plain nervous and having a hard time even talking. Kai felt she shouldn't be alone with this obviously drunk babbling man, so she phoned her friend, who came down and joined them at a local pub, where by now Kai and Vivian were shooting pool, a game at which Kai was extremely adept, which greatly impressed Vivian. Eventually Stanchel dragged his two companions to an artist party at the Centaur Gallery in London's Highgate, a location that would play in both the beginnings and end of Vivian and Kai's romance. Kai strolled through the gallery's multi-level gardens with Viv, who began following a few feet behind, bellowing, "'This is my woman. I found her. This is my woman. I am now complete.' Kai was horrified and made a run for the exit. She hastily hailed a cab, but couldn't get in before Vivian fumbled into the back seat and commandeered the ride. Kai was aghast. Can you imagine being a woman getting into a cab with an obviously drunk man climbing in behind you, telling the cabbie you wanted to go to a certain address, and the man yelling you wanted to go to another address, and the cabbie took us to the man's address, well, I'm not going, excuse me, what's happening here, what's the fellow thinking in the front seat, maybe one of us can pay and the other cannot, or is this some kind of male camaraderie, taking a woman who obviously doesn't want to go somewhere with a fellow and taking her anyway? 
Stancho whisked Kai back to his East Finchley home, where he'd been living alone for some time, his divorce from Monica having been finalized in 1976. The two stayed up chatting into the wee hours of the morning. At one point in the night, Vivian leaned over and bit Kai's thigh. This was no nip or love nibble. Vivian fucking bit her. Kai screamed and pained. He claims I slept with him in the first night, which is absolutely untrue, laughs Kai. But he's very proud of that. I slept in Rupert's bed. There were all these toy soldiers all over it. Boy, I remember it well, throwing all those soldiers out of the bed. I got home the next morning doing normal things, and he phoned me from place to place to place. Not surprisingly, Stanchel's side of the story is just a tad different. A friend had been encouraging me to visit prostitutes, he once explained. One day she said she had one lined up. At the same time, she said to Longfellow, who was an innocent American abroad, that she had this sad, lonely, introverted musician. So we were at cross-purposes from the very beginning. We quarreled then, and have ever since, and I still haven't paid. He chased me all over England for a while, continues Kai. I had to make up my mind whether I wanted to be with this truly strange, eccentric, extraordinary human being, or this extremely good-looking photographer I was running around with, and I went for Vivian. It was either do it or don't. No fiddling around with dating. He told me from the minute we met he was determined that this was it. This was the relationship of his life. He had no questions ever, and it was left to me to question all of it, all of the time. Shortly thereafter, Kai moved in with Stanchel, who was in the process of moving himself. First of all, he had to part with much of what had become his own personal museum. It dawned on me that the rooms were Aladdin's, remembered Vivian, just bristling with the inside of my head made tangible. So before starting over in a new home, he weeded through his vast collection of strange bric-a-brac and gave all non-essential items a proper ceremonial goodbye in one huge bonzo bonfire. I had an enormous emotional Viking farewell, remembered Vivian. It was a pyre about twenty-four feet square. I had all these things there, paintings, strange boxes, advertisements, plastic legs. I just piled it all up and burned the lot. Then I went off and cried and cried, and nobody saw. What remained essential to Stanchel consisted of such absolute necessities as a stuffed zebra's ass— a photo of a woman wearing rabbit's ears, carrying an enormous carrot, a gorilla suit, and, naturally, his vast collection of musical instruments, all of which found a new home, along with Vivian and Kai, on Searchlight, a World War I submarine chaser. Formerly home to Denny Lane, Wings and Wings fame, Searchlight had been sold to Stanchel for three thousand pounds. Contrary to rumors, it was a gift." Denny's wife, Jojo Lane, remembers that Viv bought it with payments, which he religiously paid on time every single month until the debt was cleared. Vivian once described his new watery digs as deliciously wonky. An ardent student of history, Viv took an immediate interest in the ship's military career. It really was a submarine chaser, he once told a reporter. It has a brass plaque saying it went to Dunkirk. It's built like a greyhound— ten or twelve feet wide and eighty feet long. The whole thing had a huge engine at one time, so you could drop the depth charge and get out quick. Now it's entirely gutted, and a superficial structure plopped on top. I'm making all my own stuff out of driftwood, but everything is wonky, which means there's no horizontals apart from me when I've had a few. Searchlight moored on the Thames between Shepperton and Chertsey, and was, in the words of Kai, shaped like a pencil, and green, duck-pecked, and peeling. It took one minute to pass from port to starboard, but ten minutes to make it from stern to aft. It was leaky, and in the midst of recovering from Denny Lane's horrendous pseudo-gypsy decor, a bilge pump ran continually, keeping the narrow, rickety beast afloat. Once aboard and inside, it was impossible to stand erect, especially if you're Vivian Stanchel and a towering six foot two inches. Searchlight and the whimsically eclectic assortment of goodies housed within would serve as a proper home to Vivian and Kai. Joining them were Stanchel's son, Rupert, 
who would intermittently come to stay, and Kai's teenage daughter, Sidney Longfellow, who lived with them on and off for many years. Sidney immediately struggled to fit into the tense relationship that had been forged between her mother and Stanchel. She felt an outcast. Sidney remembers. I had a problematic relationship with them at the time, as they were involved in a relationship, and it was stormy and passionate, and I was peripheral to the whole issue. I became exceedingly insecure. Naturally, she soon grew angry with Vivian, jealous of his inseparable bond with her mother. That is not to say that he didn't make efforts to include Sidney. He most certainly did, primarily through art, which Sidney summarily rejected. I found the entire experience of living with Vivian somewhat traumatic. In a sense, not being involved in art was almost a rejection of him, almost deliberate. She was also learning to cope with the increasingly eccentric lifestyle aboard Searchlight. As a teenage girl, she often found Stanchel's behavior embarrassing. When Vivian decided to sculpt out on the deck completely nude, the passers-by out on leisurely day cruises weren't the only ones chagrined. Her reaction, concealing her identity by donning a gorilla mask, was a fitting Stanchelian response. Viv's newfound lifestyle as one of the towpath people baffled and entertained visitors and added even more color to the life of an already fantastically hued man. His new life provided many rich adventures. Take, for example, the time the potbelly stove set the deck ablaze. We rang the fire department immediately, recalls Kai, and twenty-seven firemen showed up and ran across the field in their Wellington boots to put out this fire. Vivian and Kai, however, had just finished searchlight with new carpeting. Kai jumped out in front of the approaching firemen and demanded that they take off their boots before boarding the boat. They were, of course, nonplussed. Luckily, one of the firefighters recognized Viv and began to take off his wellies. The rest of his mates followed his lead, quickly taking off their boots and tiptoeing into searchlight. The great part of it, laughs Kai, was watching twenty-seven firemen find their own wellies after the fire was out. Vivian had a wonderful time with that. On another occasion, chaos ensued while completing the normally harmless task of grocery shopping. It was a miserable winter's day. A heavy downpour had transformed the towpath into an icy, muddy mess. Bundled in a fur coat, Kai struggled toward searchlight with three heavy bags of groceries. Vivian, who followed a few steps behind, had a less cumbersome load. Vivian had to stride along with his little ukulele, Kai remembers, and I'm carrying all the fucking groceries. As Kai boarded searchlight, her muddy feet slipped on the icy deck and she fell overboard, groceries and all. Vivian is leaning over the houseboat going... "'Oh, are you all right?' laughs Kai. "'He didn't do anything. "'He just stood there and watched me swim with these three huge bags of groceries, "'Wellington boots and a fur coat all the way to the edge. "'It was fab. "'I get out dripping wet and furious. "'He was very helpful insofar as he didn't leave. "'He didn't go inside. "'He watched me every moment going, "'Oh, oh, oh, my—' He was a very helpful man. Life amongst the towpath people brought a solitude and camaraderie one could only find outside the trappings of the bustling city, especially to a man who religiously believed everyone should all be outraged at least once a day. Naturally, it was usually Vivian producing the outrage, Kai recalls. One of our neighbors had a terrible fight with another one of our neighbors— one had lent the other one money, and he didn't pay it back, and absconded with the funds, and the other one was furious. We knew that the one who had taken the money was secretly visiting another boat on the towpath. Vivian sat for hours and cut out a message. One of those, Terry will be visiting this houseboat at midnight, be there, kind of things. He cut it all out and pasted it to a piece of paper like a ransom note. He spent hours being terribly artistic, cutting out letters from different newspapers and getting different typefaces. I mean, like no one would figure out it was Vivian after they saw the presentation. Anyway, he pasted it down and put it into an envelope and had Rupert run down the towpath and slip it into the 
mailbox of the party who was going to be outraged when he knew. Then Vivian hid behind the windows. I must admit we all did, and we waited to see the reaction of our neighbor when he got the letter. Then we gave him a call and said, "'Go to your mailbox.' Then he goes to the mailbox and gets the message, and he really is outraged. He really is pissed off. So what happens is he storms down at the hour appointed and grabs the guy and throws him into the goddamn river. Vivian was completely delighted with this huge brouhaha on the path that he himself had created." Kai's love and support was also having a profound and positive effect on Stanchel's life. At the time, he cheerfully admitted, "'It's only recently, and almost entirely due to that woman, and living down here, that I'm beginning to find some balance. In Kai, he found someone in which he could confide. Having gone through an identity crisis herself, she was someone that understood his panic inside.' I feel I can talk to her and exchange streams of consciousness without feeling ashamed about it, revealed Vivian. I don't need London or the clubs, as I can't think of anybody more interesting than Kai, and I presume vice versa. Their relationship was as passionate as it was cerebral. Sex for Stanchel, like tranquilizers and live performances, served as a temporary escape from his haunting anxieties. He celebrated sex. Kai believes the strength and source of Vivian's artistic energy came directly from his sexuality, which was every bit as intense as his creativity. He was fabulous, absolutely, remembers Kai. It was very verbal. He was so verbal in every conceivable way, it became trance-like and very creative. He could take me where he went because I'm very verbal, too. The pictures he painted in my mind, it was fabulous and extraordinary. To tap into this kind of energy with another human being you love so dearly, I mean, I love Vivian, and I still love Vivian, assuredly. As he said, when we met there was no more looking, and it was such a comfort not to look any more. Also within Stanchel was the intense need to try fatherhood again and do it properly this time. He desperately desired to have a child with Kai. She needed only to say, give me a baby, to bring Vivian to an immediate climax. Longfellow's insulating love and their new aquatic lifestyle brought Stanchel stability. Stability brought creativity and productivity. Vivian normally worked on a handful of projects at once and spent the majority of his waking hours, which were more akin to sleepless binges, hopping from one work of art to another. He'd stay up all night painting until, hearing a melody in his head, he'd rush over to his ukulele and compose a tune. He might then turn to work on a sculpture, or perhaps a poem, before eventually realizing that he wasn't painting and run back to his easel. To ensure the ability to capture ideas at any moment, Stanchel taught himself how to write and draw in the dark, a skill he referred to as a real curse. Eventually he would just collapse, awaking to compulsively create once more. There was little rest. True to character, Stanchel continued to agonize over every detail. Most of his work, unless commissioned, went unfinished. It's almost his trademark, laughed Kai. Stanchel's paintings were negatively affected by his intense perfectionism. Blind to his abilities, he suffered from the intense fear that his work was just not good enough. Those who have had the good fortune of seeing his work, however, emphatically disagree. Sidney Longfellow, who studied art history at the prestigious Smith College in Massachusetts and holds a Master's of Fine Arts in Painting, firmly believes Stanchel possessed a talent and creativity that could have made him one of the century's greatest painters. I've seen a lot of work, and I know what's out there, and I really haven't seen anyone who is a painter, with few exceptions, who are really powerful, and I think that he had that ability. I mean, he tended to do it on and off, and I don't think he ever really built up a concentrated body of work that would be able to stand up there against people who committed themselves full-time to it. He committed his life full-time to art, but I don't really think he made up his mind in what medium. So in a sense, I think it's fair to say that one has to look at his body of work as his life, and the entirety of his output, and that still puts him way up there. While the philosophies and sensibilities of the Dadists may have directly shaped his early work with the Bonzos, his later paintings tended to defy comparison. 
though there are a few painters whose influences can be seen in his work. To Luce Lautrec, explains Sidney, if you look at his work, he is the most significant influence that I would say visually you could immediately see in Vivian's work. For the color and the insane energy, Van Gogh. Another influence on Stanchel was the British painter Lucien Freud. Though Stanchel rarely attended art exhibits, he did take Sidney to an exhibition of the work of Freud, whom he greatly admired. Sidney remembers. We went to see the Freud show. I must have been just fifteen years old. These huge male nudes, these incredible paintings. I remember spending a quiet afternoon with him looking at these paintings. I don't think Vivian could have taken me to see, or gone himself to see, anything less than work that powerful and moving. Unfortunately, no one has had the opportunity to study Stanchel's paintings. To this day, there has been no successful effort to make his surviving works available to the general public, though Sidney and Kai have not given up their wish to see an exhibition come to fruition. Aboard Searchlight, Stanchel's hectic days were normally filled with cigarettes and constant cups of coffee. During the moments in which he wasn't frantically expressing his grasshopper mind, Vivian enjoyed watching television. His taste in programming ran the gamut from hours and hours of I, Claudius to Vivian's personal favorite, the Australian soap opera Prisoner Cell Block H. He also watched anything to do with rock and roll or anything that simply caused him to wriggle with embarrassment, squirm value as he called it. Vivian also enjoyed cooking, and certainly had a unique flair for it. Cookbooks and recipes were out of the question. Always the spontaneous artist, Viv preferred to make things up as he went along. Silky's first word was wab, and that described the sort of stuff he served her, recalls Kai. From then on, all of Vivian's cooking that was either indecipherable or unidentifiable was called wab. Presentation was always a must for Vivian's dishes. He fashioned some into faces, some into dogs, and some even into dog shit. He'd transform a pile of beans into a porcupine by adorning it with carrots. Although the results were aesthetically pleasing, they often turned out to be less than edible. One evening he made something that was so incredibly inedible. I mean, even he couldn't eat it, remembers Kai. So in the dark he snuck out onto the towpath and took his entire pot of unk and dumped it into a really nice mold in the middle of the towpath, which was a public footpath, and each day people passed consistently by us. We hid the next morning and watched people walk by this. Their dogs naturally would try to sniff it, and they'd beat the shit out of them. Get away, get away! Everybody made huge detours, and he, just behind his windows, was watching people react to this mound of steaming God knows what. Although it's common knowledge Vivian spent a great many of his waking hours either draped in a robe or more often completely naked, when the time did come for getting dressed, Vivian was still the consummate artist. His wardrobe was extraordinary, and he designed most of his clothes himself. Kai remembers. He would go to the material stores and go through all the fabrics he liked and get bolts of cloth. He'd come back, and he'd design shirts, send them to a seamstress, and have them made for him. He particularly liked large cuffs, enormous, exaggerated French cuffs. He was an absolute dandy. When he wasn't slummy or flailing around on the floor drunk, he was always a dandy. He had drawers where he had matching handkerchiefs that went into the pocket with the socks, so the socks and the kerchiefs were always matching, and then the right ring for that outfit, and then the right watch, and the right hat, and even the right shoes. His shoes, oh my God, he had so many shoes all lined up perfectly. Everyone had a shoehorn. They were all shoehorned and perfectly lined up in his closet. All his suits, all his pants, everything was perfect. He loved hats. These weren't all self-designed, but were just found objects or from nice haberdashers down in London. He was one of the few people who kept people who made custom hats alive. You know, custom walking sticks and umbrellas, this kind of thing. He had things engraved on the handles. And the people who still made hats and blocked them, he was one of the people who kept those sort of people in business. He even wore those suspenders to keep your socks up.
Oh, he loved clothes, and he loved wearing them. Then he'd try to clothe me once in a while. Occasionally he'd get me all dressed up as he wanted me to. Oh, God, when he dressed me up, he was magnificent, agrees Sidney. I've never seen a more sartorial male in my entire life. Absolutely wonderful. Stanchel very rarely entertained friends, but he did do a lot of yapping on the phone with various mates. Perhaps his best friend he spent the most time on the phone with was the mad and equally enigmatic Captain Beefheart. As John Peel once remarked, you cannot imagine what their conversations could have been about. Two people whose thought processes just absolutely fascinated me. I'd love to have a recording of that. Stanchel revealed the two were most often talking about painting. Another mate he would regularly ring was the frenetic soul singer Joe Cocker. One evening, a pissed Cocker actually popped by searchlight for a visit. It was one of the funniest moments I ever saw, laughs Kai. Vivian was sober when Cocker showed up in the middle of the night at Searchlight, and I have to tell you, I never saw a more outraged man as Vivian that evening about the audacity, the absolute cheek for Cocker to be at his house drunk like that. It was ironic to say the least. He was outraged at Cocker being drunk. This is a man who'd been sober for about a week and would be sober for only a week more. Although the beginnings of a domestic life with Kai had significant positive effects on Vivian, the one demon the good life could not temper was the drinking. For Stanchel, alcoholism wasn't substance abuse at all, but rather an exorable part of being an artist. He often told Kai from the time he was a very young boy he believed an artist palette in one hand, a cigarette stuck out of his gob, and a glass of vino in the other. It was a sad example of Vivian buying into the myth that artists must suffer for their art, then arguably using the myth as a rationalization for his addiction. The image of the artist alcoholic speaks to Vivian's creative influence, Sidney remembers. He really had fallen for the painter myth in a big way. You know that painters must die young. But he was a very educated man, Vivian, so he must have known that there were exceptions, in fact, more exceptions than the rule. So I would say that that gives you a very good hint of who he was influenced by. If you think about the painters that lived like that, and there's only a small selection of them, Toulouse-Lautrec and Van Gogh, they're both the drinking, dying, young, insane beret types. You can't describe very many other painters living that way. In Vivian's case, he was such a consummate artist that he believed in these clichés himself. What he did with them was wildly original. I guess that's why he was attracted to that drinking beret-wearing kind of imagery, because it suggests a kind of intensity. Kai frequently confronted Vivian about his alcohol addiction. In the beginning, she believed him the first few times when he'd reassure her, Oh, my God, dear God, of course I'll stop drinking. I used to get on my knees, recalls Kai. I remember his revelations. After hours of screaming and yelling and me hitting him with his tuba, he'd go, My God, he'd say to me, Are you trying to tell me that you want me to stop drinking? And I sank to my knees and I cried and I said, Yes, yes, Vivian. That was in the early days when I thought we were still having a discussion and hadn't gone through all the permutations, the sneakiness, and the game-playing that alcoholics are capable of. It was a discussion she'd have with Vivian. And Chapter 9. Sir Henry at Rawlinson End. End Times. 1978-1979. Bash the tables, fill the glass, stuff the pheasant right. Sod your neighbors, sing out strong, tonight we all get tight. End roar. From Sir Henry at Rawlinson End. After thirteen years of carrying on conversations with himself in different voices and accents, a process he once referred to as structured vomiting, Stanchel at last had the opportunity to immortalize the assorted inhabitants of Rawlinson End. Viv was in the midst of writing new Rawlinson material for another segment of his popular radio flashes when his old friend and former Bonzo manager Tony Stratton Smith approached him with an opportunity to record a full-length Sir Henry at Rawlinson End LP. 
In 1969, Strat, as Stenchel called him, founded Charisma Records and was currently recruiting new acts to put out on the label. Although Charisma was home to such progressive rock giants as Genesis and Peter Gabriel, Strat was equally interested in using some of Charisma's big bucks to give voice to artists whose exceptional talents might be too unconventional for the mainstream. He'd heard Vivian's Sir Henry segments on the Peel sessions, recognized the potential of putting them on record, and offered Stanchel a contract. For Viv, it was a warmly welcomed opportunity, especially after the frustration and disappointment with the evolution fiasco. Strat was a friend in whom he could place his trust, and Charisma was a respected and successful label. Continuing to keep the project amongst trusted friends, Vivian rang Steve Winwood, who'd just installed a full studio in his Gloucestershire home. "'I have this deal, dear boy. Can I come down and use your studio?' When he obliged, Stanchel then called upon Pete Moss to serve as the musical director for the sessions. The creative process in the studio was nothing short of chaotic. Stanchel would often arrive with reams and reams of text, lyrics, and notes. Adding some order was Moss, of course, who, as with previous projects, managed to get Vivian to work out some of the musical numbers with him beforehand. Fortunately for Moss, a good portion of the material stemmed from previous work performed on radio flashes. Ever the perfectionist, Viv was compulsively thinking of ways to improve his work, which made it extremely difficult to ever finish anything. In the end, it was often just a question of getting something down, explains Pete Moss. The trouble is, if we kept changing things, it would always be in the rehearsal stage. It would never get finished. So one of the things I always tried to do was to get something down on tape, so that then we could say yes or no to it. If you don't actually get anything down, you can't actually say whether it's good or not. Adding further distraction was the good weather, as sunny days often found Stanchel and his chums lazing about in Winwood's beautiful garden. But somewhere in between the chaos and the lazing about, they completed a good amount of the work. This had much to do with the creative and flexible nature of the session men. Among those lending their talents were Winwood, violinist Julian Smedley, and Jim Como on clarinet and various other instruments. Pete recalls one of the more memorable moments. There was a track we were doing called The Fool and Bladder. I was playing cello, Steve was playing mandolin, and Vivian was sitting on a stool playing ukulele. He used to thrash this ukulele so hard that while he was playing, the bridge used to move. As he thrashed, the bridge moved up the instrument towards the sound hole, which, of course, makes the distance between the nut at the top of the ukulele and the bridge shorter, which makes everything go sharper. Steve and I are looking at each other across the microphone while we're playing, and we're having to play all the time upwards. I'm sure we ended up a whole tone higher, a key higher than we actually had started with. Vivian never noticed it at all, but he was thrashing away so hard on his ukulele that everything shifted, and we were laughing. We were just laughing so much. It was so viv. Sir Henry at Rawlinson End was released on September 29, 1978. Listeners and critics alike enthusiastically welcomed Vivian's return after five dormant years. The New Music Express raved, Charisma have the taste to release an hour's worth of Rollinsonia as a testimony to Stanchel's wayward genius. Perhaps Viv Stanchel will get some of the credit he has deserved for years, and large amounts of money, too. Sir Henry at Rollinson End is an album which reveals more and more with each repeated plane, an eccentric nugget and unrivaled delight. The record mirror cheered, Long live true blue British eccentrics. Viv Stanchel, ex-Bonzo dog doodah bander, is back with a minor artistic classic. Stanchel narrates a story of wit, charm, and crude intention. The quality of sound is crystal clear. Close your eyes and you're almost there. A magnificent album. Sounds pronounced it a little classic, an inspired outburst from a genius of British humor, and declared that it was about time, if not a bit late. Stanchel's insanely British tales were assembled in one place. 
The album was a small financial success as well, selling over 12,000 copies in its first year. These figures pale in comparison to the astronomical gold and platinum sales of Stanchel's contemporaries, but they are quite respectable for the surreal spoken word romp that is Sir Henry at Rawlinson End. To accompany the release of Sir Henry, a comeback gig was slated at London's Collegiate Theatre for the 18th of October. Expectations ran high. Stanchel had been out of the limelight for quite a long time, but his reputation as an exceptionally creative visual performer remained untarnished. In attendance that evening were journalists, music critics, and celebrities of all shapes and sizes. It was a make-or-break gig. The pressure on Stanchel was indeed immense, so immense he couldn't bring himself to work on the text until the very eve of the performance. Live performance was always profoundly personal for Stanchel. It is the absolute flash, he explained, like going on stage and unzipping yourself and saying, look at me. If you think about what you're doing when you go on to a stage unless you're boozed up or drugged up, God, that takes some guts, you know. The intense pressure surrounding the gig grew stronger as the moment to take the stage grew closer at hand. Bravely, Viv tried in vain to abstain from any drugs or drink before the performance. He eventually caved. As Leslie Welch, one of the supporting acts, performed, Vivian snuck up on stage to take a look at the crowd from the wings. Feeling immediate panic, he hastily fumbled for a Valium and uncorked a bottle of wine. I had all this rubbish going on in my head, psychosomatic conditions that I knew were rubbish, Stanchel revealed. I thought if I take a pill out on stage, the audience will understand, but by the time it hits and works, it will be no good, and all the time my mouth was going clack, 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 and there's just things coming out. Despite Vivian's profound anxiety, the performance went off without a hitch. Everyone in attendance warmly welcomed the return of the Bonzo Dog Ringmaster. The critics, too, praised Viv's performance. The Guardian declared, whimsical, confusing, brilliant Stanchel should be performing this show nightly everywhere on Earth. The success of his comeback performance led to a brief tour, each show as successful as the first. But while Stanchel had been cheered back into both the worlds of recording and performance, it did little to calm his overall anxieties. At the time, he confessed, I'm going through a spiritual rejuvenation, and I'm still very shy and liable to panic when I go outside. It's still very frightening just to walk down to the end of the towpath or go out shopping. Though at constant battle with his nerves, Stanchel enjoyed performing again. I was apprehensive, but I'm also nervous about going out to get the laundry or driving down to see my hypnotherapist, admitted Vivian. Fortunately, my audiences seem to like me, even when I'm off form. As usual, he performed best when creating off the cuff. I am as surprised of what comes out of my mouth as the audiences, he declared. So it keeps it exciting, and I'm cracking up at the things that ostensibly I'm the father of and therefore should not be laughing at, though now I'm getting down to the actor's responsibility of whatever and I don't want to get into all this spiritual crap. These things just present themselves to me and I laugh my head off. While I'm slipping in and out of voices and so on, I am still being myself, he laughed. But it's very dangerous and terrifying. I start to think, what are you doing? You must be insane. What if they start understanding you? What have you got left then? They're going to see that you really are a fool. On August 16, 1979, Stanchel's wish for another chance at fatherhood was granted when Kai gave birth to a bouncing baby girl. Naturally, any major event in the life of Vivian wouldn't be complete without some sort of madness. Late one August night aboard Searchlight, Kai awoke to tremendous labor pains. The baby was on its way, undeniably. Stanchel, who'd been drinking all day, was in a terrible state and in no shape to walk, let alone drive. So it was pregnant Kai who had to help Vivian down the towpath and into the car. Kai remembers. 
I got into labor, and I have to get Vivian together. I drove myself to the hospital in labor because he can't drive. I had to get him down the towpath, which was a chore. We had to stop off at an off-license so Vivian could get a supply so that he could be in the goddamn hospital. Are you listening to this? I get there. I get him into the goddamned hospital. He hides his supply under my gurney. Oh, my God. Through a day and a half of intense labor, Stanchel remained by Kai's side. I was in labor thirty-six hours, and Vivian was there, always holding my hand. Kai remembers. He may have been pissed, but he was loving, and he was eager, and he was excited. As the baby finally began to appear, danger, however, arose. The umbilical cord had gotten wrapped around the baby's neck. The baby wasn't breathing. Stancha was terrified. Kai, unable to see what was going on, saw the color leave Vivian's face and knew that something had gone terribly wrong. The doctors quickly went to work to remove the cord. The long, paralyzing moment finally came to an end as the baby drew breath and began to cry. Kai looked up to see Vivian's face turn radiant with joy. There before him was a beautiful baby girl. Viv bellowed, My God, where's its Willie? All that was left to do now was to give their baby a name. Stanchel, always the consummate wordsmith, had been working on the project for over a month. Unfortunately, neither he nor Kai could produce a name on which they could agree. One afternoon, Vivian came to Kai shouting, I've got it! I know what her name will be. Kai grew very excited. Dorothy, he continued, and we could call her Dot for short. Suffice it to say, they never did agree on a name and ended up leaving the hospital with a nameless baby girl. Eventually, Kai found a name that fit. Silky. I came up with her name insofar as, oh, she felt so good, Kai recalls, I couldn't call her Smoothie, so I called her Silky. It's kind of based on a racehorse I admire called Silky Sullivan and the Irish legend of the Selkies. And there we have it for the official record. Silky Syme Longfellow Stanchel, August 16th, 1979, Middlesex, England. With the arrival of Silky, Viv not only gained a second chance at being a father, he gained a friend and a playmate. He was a father that was actually like one of my friends, remember Silky. He was like a little kid with me. We had a lot of fun together. We played together. He used to drink monster juice and turn into a monster and chase me around the house. Another fond memory from Silky's childhood is her father's storytelling. I loved the way he told stories to me, recalls Silky. He would do all the voices differently. I could see it like a movie in my head. To young Silky, her father was larger than life, an incredibly posh man who walked with the longest strides in the whole entire world. She often announced to the neighbors, my dad was a pop star in the 60s. Silky was and still remains extremely proud of her papa's talent, which, in addition to his freckles, skin, and hair, she seems to have inherited, complete with his taste for the vulgar. Another addition to the Stanchel family was Bones the Bulldog. Vivian later described Bones as the ideal dog, completely silly and wonderful unless something real was happening. I used to chase my second wife around with a machete, and he wouldn't take a blind bit of notice. He'd just give me his Oliver Hardy look. When the law came to get me, he knew something genuine was up, and he went bananas. A Christmas Eve broadcast of Rawlinson End, Goose Flesh Steps Part 1, on the John Peel Show, capped off the year 1979. Stanchel, along with his Rawlinson alter egos, was reaching a creative peak. All the while, his personal life blossomed in parallel. As the new year heralded a new decade, it seemed as if fortune had quit thumbing her nose at Chapter 10. King Cripple. Elegant Musings. 1980-1984. Here's what Vivian really was. He stood on a stage and he was honest. He showed you real emotion. He wasn't a rock and roll star. He was a goddamned artist. Kai Longfellow Stanchel. In late March of 1980, Tony Stratton Smith 
held a small soiree to celebrate Stancho's 37th birthday. The party could have been also to celebrate Vivian's coming out of the 70s alive. Not only had Vivian survived, he'd finished the decade on a personal and professional high. Keeping with his recent good fortune the opportunity for Stanchel's next major project, a film of Sir Henry at Rawlinson End, presented itself at a party. Viv recalled the occasion in his 1993 eulogy for Stratton Smith, performed for the famous Charisma Box. It was my birthday, March 21, 1980, and Strat thought it appropriate to pop a bottle or three to celebrate. Would you care to make a film, dear boy? Silly question. A joke? Three weeks later I was poured out at his country home, bashing out the screenplay. Joining him in bashing out that screenplay, at Strat's Newbury home, was Steve Roberts, whom Vivian had recruited to direct the film. The two had met nearly a decade later, when Roberts was producing the TV show Late Night Lineup on BBC Two. Roberts invited Viv to make an appearance on the show, which involved a vignette in which Viv was to rise out of a coffin, but when the live camera turned to shoot Viv, he had not risen. Rather, he remained in the coffin, sound asleep. Despite this faux pas, Roberts invited Viv back for future appearances, forging a strong friendship between the two men. Stratton Smith gave the pair full run of his Newbury home, including unrestricted access to all the booze in the house. Could have been a mistake. For the next eight weeks, the two drank and wrote in that order. Meanwhile, Strat's financial advisors at Charisma Films warned him about producing the film, fearing that it would be difficult to distribute and that the company would almost certainly lose money. But Strat was determined. Fuck em all. I will build walls on which to protect it. Strat also gave complete artistic freedom to Stanchel and Roberts. He never interfered, only visited the set once, and never viewed the rushes. Viv recalled the freedom Strat provided during the writing of the script. Afternoons resplendent in sumptuous dressing gown. This gentlemanly, beslippered Strat would appear, chuckle at my first drafts, smile encouragement, nod to his beastly collection of bratbies, make a mysterious encoded phone call to his bookie, and vanish. And leave me to it. He never did censure. I was utterly free. One evening after a long day's work, Roberts and Stancho retired to a local pub that catered to the men who worked at the nearby Newbury race course. As Vivian entered the pub, he found himself wading through a sea of jockeys. "'This place is full of midgets!' he exclaimed. The wary locals took it in stride. However, when Vivian attempted to lighten the mood a bit with a game of shoot the ashtray, the locals took exception. Viv sent an ashtray careening down a long table through explosions of glasses, plates, and food. The jockeys and their compatriots rose as one, physically ejecting Vivian from the pub, with his companion not too far behind. Roberts recalls lying on the pavement outside with Viv on top of him, moaning, "'Why, dear boy, does this always happen to me?' When Viv's comedic side was often in full force, it was offset by his less frequent but more intense tragic side. Roberts once spent four hours on a bed with his arms wrapped around Viv. He wept and begged me to stop him from dying, recalls Roberts. He'd fall down and assume the fetal position because he'd taken a cocktail of pills and his heart would start fibrillating. At these times, Viv would become very afraid that he was going to die. You'd have to get a hold of him and drag him off to bed. After two chaotic months, Stanchel and Roberts completed the screenplay, as Kai remembers. They ended up with a script that could have played five hours dense material. The density of the script was partially due to the fact that Vivian was dead set against producing a film which merely followed the album. It is much more than the film of the record, he explained at the time. It doesn't leave you on a dot, 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 and hinges upon a ghost story. I've introduced new characters like Hubert, Sir Henry's dead brother, whose ghost stalks the house with a stuffed bulldog called Gums. Concerning the commercial appeal of Sir Henry, Stanchel commented, There are no pratfalls, no bums and tits, little to commend it, in fact, to the general public. The language is in fact flowery and absurd. 
The success of Life of Brian has led to comedy being back in favor for the moment. The tomahawk-headed sharkies now think that anything surreal and British will go. Let's see. The filming took place over three weeks in the early summer of 1980. The principal photography was shot in Nebworth House in Hertfordshire, moving occasionally to various other locations around Gloucestershire. During the casting, Robert saw Vivian embarrassed for the first and only time ever. Upon asking one of the more famous actresses if she could cry on demand, Viv received the frosty reply, "'Of course I can. I'm a professional actress, you silly fucker.' Among the actors cast to inhabit Rawlinson End was Patrick McGee, who played Reverend Stoughton in the film. A veteran actor, McGee had appeared in over sixty films, including Zulu, A Clockwork Orange, and the cult classic Tales from the Crypt. He was also known as Samuel Beckett's favorite actor. The cast also included Denise Coffey of Do Not Adjust Your Set as Mrs. E., and J. G. Devlin as Old Scrotum. Also appearing in the film were Dot Man Pete Moss and ex Bonzo dog Vernon Dudley Bolheno. Stanchel personally cast Bolheno to play Nigel Nice, one half of the Twee, annoying theatrical house cleaning team, nice and tidy. Many expected Vivian to play Sir Henry, but he chose to play the part of Hubert. He played the part he wrote for himself, explains Kai. All the parts in Sir Henry are obviously Vivian, but the one that was most dear to his heart was Hubert. He wanted to play Hubert. He didn't want to play Sir Henry. Picked for the role of Sir Henry was seasoned English favorite Trevor Howard. At first, Vivian was unhappy with the choice, believing Howard was perhaps too upper crust for the role. After all, Howard had played Captain Bly in Mutiny on the Bounty, Lord Cardigan in The Charge of the Light Brigade, and Air Vice Marshal Keith Park in The Battle of Britain. Viv was not the only one in doubt. Many questions Howard's decision to play such a loony role. In his authorized biography, Howard explained, Why on earth is he doing that film, they'll say, and the answer is because I want to do it. I might never get the offer to do such a thing again. Furthermore, in a later interview, Trevor Howard would confess that the part was absolutely him. Howard's admission that the part was absolutely him may help explain his immediate affinity for Stanchel. In fact, he and Vivian were very much alike. They were both large personalities, remembers Kai. Both were irreverent. Both were very, very serious about their art. On one of the very first days of shooting, Howard approached Stanchel and said, "'Tell me who the hell this character is.' Viv gave him five minutes of direction, which was apparently all the veteran actor needed to get into the role. Another similarity between the two was their great love of drink. The two saw each other, and it was like two policemen meeting or two pointer dogs, remembers Pete Moss. They just knew each other immediately and got on famously.' So famously, in fact, they indulged in a 24-hour booze binge at the very start of the film. Realizing the disastrous effect this sort of relationship could have on production, the crew tried their best to keep the two apart for the rest of the filming. While their efforts may have successfully squelched another binge with Howard, it did little to curb Stanchel's drinking. The pressure on the set was palpable. Well, I have to be perfectly fair and say it was a real hard task for the director Steve, remembers Pete Moss. He had a hard time with Vivian over the whole of the film. I have to say, as I know anyone trying to deal with Vivian, I mean, you have to think of it as a full-time job on your hands. You're just dealing with him and when he was in that state, let alone directing a film at the same time. As the pressure grew, Viv became obviously angrier. If anything gave him an excuse to drink, he drank. The crew became very aware of Vivian's increased drinking, which was leading to Viv's disruptive behavior on the set. The women who worked in the wardrobe department threatened to quit after being repeatedly sexually harassed by Vivian. In an attempt to keep Vivian in a stable condition, everyone on the set did whatever they could to keep Viv off the fucking sauce. But, as alcoholics often do, Stanchel had his sneaky ways of making sure he wouldn't stay dry. On one occasion, the production moved on location to the lake at Nebworth for a scene in which Hubert frolics upon an island. For the shot, Stanchel was rowed out to the island and left there, while the crew rowed back to film the scene from the shore. 
Unbeknownst to anyone, the previous evening, Vivian had gotten into the boat, rowed himself across to the island, and buried a bottle of rum. Pete Moss, who played one of the Irish quartet in a scene also shot by the lake, remembers. The next day they rowed him out there. They checked him first to see if he was clean, and of course he was. So they thought, all right, this is fine. So they rowed him out to the island, left him on the island, and rowed back. At one point, they couldn't use the tape because all you could see was Vivian with a bottle in his mouth. And Nebworth is an artificial lake, and it has an enormous stopper in it to hold the water, like a bath stopper. Apparently, Vivian got drunk one day and pulled this stopper out, and the bloody water level went down to two feet before they realized what had happened. The trouble is, they say that you can see it. Well, they say you can see it, but I've never really noticed it because I haven't looked at the film very often. But apparently, there are some takes where the water is where it is, and there are some takes where there's two feet of mud on the reeds where the water levels dropped two feet. And that's because he'd pulled the fucking plug out at one point. Another odd moment occurred on the set when Stanchel performed a rather realistic bird impersonation. It seems he got a bit carried away and proceeded to stuff five live worms in his mouth. To Vivian's horror, one poor worm plugged straight down into his gullet. He was rushed to the hospital, but it was too late. As one of Viv's aides gravely explained, there was nothing we could do for either Vivian or the worm. After a frenetic three weeks of filming, the shoot was wrapped, but this did little to calm the tension surrounding the project. As a matter of fact, the tension only increased during their editing stage. Although the film itself took less than a month to shoot, the editing dragged on for months. Robert struggled to make a coherent piece out of the film, but it still wasn't up to snuff. Having seen the rushes, Viv was terribly unhappy with the film. His feelings are strongly presented in a letter sent to Tony Stratton Smith, dealing with what he felt were the film's high points and what could be done to save the rest. He wrote, Dear Tony, Throughout the film is very beautiful to look at. Sadly, it does not make sense. Such is the density of the information spoken and visual that the whole thing becomes indigestible. Perhaps ideas rather than scenes should be trimmed. Characters appear with little or inadequate explanation. This may be cured with simple unadorned narration, not only from myself, but also from the lady who so charmingly plays Flory. From the kickoff, we have to know what's going on, because after 20 minutes, the whole thing becomes a rather somber and heavy-going film. Mr. Slaughter has far too much to say, and he is a wordy and tiresome character anyway. Much could be lost. The dinner scene, which in the rushes was silly, delightful, and a blessed relief, has been hacked to nonsense. Old Scrotum is, in my view, the most successful. He is early established, and his music is so jolly. More jolly music is needed throughout, not only to leaven and lighten the film, but because so much intelligence can be conveyed, and difficult or unintelligible dialogue happily lost. Like the FX I found so generally unimaginative, and these, for the most part, need to be redone. There's simply not enough froth, rasp, and fun. I hoped audiences would leave the cinema hopeful, cheery, and pleased to be English. For me, the film reached a conclusion after Henry locked up Slaughter and Buller. I shared the groan when we plowed confused into the blazing. The last should be cut and the picture end with Scrotum's run and the diver as is. Overall, I find the film pretentious and self-indulgent. I do believe it can be cheaply and efficiently cured, but it needs a fresh and objective eye. I suggest Malcolm Brown be brought in as a surgeon. Malcolm has directed films and, as you know, is a sound effects man par excellence. He also worked with me on the radio and the record of Rawlinson End. He has at his disposal the BBC library and an open mind. To be honest, I found the film rather shapeless, and I believe the audience would be reassured and comforted to hear explanatory musical themes, however brief. A little narration and the judicious use of F.X. may help one to understand the story and perhaps even make the audience smile. I should add that all music in mind is already recorded either on the album or on the seven tracks I've just made. Rarely is the director the editor as well. Steve is too close.' 
If the above seems a terrible damnation, well, I can't help being angry. Again, I believe with Malcolm in the driver's seat, we can quickly transform Sir Henry into something we might enjoy, be proud of, and even make money. I hope so. Sincerely, Vivian. Unfortunately, Stanchel's well-thought-out suggestions never saw the light of day. The filmmakers decided the film could be remedied with the addition of heavy narration, so Vivian was called back to watch the rushes and hastily pen said narration, a task he was not at all happy with. I'm pretty damn sure that a lot of the thing could have been saved pictorially instead of stuffing it with narration, he later commented. As Viv notes in his letter, the soundtrack for the film was quickly and cheaply recorded at Tin Pan Alley Studios. The new tracks offered little more than a re-recording of the music and themes which appeared on the John Peel segments and the original album, not at all artistically satisfying. Sir Henry at Rawlinson End was released in the fall of 1980. Overall, the film won praise from critics and audiences alike. Comparisons were made to the works of Dylan Thomas and James Joyce. The New York Times lauded a comically inflated narration that suggests feeling in his mock heroic mode Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot, and further praised the extraordinary cinematography of Martin Bell. The London Guardian cheered, Extraordinary! A long time since I've laughed so much! While the London Financial Guardian raved, British comic genius, certainly a contender for the funniest film of the year! The new musical Express took it one step further and voted Sir Henry the year's best film. Additionally, Sir Henry was awarded further honors, winning a special jury prize at the 1980 Oxford International Film Festival. One of the most complimentary reviews came from Trevor Howard himself. Extremely proud of the film, he declared, people want to see it again and again because you can't grasp it all at once. It's wild. Despite all the concomitant critical praise, however, the film failed financially. Sir Henry ran briefly at art houses throughout England and would only reach New York and Los Angeles in the States. Charisma lost a half a million pounds and ended up selling the film to Channel 4 in an effort to recoup some of their losses. Stanchel was bitterly disappointed, to say the least. It seemed to me the record was pretty much a blueprint for the way it should have been directed, he noted shortly after the film's release. The record is certainly flawed, but it does have a rhythmic sense to it which the film lacks. I rewrote the bloody thing several times, but even at that stage it wasn't quite the brainstorm cocktail it was later to become. When I saw the rough cut, thank God I was drunk, because otherwise I would have been armed and there would have been bloody wounds and perhaps more. It wasn't good enough for Vivian, confirms Kai. It failed miserably in his eyes. He had this moment to make a film, you know? Someone said, here, take this money and make a goddamn film. And in his eyes, it was botched, and it was nothing like it could have been. Stanchel later admitted that his own precious state of health may have played a part in what he perceived as his film's demise. At the time, I wasn't well enough to get involved with anything so complex at all, period. End of story. Vivian and the equally redoubtable Sir Henry were bloodied but unbowed by the half-million-pound loss. Even as Charisma was cutting its losses, the Rawlinsons were finding renewed life in yet another medium. The Who's Pete Townsend, a great fan of Stanchel's work and eager to sign authors to his publishing company Eel Pie, offered to put Sir Henry in print. The result, Sir Henry at Rawlinson End and other spots, was released shortly after the film. While Stanchel was proud of the opportunity to publish Sir Henry as a proper book, he had some difficulty transferring what had always been an auditory experience into print. Kai also served as the book's editor. She remembers. Vivian certainly knew how to write, but not for the page, which is quite a different thing than writing for radio or record or song. Basically, my editing on that book was a process of trying to get Vivian to put words on a fucking page. He always wrote dialogue because he knew he could do things with his voice that would explain them. This didn't work, however, in print, at least not so successfully. Not at all wishing to produce a book of the film, Stanchel penned gobs of new material, which he planned to incorporate into elements and themes from both the film and his radio segments. As usual, Stanchel overwrote and, in his own chaotic style, flooded searchlights' floors with piles and piles of bits and scraps of paper. 
Hours and hours of scotch tape and licking and sticking, as Vivian described it, resulted in a hybrid of the best of Sir Henry. To help promote the book, Stancho Levin consented to a few book signings held at some of the more strange bookshops around London. As events, the signings were surreal, to say the least. One need only imagine Vivian holding forth in such a setting and the crowd that arrived to participate. On September 9, 1980, Vivian and Kai were married at the registry office in the district of Surrey Northern. We married on nines, remembers Kai, the ninth day of the ninth month in the ninth year. Nine is my number, and Vivian incorporated it into everything after we met. If you look, you'll find nines scattered throughout Rawlinson End. All his numbers from then on are reducible to nine. In the beginning we married for Silky. I wanted it for Silky, and Vivian agreed. But rather soon after the fact that we were actually legally married, it came to mean quite a bit to Vivian. It meant he could relax into the relationship. All the normalities that usually accompany a registry office marriage were merrily disregarded. Only three others were in attendance, Silky, naturally, and helping out as a witness, Topath friends, Christine and Joanna, who, as Kai warmly remembers, provided flowers, confetti, and joy. Afterwards, it was back to Searchlight for one hell of a celebration which included the entire Topath population. In December of 1980, Steve Winwood drifted back on the musical scene after a nearly four-year absence with his second solo album, Ark of a Diver. Stancho was involved in the project early on. Winwood had recruited him to be the album's principal lyricist. Vivian obliged and went to work. Winwood remembers the day Viv presented the set of lyrics to him designed to produce a hit. There was one rather interesting time when I was having pressure from my record company to have a hit, and I was put together with these two producers who shall remain nameless. I wrote a track and they were saying, "'It's sounding great, but when are we going to hear the lyrics?' and I told them that Vivian was doing those. We were in this pub by the studio in Goring, and Viv shows up with the lyrics. This was rather an upmarket pub, people sitting around eating, and he came in wearing a loincloth and a long coat with a big stick and a hat with an enormous brim, and he announced to the pub, I smell food, or has somebody farted? Great entrance! Then he turned to the producers, and one of them's young wife was pregnant, and Viv starts telling them he's a doctor and he's got to examine her. He was finally extracted from this young lady and produced the lyrics, and he'd written a track called Keep On Mooing. It took a while to sink in that he was really taking the piss out of them, and I suppose out of me to a certain extent, although we were really in this together. Soon thereafter, Stancho delivered an album's worth of real material. Ultimately, however, all but one of his contributions were turned down by Winwood's label, Island Records, who were of the opinion that an album full of Vivian's lyrics might not do the trick. The label heads made the decision to lay Viv's contributions to rest, after Steve was unable to explain Vivian's lyrics to them. Steve's comments about the lyrics was that he didn't really understand them, but they felt emotionally right, Vivian recalled which I felt was the only thing that was truly important. Somewhere in the Island Records vaults lays a tape of the full Windwood Stancho collaboration, leaving fans of both artists to wonder just what these mystery tracks might contain. The one set of lyrics that Steve did keep became the album's title track. In a 1987 interview, Vivian commented on the meaning behind Ark of a Diver. Ark of a Diver was effortless. I used to think that there were lamas in Tibet that could write perfect verse, that towards the end of his life Dolly could paint and know that he was going to make marvelous and astounding works. I don't think that's going to happen to me. I don't think it happened to them, but I think it's a marvelous idea to be able to flow perfectly. I don't know much about Indian mystics, but I figured that once you'd get past a certain stage, if you could forget about the nuts and bolts, you could just play, sing, or speak. You wouldn't have to consider your words or the next thing that occurs. You could actually do it. Ark of a Diver is about that. Stanchel also described Ark of a Diver as a love song for Kai, citing lines such as, She bathes me in sweetness. I cannot reveal for sharing dreams. I need my woman. 
Ark of a Diver was released to a flurry of fantastic reviews. Stealing the show was Vivian's contribution. Timothy White of Rolling Stone wrote, Ark of a Diver, the LP's dark jewel, is a savage prayer about the ravages of risk. The singer raging against jealous night and all her secret chords. The small pleasure Vivian might have felt at having Ark of a Diver singled out for praise on an acclaimed album was all but lost when, in December, things took a turn for the worse. On the morning of December 9th, 1980, the Stanchels were preparing for a birthday celebration aboard Searchlight when news came that on the previous evening John Lennon had been murdered. The news devastated Vivian, who had once described Lennon as the only one I had a conscience with. Kai remembers the scene. When John died, we were on Searchlight. It was my bloody birthday. The news came that John had died, and Vivian, it was like someone had hit him. He collapsed. He just sat down heavily in his chair and went blank. John Lennon was important to Vivian. John was an unfulfilled relationship. John was a promise of meeting or being with someone who could really have mattered to Vivian. But John had gone off in one direction and Vivian in another. I mean, Vivian had disappeared into his bottle and his pills— but the moment they were together, there was a power. There really was. And they recognized that. Both of them recognized that. The impact of Lennon's death on Vivian cannot be underestimated. He had lost Keith Moon only a few years before, but that was different. Vivian had outgrown Moon, moved beyond rock and roll excess into all-consuming art. Lennon was one of the few people Viv really looked up to. He was one of the big boys. At the same time, Lennon's death did not send him into another of his periods of depression. He had Kai, Silky, and Sidney, and he had life aboard the searchlight. He collapsed when Lennon died, but he got up again. Inspired by his family and perhaps some of the energy he felt when he was with Lennon, he continued working on his music. Vivian realized his third solo album, Teddy Boys Don't Knit, in June of 1981. The album is both a testament to and a celebration of his good life aboard Searchlight. While there is also a good amount of comedy on the album, there is also an air of unaccustomed seriousness. Well, it's so easy to get belly laughs and big punchlines, explained Stanchel. I suppose that beneath the surface there is a philosophy which I'm not about to extrapolate. I can't continue to do silly songs. I never wanted to do that anyway, and the build-up of stuff that I care about is pretty terrific and sodded. I'm not going to tread water even though I know that if I turned out a Bonzo-style album, there would be a fair chance of it selling. Amongst the built-up stuff Vivian cared about are personal songs written for and about his family. Calypso to Calypso and Bewilderbeast are love songs for Kai, certainly. The latter is a complete and honest declaration of love and commitment, as Vivian croons, But wife know this, wolves mate for life. I think that if you listen to Bewilderbeast, that really says it all about his feelings for her, explains Vivian's stepdaughter Sidney. That was one of the things he could be that I don't think many men, let alone human beings, can be, which is so incredibly raw and open and vulnerable in that state of love. Similarly, the tube is Vivian's love song to his baby girl, Silky. The song, which features an 18-month-old Silky chirping, Apple, apple, and what's that, practically gushes with paternal pride. As Stancher wrote in the album's liner notes, whether she'll love me for this rather personal ode when she's old enough to appreciate it's rather personal functionalism, I don't know. But it's the only way I can put tears of joy and pride and big, softy cuddles on record. Now a grown young woman, Silky is grateful for her father's musical present. It's not really embarrassing, Silky explains. My dad thought that it was going to be embarrassing for me when I grew older. For me, it makes me warm and feel kind of sad, but happy at the same time, because it makes me think of my father. We used to have a very bizarre relationship, so the whole thing about the tube is very right on for me in the way that I remember our relationship. 
In possibly an armchair and fresh-faced boys, Stanchel tackles the difficult subject of his relationship with his estranged father. In an attempt to both explain and assert his differences to Vic, he questions whether he might grow up to be like Dad. Though he rarely even spoke of his father, Vivian still desperately desired his approval, or at the very least, a little understanding. Appropriately, the track features a guest appearance by young Rupert, who declares Vivian's sentiment of independence, "'Dad, this may be a shock, but I don't want to even possibly, or maybe, or eventually, because armchairs always get stuffed!' In this way, the three stanchial men are linked, none of whom wished to be like Dad." Other musical bric-a-brac on Teddy Boys includes the tracks Gums and The Cracks Are Showing, two tunes originally written for the Sir Henry film. The former chronicles a stuffed bulldog called Gums and the naked ghost of Hubert who haunts Rawlinson and until he's trousered. The Cracks Are Showing provides insight into the fragile mind of Stanchel through his Rawlinson counterpart, Hubert. Terry keeps his clips on, his vintage viv, while bordering closely on a bonzo edge. This is especially true in the refrain of He Won't Change, He Won't Change, where the unmistakable voice of Neil Innes rings through. Indeed, there was a bonzo reunion of sorts, as both Innes and Roger Ruskinspear made appearances on the album, though they never actually played on the same track. It is an absolute pleasure hearing Spear, whose enormous talents are often sadly overlooked, contributing his inimitable sound to the tracks The Tube and Flung a Dummy. The latter, a ballsy track sung straight from the gut, shows that both Stanchel and Spear still had the chops to make a bit of noise with the best of them. Teddy Boys Don't Knit showcases, too, Stanchel's profound penchant for word smithery. Critics rightly took notice and praised Vivian's lyrical ingenuity. Stanchel uses words like Picasso used paint during his later years, frequently in a dazzling, confusing manner, wrote Melody Maker's Patrick Humphrey. Stanchel creates almost labyrinth verbose mazes of lyrical landscapes populated with characters straight out of Hieronymus. It's all a load of bosh! Fun from the edges of pain, absolute Rollinsonia. While the songs reflected Viv in top form, the truth was that his increasing alcohol and drug intake was having a profound effect on his physical and mental health, as with the filming of Sir Henry. He had again reached the point during the recording of Teddy Boys Don't Knit, where he had to be actively prevented from drinking. Strict orders were given to all involved, Keep Viv away from the drink, no matter what. But as before, it was an impossible effort, as Vivian would always find ways to get to that bottle. Ironically, while recording the first half of the album at Abbey Road, Viv arrived at the studio well pissed, and a good amount of work did still get done. Pete Moss, who served as musical director for the sessions, remembers. They tried to keep him off the drink, but he'd finally gotten to the drink, got drunk, and fell asleep on the couch. When he woke up seven hours later, we'd actually put seven tracks down. He was very annoyed. He didn't like that at all, but in actual fact, it was a good way to work because, to be honest, we plowed on through. We got half of the stuff done. Stanchel still had no trouble recruiting first-rate musicians. He assembled another formidable group of players for the sessions. In addition to his old bonzo chums were Jim Como... Roscoe G., Ollie Hassel, and Admiral John Halsey, better known as Ruttleberry Wom, formerly Barrington Womble. What's more, when Vivian needed another guitarist, he rang guitar legend Richard Thompson. In an interview with journalist Harold Demure, Thompson recalled the sessions. I think that was a pretty desperate time for Viv, all in all. I got a call from him, and he said he hadn't been able to find a guitar player, so I went right in the studio, and the sax player was doing his bit, and his hour was up, and it was like, right, you're on, Voom. It was a great deal of pressure to finish this record. I think I did like seven tracks in an hour, reading off the dots on the chords, which I'm not particularly good at. It was all one take, maybe two takes if I was really lucky." I've known Viv on and off for many years, Thompson continued. He's an extremely talented man, who I think is not always able to contain his talent and sometimes goes over the top. I'd love to work with him again. He's great. Richard Thompson wasn't the only surprise guest. Stanchel was dead set upon having, yes, keyboard virtuoso Rick Wakeman play piano on the track Smoke Signals in the Night.
As good fortune had it, Wakeman happened to be recording in the same studio. The trouble was that both Viv and Rick were signed to Charisma, and the suits at the company saw their proposed collaboration as a possible conflict of interest. They explicitly told Vivian that he couldn't use Wakeman. Of course, Viv was never one for falling into line, was he? One evening, when the boys in the studio decided to take a dinner break, he hatched a plan to get Wakeman on his album, Moss Recalls. Rick was recording upstairs in number one, and we were doing this in number two. We all went down to the Chinese restaurant, but Vivian said, You know, I don't really feel too well, old bean. I feel I've got a headache coming on. He got back an hour later, and what the crafty bugger had done was that he'd gone to somebody and borrowed ten quid in two five-pound notes. He'd given a fiver to the tape-op, who was in awe of him, and sent him down the road to get him a bottle of rum or something— then the other half he put in the tape op's pocket and told him to run the tape, got Rick from upstairs, and actually managed to get Rick to play piano on the track. He'd only done one take, and that's the take that stays on there now. We came in, and Rick was on the floor laughing. He just couldn't stop laughing. Needless to say, the suits were furious, but Vivian had won. Wakeman's performance remains on the album. Wakeman found the experience absolutely delightful. He had always been an enormous fan of the Bonzo Dog Band, and even claims to own the most extensive collection of Bonzo memorabilia. Wakeman, along with the legendary rock writer Chris Welch, was also responsible for starting the Bring Back the Bonzos campaign. The campaign succeeded in gathering the Bonzos into the studio. Unfortunately, no one felt like playing. Stancho may have managed to carry on in his professional work, but his alcohol abuse had a more chilling effect at home. He reached rock bottom on New Year's 1981. To celebrate the holiday, Viv, who had spent a few successful weeks in the wagon, decided he had the right to drink on a public holiday just like everyone else. He planned for a night on the town, which Kai protested, knowing too well that her husband's alcoholism made it impossible for him to simply down a few casual drinks. Kai's words fell upon deaf ears. Soon enough, Vivian was cycling off to a friend's house with Sidney in tow. Sidney, however, was not along simply for a good time. As her stepfather and his friend drank, she acted with nobler intentions. The teen believed that if she could prevent him from getting drunk, she might prevent the subsequent row that would accompany their return to Searchlight. It was one of those incredible, romantic, idealistic moments where you think if he doesn't drink as much, then we won't have much of a scene, recalls Sidney. I anticipated a scene because Kai anticipated one, so I tried to finish off his drinks every time he wasn't looking. Sidney failed to stop Vivian from getting drunk, but was extremely successful in getting pretty pissed herself. The drunken ride home was joyous and full of laughter, as Sidney repeatedly fell off her bicycle. Everything changed, however, as they approached Searchlight. Stanchel's mood shifted dramatically. He began puffing himself into an absolute rage. Sidney remembers. He hit the edge of the towpath and he anticipated trouble. He just sort of changed from mildly intoxicated jollity to incredibly drunk aggression in a matter of a second. It was scary enough that I mean I knew it immediately. It was like a big sea change. He prepared himself for the bullshit he would get for having gotten completely sloshed with my kid, recalls Kai, and that's when he got less than funny, but he'd been a joy up to then. Once aboard Searchlight, Silky immediately headed downstairs to the living room area where Kai was sleeping next to Silky's crib. While Vivian raged upstairs, Sidney told Kai about their evening and his sudden mood change. Stanchel burst down the stairs, bellowing pseudo-Zulu nonsense at the top of his lungs and brandishing a knife. Silky awoke startled and frightened and began to cry hysterically. Sidney quickly hid under the covers. I stayed because I was worried, remembers Sidney. Kai went to stop Silky from crying, who had woken up from the noise he was making, his yelling of the African stuff. You know, this was all just drama, explains Kai. He was just playing a role. He'd puff himself into these great big scenes. It could dissolve into laughter, which it quite often did, or tears, which it quite often did. But it would never result in violence, not real violence. And there was a moment when this was going on that I didn't believe it, and that was scaring the fucking shit out of me, and it was scaring Silky. 
Stanchill advanced, knife in hand. Kai tried her best to soothe her baby. It's all right, Silky. It's only Daddy. It's only Daddy. Sidney, who was then only sixteen years old, leapt up. She lunged at her raging stepfather and grabbed the blade of his knife with her bare hands. She clawed his neck, bit his cheek, and kneed him in the groin. Kai managed to hit Vivian on the head with a flower pot, allowing Sidney to take control and push her stepfather onto the floor. She was able to sit on him long enough for Kai to hustle Silky off the boat. Finding safe haven aboard a neighboring boat, Kai returned with one of their neighbors, a large man who took over for Sidney. He managed to restrain Vivian until he became passive and eventually passed out. Kai, Sidney, and Silky spent the rest of the night aboard the neighbor's boat. The disturbance appeared to have ended, but late the following morning Vivian awoke and began yelling wildly from searchlight. Soon he was making his way over to the neighbor's boat, trying to force his way in. He smashed a small glass window on the front door. The glass shattered around Silky, who once again began bawling. He wasn't going to leave, recalls Kai. It was terrifying. Silky was in floods of tears. We couldn't stop him. He was outside, and I'm just thinking this has got to stop. Kai frantically phoned the police, begging for help, and soon they arrived. To her dismay, she was told that because no one was hurt, that there was little they could do. Moreover, Vivian was now perfectly calm, addressing the policeman in his finest posh voice in an effort to convince them that everything was indeed all right. Still, Kai was adamant that her husband be removed. When the policeman noticed the cuts Sidney received from grabbing the knife, they had enough cause to take him away. The police brought Vivian to the local drunk tank. Being New Year's morning, it had already reached capacity. According to Vivian, he was then taken to a hospital and placed in the psycho ward, where he spent the day absolutely terrified. Stancha was formally charged with causing bodily harm to Sydney. The English press quickly got a hold of the story, chastising the shameful Bonzo Boozer. On February 2nd, 1982, Vivian appeared before the magistrates at Staines, Surrey, and was sentenced to two years years probation. Furthermore, he had to promise to seek treatment for his alcoholism. The sentence handed down by the magistrate was nowhere near as devastating as the loss he'd receive at home. Kai was leaving him. She knew her husband's past and was determined not to see him make the same mistakes with Silky that he had made with Rupert. Kai recalls, I had a child with Vivian, and I said to myself that if I ever saw my child witness anything that his first child witnessed in that marriage, I would be required to leave Vivian. Stanchel's behavior had forced Kai's hand. I had to take her out of that relationship. It was, of course, heartbreaking. I had to leave the man I loved in order to protect the child which I had, and I damned well did it. Kai wasn't the only one to experience a moment of clarity. Vivian, who'd honestly been shaken by the shameful events, admitted for the first time that he was indeed an alcoholic. Though his admission may have been an attempt to gain sympathy or indeed forgiveness for his behavior, the few close to him saw it as an important breakthrough. Perhaps at last Vivian was ready to receive the help he so desperately needed. Alone and dejected, Stanchel pushed ahead with his career. In July of 1982, he appeared on The Dam's new single, Lovely Money. Answering a question regarding Stanchel's performance, The Dam's legendary Captain Sensible wrote, Yep, that's the wonderful Viv S. on the record, all right, and there are some outtakes of his doing a blue version somewhere, too. One day I will go all through all my old junk and find it. He got unfeasonably drunk down at Dingwall's, which was in spitting distance of the Roadhouse Studios, which was an absolute hoot. While the UK punk scene normally spared no expense in thrashing their aging rock predecessors, Vivian's appearance was certainly an indication of the respect and acceptance he continued to command from successive generations of musicians. The summer of 1983 brought a ray of hope for Stanchel, however, as a label called Demon Verbals offered him a deal to produce a follow-up to Sir Henriette Rawlinson End. The result, Sir Henriette Nadius Crawl, was recorded in August of 1983. The album explored Sir Henry's adventures in Africa and his search for the Zulu tribe, a plot which suited Vivian's love for the history of exploration and his fascination with the Zulus. Unfortunately, Vivian was in absolutely no shape to put together the sequel. The work was a reflection of his tragic deterioration. 
Nadius Kral is confused, sloppy, and uninspired, save for a few diamonds in the rough. Sir Henry, bum to the log fire, churchilled into a great balloon of brandy. And his first agreement to a good night kiss was predicated on the idea that this would be a soft business. He was wrong. It was an introduction to Germany. Not surprisingly, the album failed both critically and financially. Vivian was so ashamed of his work that he would never bring himself to mention or even give the album a listen. Toward the end of his life, when he had begun to record the third Sir Henry album, he treated it as if it were the follow-up to the first, as if Nadia's Crawl had never existed. Kai Stancho believes that the record company had taken advantage of her husband. He was drunk. He was manipulated. They realized it without his permission. He had not finished it, and it was a fucking fiasco. He was very angry about that and ashamed of it. But he signed something in a drunken situation that allowed them to release it. They actually thought he was going to die and that they could make a few bucks off of it. It was total exploitation. Furthermore, both Stanchel and Kai allege that while Viv was hospitalized, representatives from the Demon label boarded Searchlight, filched the unfinished tapes, and roughly stitched the album together. Apparently they believed Vivian to be on his deathbed, and thought it was in their best interest to make sure the album was indeed released. The truth be known, Vivian practically was on his deathbed. He was so deep in a deadly period of absolute depression and drug abuse that it seemed utterly impossible for him to ever, ever find the strength to crawl out. Chapter 11 Stinkfoot Cometh The End of the Beginning 1984-1988 Exhausted, broke, and broken-hearted, Kai had to decide whether to leave England and return to California, or stay and find a solution in which all involved could gain. Ultimately, Kai found a remedy which would heal her marriage and fuel the creative fire of both herself and Vivian. She would open a showboat. With absolutely no collateral, she approached a bank about receiving a small business government loan. Kai had little trouble pitching the idea and received a 1,500-pound loan. Soon afterward, a 180-foot-long Baltic coaster christened the Tekla sailed from Sunderland to Bristol with Kai at the helm. Once moored, it took on a new identity as the old profanity showboat. The floating arts center in Bristol was formed. The ship was a place to get away from Vivian, Kai remembers. I had a million reasons for its formation, really, but one of them was to give Vivian a showcase for all of his talents. It seemed rather perfect for that because he could do so much and wanted to do so much. Many reports have often and still do credit Stanchel with the creation of old profanity, but it was really Kai's brainchild from start to finish. Vivian had begun to get involved in the early stages, but was turned off by what he perceived as rather dodgy financial circumstances involving some of the other participants. Vivian backed out wisely, by the way, admits Kai. He was pissed, and he saw something more clearly at that time than I did because of his keen artistic nose. Vivian was first and foremost a lover and an artist. He had almost no idea about anything else. So in this instance, the absolute purity of his inner being told him that the circumstances were going to be in the wrong direction for an artist, and he backed out. Vivian returned to Searchlight, where he descended into a downward spiral of depression and alcoholism. Meanwhile, Kai optimistically moved forward with her brave new venture. To help promote the showboat, she approached the BBC with the prospect of shooting a documentary on the project. The Beeb was sold on the idea, but their backing hinged upon Vivian's participation. The director in charge of shooting the production knew full well that Viv was in no condition to be filmed, and respectfully chose not to include him. The BBC was not put off so easily, however, and they insisted that Stan shall appear in the video. Unbeknownst to Kai, a BBC film crew proceeded to haul their equipment aboard Searchlight, on board, they found and filmed a dejected and thoroughly pissed Vivian Stanchel. It was criminal, actually, asserts Kai. It was morally and spiritually totally reprehensible to go to that boat and film that man in that state. 
Done properly, an appearance on the BBC could have done wonders in rejuvenating Stanchel's career. However, the airing of the segment only served to publicly confirm his tragic decline. He was in an alarming state of decay. His ongoing anxiety attacks grew increasingly severe, and he continued to suffer from a profound agoraphobia. To defeat his phobias, he increased his intake of alcohol and tranquilizers. Once again, friends and family became frightened by his deteriorated state and convinced him to receive treatment in a Surrey hospital. While in hospital, Vivian would again experience sobriety and the horrors which it brought. The pills and the drink were his desperate shield against his anxieties. Without them, his panic attacks dramatically increased. He would only find more pain as he watched those around him successfully recover from their addictions to hard recreational drugs. Withdrawal was and is a terrifying experience, Stanchel revealed. There's a world of difference between withdrawal from heavy drugs or alcohol and tranquilizers. I saw many people get off heroin in ten days, and that's that. There are all sorts of miraculous cures for junkies and alcoholics, and terrific follow-ups available. But with Dizapam, all the tranquilizers, there's virtually nothing. Kai further explains, You watch those goddamn heroin addicts come out in about three days. Actually, once they were off, they were goddamned cured in the sense that they were no longer on heroin. People on alcohol, it took a hell of a lot longer. They were all off the heroin, off the alcohol, running around the clinic, having conversations, drinking their orange juice, and Vivian was on the floor, clean of all drugs and alcohol, and having savage panic attacks. An exhausted stanchel was temporarily released, only to return with a dislocated elbow. While in hospital, he was struck an intensely devastating blow when news came that his home searchlight had sunk. It seems the shaky old bilge pump which for years had faithfully done its best to keep the old boat afloat, had finally given up the ghost. Adding further misfortune, the pump gave out late at night when no one could have noticed and taken early action. So downstream went the half-sunk searchlight, and into the drink went everything Vivian owned. As soon as Viv's neighbors on the towpath realized what had happened, they went to work, what little could be salvaged was rescued and put into storage at Steve Winwood's house in Gloucester. Lost or irreparably damaged was an expansive collection of photographs, records, and tapes, and a priceless collection of rare instruments. Most irreplaceable, of course, were Viv's own objects de art, which now lay in an unfinished ruin. Vivian was left with only sandals, a walking stick, a dislocated elbow, and the nighty on his back. It was biblical stuff, he would later recall. I lost everything. At first, Vivian's spirit was completely destroyed by the loss. But in a display of great character, he fought the desperation the tragedy engendered. Instead of falling into the self-destructive trappings of self-pity, Vivian chose rebirth. Kai recalls, I was in Bristol getting the ship up and running. Vivian called in a terrible state. But in a call a day later, he sounded stoic. He said he'd thought about it and thought about it and finally decided it was a way to start a new life. Stanchel's new hope began with Kai's success in getting the boat in order, including taking care of the financial problems that had turned Vivian away in the first place. It was time for Vivian to come to the old profanity showboat, or rather, it was time for Kai to go get him. Once on board, he continued to seek rehabilitation at a couple of different clinics, eventually landing at Broadway Lodge near Western Supermare. Here he found the sobriety to begin with what would be a time of great happiness, a time in which his creativity and art would flourish and eventually crescendo into the comic opera Stinkfoot. Look at it one way, and we live in a pretty rotten world, said Vivian at the time. It's quite understandable to look out the window and think... Why bother? But flip the coin. There's always something positive. It's a doodle to be a grouch. To be jolly is to be creative. Vivian actually participated in Kai's Floating Arts Center by running the in-house art gallery. It was a joyful experience for Vivian. 
He chose the artists, hung their work, and did all of the promotion, including the original art for the posters. Of course, he couldn't help joining in the musical productions, popping on the ship's stage from time to time to join in the fray. More often than not, he simply slipped on to take a turn at the drum kit. It was one of those magic periods in his life, remembers Kai. He had a stage at his command at any time he wanted. He had an art gallery. He had poets and painters. I mean, all of his friends were coming on stage. We'd have Roger Ruskinspear come on stage and perform solo. Neil came and performed. We had all of these events, and all of our great friends came. It was wonderful. Among the many friends who came was actor David Rappaport of Time Bandits fame. Rappaport, known for his wit as well as his great acting ability, grew very close to the Stanchels, eventually moving into the ship's smallest cabin. Rappaport and Vivian suited each other. A truly memorable and surreal moment involved an ad hoc lunchtime performance of Hamlet starring Stanchel, Rappaport, and gloriously rounding out the cast as Ophelia was Oscar, a hell's angel on crutches. Kai recalls, In the midst of a scene of passion between Dave and Oscar, the angel's cast began to slowly and unnaturally bend and bend and bend until it looked for all the world as if he had two knees, a leg in three parts, shudder-making. The ever-confident, forward-looking Kai continued to run the old profanity at its most whimsical for a frenetic twenty-seven months. In addition to the constant and spontaneous entertainment provided by Stanchel and whomever happened to be by for a visit, the old profanity stage witnessed some two hundred and forty productions, from punk to poetry. Art exhibits to cabaret. The floating arts center had seen it all, a venerable venue well beyond its young years. Throughout the frenzied haze of it all remained the ship's fateful crew, the waitresses, barkeeps, and door people, all of whom were artists, musicians, poets, actresses, and actors. Kai quite rightly believed the crew needed to be rewarded for all the time, effort, and love they had given the ship. The time had come for them to strut upon the stage, so she and Vivian decided to put on a musical comedy which would showcase the talents and personalities of the crew. Kai explains, Vivian and I decided that we would put on a musical comedy which would be tailored to all of these people, so even if they couldn't really do anything, we would write a part in that they would just be themselves. A musical comedy would not only give the crew their chance to perform, but would also fulfill Stanchel's longtime love of traditional English comedy. He'd always been an avid collector of memorabilia and biographies of early music hall stars, magicians, and novelty acts. On board the ship, he now had the opportunity and resources to create his own theatrical production. Their new production would be the comedic opera Stinkfoot, based upon a children's book of the same name that Kai had written when she was just twenty-one years old. Stanchel had always relished the adventures of Stinkfoot, a New York City alley cat, and read Kai's story faithfully to young Rupert and later to Silky. For the next two months, Kai and Vivian would spend sleepless, smoky nights in the captain's cabin, crafting the tale into a full-blown theatrical production. The result is whimsically esoteric, more of a jolly jumble of musical vignettes than a plot relying on continuity. The underlying story, unfortunately, far better experienced than explained, is set within two milieus, one wet and one dry. The latter is the story of goings-on at the end of the pier music hall, where Soquisto, an aging artiste, performs nightly with a cast of not-so-dumb friends. Among the cast are Soquisto's prodigies, Stinkfoot, a theatrical tomcat who has just recently returned to England after starring on the Broadway stage, and Persian Maul, the feline thespian he'd left behind. Screw is Soquisto's prophetic ventriloquist dummy, who, like the traditional Shakespearean fool, served as the work's inner critic. Then there is Buster, Soquisto's eager beaver assistant, who yearns to discover the secret of Soquisto's artistic success. Meanwhile, below the pier at the bottom of the English Sea lives a cast of characters equally as curious and entertaining as those above. The central figure is Mrs. Bagbag, an aquatic bag lady whose watery circle includes Isaiah, a cynical flounder, an elver called Black Pearl, and Pollyanna, a foundling budgerogar. Other salty characters include several drowned sailors and partly cooked shrimp. 
A good portion of the music spawned from compositions Vivian had penned during his lonely final days aboard Searchlight. Songs originally written about Kai and his deep unhappiness were tailored to fit the themes and characters of Stinkfoot. These songs include Made of Stone and No Time Like the Future. Songs written specifically for Stinkfoot included Drowned Sailor's Dream, You Can't Confound a Flounder, Follow Your Nose, What My Public Wants, Parakeet to Meet You, Critically considered some of Vivian's finest work, it is unfortunate and inexplicable that these tracks have gone unrecorded and unreleased. Beneath the surreal memory, there are indeed several strong moral and philosophical themes. In the interviews preceding Stinkfoot's December 5th unveiling, Stanchel made continual mention of these positive themes. He explained that the aim of Stinkfoot was to disseminate a bit of joy. There's no subscription to the rottenness of things, he said at the time. They say that to do the show properly we would have to sell out. People ask, where's the sex? Where's the political comment? Who's the fucking star? Well, we forgot about all that and just did it. It is a demonstration that if you work hard enough and do something fine, that's enough in itself. There is a story under it all somewhere, Kai has written, but whether one caught the story or missed it entirely, the whole magical show was a door into Vivian's extraordinary and labyrinth mind and invitation to spend an evening in the private rooms of a very complex artist. The conduit to the labyrinth of Stanchel's mind appears in the form of the character Sequisto, who is overtly based upon Vivian in his full-on theatrical bonzo dog band mode. Andy Black, a young Bristol actor training at the prestigious Bristol Old Vic Theatre School, was given the challenge of portraying the complex character. I studied Vivian quite intensely, remembers Black. I studied how he behaved and his mannerisms. But what I had to do also was to understand the madness and the insanity of the man. It was very hard finding comparisons and trying to drill down into this character, playing Vivian. I had to watch him the whole time and see how he behaved, what his mannerisms were, how he talked to people, how his skillful sets worked, how he could suddenly speak poetry or suddenly understand music and suddenly articulate a sense of creativity. Stanchel's stark sense of creative spontaneity engulfed Stinkfoot. The cast, which had now been dubbed the Crackpot Theatre Company, would have to think on their feet to keep up with the ever-evolving production. Rehearsals were eccentric, to say the least, recalls Andy Black. When you try to rehearse something that's a work in progress and then it changes the next day, you lose the sense of rehearsing a fixed piece— so you always have to be spontaneous in the way you adapt to it. If you can imagine having a master class where the music and the words and the text are continually changing to improve, it's quite an education just to be around that sort of energy. Adding a touch more eccentricity to the production was the Pit Orchestra, a motley crew called from Bristol's collection of local musicians and buskers. They were a colorful lot who not only had never played together, they for the most part could not read music. To help get the band together and get them up to snuff, Vivian once again coaxed Pete Moss down for a friendly visit. Pamela Kai gave me a ring and said, "'Vivian's going to give you a ring,' laughs Pete. Vivian said, "'Come on down, old bean. I haven't seen you for so long.' So I went down there one day, and he got me to turn up about two o'clock. He then turned around and said, "'Well, there's a rehearsal this evening. Can you write an overture?' In the end, I said, well, let me have a look at what's going on for about two or three hours, and I wrote some notes down and got a few ideas. I indeed sat down and cobbled together an overture, and then we had a big rehearsal in the evening. I thrashed the shit out of these poor buggers, and we got quite a reasonable overture out of it. I'd done it in a very Gilbert and Sullivan way, you know, tying together the main themes of the songs, you know, to sort of wake people up and give them a taste of what's about to come. Pete had succeeded in getting the players to work together as a whole. Once the band realized that they could play as a unit, the music began to readily fall into place. During a break from the hectic rehearsals, Vivian decided to walk down to the print shop with some etchings he'd done at art school. He entered with his usual extraordinary panache, causing everyone in the shop to be terrified to approach him. 
Mark Milmores, who was working at the shop, was intrigued and began helping him, not yet realizing he was talking with Vivian Stanchel, his bonzo dog band hero from his youth. As the two printed up the etchings, they got to chatting and immediately hit it off. When they'd finished, Vivian said, "'Well, I've got to go home now.' "'All right, I'll see you the next time you come down,' answered Mark." Well, Vivian casually continued, I don't think I can make it on my own. You couldn't walk me home, could you? I'm having a bit of a panic attack today. Mark agreed to help, and the two headed back to the ship. On the way, they discussed comic operas and the work Mark had done as a scenic artist at the BBC. We started yakking away, and on the way to the boat, we'd basically sketched out the sets for Stinkfoot as we were walking along, recalls Mark. He said, we're doing some rehearsals next week. Come down and have a look. So I went down to the boat, and there was a chap who was a dear old friend of mine now, Andy Black, who played Sequisto. He was singing a song called Follow Your Nose. I walked down those steps into the bowels of the ship, as it were, and this song was wafting up, and I thought, oh, Christ, this is brilliant. There's some sort of magic going on here, absolute magic. Not only had Stanchel found Stinkfoot's designer, he'd also made a friend who would be a fateful mate until the end. Sharing common interests in art and history, the two would exchange, discuss, and debate ideas for long-spirited hours. A side of Vivian which emerges through his relationship with Mark was his extraordinary inventive letter-writing, Mark Milmore. I remember out of the blue one day a catalogue comes from him about how to buy strange and exotic insects, tarantulas and stuff like that. I mean, he'd always send these kinds of things. I've got a whole heap of letters, and his letters are hilariously funny. They really are. Like I remember in England, we have this packet of tea called PG Tips. They always come with a little card of football players or something silly like that. They were doing a series on nature, and they had little animals and things with each packet of tea. You'd get this card, and on the back of the card there'd be this description of the animal. There was one strange card with a snail and what looked like a mouse, because mice eat snails. Well, this mouse was humping the snail, so he sent me this card. You know, Mark, I didn't realize that mice humped snails. Throughout a decade of their friendship and quite a successful art career of his own, Mark's enormous respect for Vivian's immense talent and creativity never diminished. I sometimes thought, he confides, if I just had ten percent of Vivian's talent, I'd be there. I'd consider myself a pretty talented fellow in my own field, but Viv had so much of it, and excess of it, and almost disgusting excess of talent. Nowhere better did he show this almost disgusting excess of talent than during rehearsals and preparations for Stinkfoot. Stanchel was in rare form, or rather, he was performing with the full potential and creative ability that he'd always had, but rarely had the opportunity to show. He was the co-writer, composer, and lyricist. He oversaw everything from choreography to costume, from press releases to hair design. He not only directed the production insofar as he directed all of the actors, but also at the same time rehearsed to the orchestra, remembers Kai. So we had the orchestra downstairs at all times, and the entire ensemble rehearsing, and he held all of this together somehow. I've never quite seen anything like it. God, he was fucking brilliant. And he was sober. It made people cry he was so good. He took all of the roles and showed everyone what to do. He directed impeccably. He did everything better than everyone else. He sang it better, he acted better, he was a riveting presence on the stage, and when he'd stand up and do their roles for them and virtually show them what to do, he played all of the goddamned instruments better showing people what he wanted. Mark Milmore, too, remembers Stanchel's juggling of creative roles. Basically, that's what you got with Vivian. You got someone who was actually making it up as he was going along, on the hoof, as it were. It was almost as if when he created something it was like... Oh, he's just discovered it himself. It wasn't like, I'm deriving it from someone else, or I'm pinching it from somewhere else. It was like he was discovering as he was actually going along. That was the exciting thing about working with him. You were actually discovering it along with him. He was so multi-talented. He could juggle four or five creative elements simultaneously, and they'd all come out brilliantly. Vivian's prestigious productivity on Stinkfoot sheds light on what a sober, empowered Vivian Stanchel was capable of. Gone for one twinkling were all the barriers, the drinking, the depression, and the grand self-pity. 
For this one fleeting moment in his life the veil was lifted, and Vivian Stanchel, the artist, was truly revealed. For those fortunate enough to witness the unhindered genius, both the glorious memory of his astonishing fertile mind and the bittersweet question of what if remain, Kai remembers. I guess that was one of those sustained moments in Vivian's life where he was truly happy and was working, and he had at his command a stage and musicians and people. If he'd had that all the time, I mean the man was a monster. In other circumstances, with a little bit of success financially here and there, if he had been in the position of the Beatles, say, the world would be a vastly better place for the things he would have given it. It was a mixed blessing to really see him work, because it showed me what he wasn't able to do as well as what he was able to do. The feeling of magic and creativity was infectious. Believing so much in Vivian, believing in the ship, and believing in Stinkfoot, the cast and crew thrust themselves selflessly into the project. The requisite egos and negative tensions which normally haunt the stage were non-existent. Everyone worked together towards the same artistic end. Mark Milmore comments, The project was far more than any of the individuals involved. Maybe when we went home we picked up on our egos. It was like you were leapfrogging over problems that defeat the creative successes. Behind the scenes, the inventive and creative Kai planned for the ultimate blowout. The ship had seen a wild lot in the past couple of years, and Kai knew it was time to put it all to an end. If not for the artistic sake of the ship, but for the sake of her own mental health, Stinkfoot would provide the ultimate creative climax and the perfect goodbye to one hell of an artistic good time. Kai put every penny of the ship's earnings, which should have normally gone towards the bills, into Stinkfoot, expecting to receive nothing in return. Additionally, all returns were promised to the cast. None of the profits would go back into the ship. If things went as planned, the old profanity showboat would go bankrupt and the ship would go belly up. We would be required to close, basically, explains Kai. The ship would no longer be able to pay its bills because I had spent all of the money on the musical. So I charged top-whack prices, thinking this would keep people away. I didn't expect anyone to come. We put it on for two weeks at our most lucrative time. The only time we ever made any real money was in the Christmas season, and I didn't book anything but my own show. This was a nice formula for failure or losing the ship. But they came. Rather, they came in droves. They came from all over Europe. They flew in from America. They clamored for tickets and didn't mind shelling out the bread for Kai's top whack prices. Stinkfoot played to sold-out crowds night after night. And when the seats in the ship's long bowels grew full, spirited spectators simply copped a squat on the floor. Not only did audiences relish Stinkfoot, the production won high praise from the press as well. The Bristol Evening Post raved, with a comic talent like Vivian Stanchel behind words, music, conception, direction, and even hair design, this has got to be something special. And it is. The plot may well verge on the incomprehensible and the continuity scarcely exist, but Stinkfoot is a joy, a wondrous collection of bizarre characters, eccentric ideas, and at least one top ten contender amongst the songs. The Guardian, too, applauded. The ideas spill out of him, pastiche and surreal, visual jokes and new songs by the conveyor belt. Several are infinitely better than most of what masquerades as top twenty material these days. Who are we to complain if the sheer output obscures the narrative and the shape? It isn't always easy to share his wavelength. The production would probably have gained from a more detached view, and with it some restructuring and editing, but the marvel is that here is an original, unusual musical smelling of the sea salt, with Coward, Cagney, and Mae West around to keep us happily buoyant. The Times went even further, calling for Stinkfoot to be seen in London on dry land at a larger venue. Amongst the cast individually singled out for their outstanding work were Andy Blackis, Sequisto, Pete Coggins as Isaiah the Flounder, Cindy Stratton's Budget Agar, John Beadle as Screwy, Nicky B. as Persian Maul, and Steve Howe as Stinkfoot. The financial and critical success of Stinkfoot proved Vivian Stanchel still had the goods. Anyone close to Viv would have known this already, however too many had come to see him as the drunk and melancholy slip of a man haunting the BBC's showboat documentary. 
Needless to say, the planned demise of the ship was a failure, and the old showboat would live to see many more days. Still, Viv and Kai were exhausted and needed time away from the showboat. Their chance came in January, when David Rappaport left for Los Angeles to take a starring role in the television series The Wizard and needed someone to take care of his home in Bristol. Vivian and Kai jumped at the opportunity to become house-sitters and commuters. Stanchel then immersed himself in the career of Nicky B., who, as Stinkfoot's Persian Mall, had amassed a great deal of critical attention. In her stellar blues voice and striking stage presence, Vivian saw an excellent opportunity to get his own music to a wider audience. He was constantly expected to produce eccentric and humorous compositions. But perhaps if he were not the performer, his serious musical pieces would have a chance. So Nicky moved her piano into the Rappaport's house, and the rehearsals began. Stanchel helped Nicky hone her voice and presentation, and worked diligently on new material. Up until then, Nicky had only performed covers, and wished to have a full set of originals. To further promote the project, Kai arranged a showcase of six floating concerts aboard the boat throughout the month of February— Often featuring such major acts as the House Martins, the series gathered a great amount of exposure and helped sharpen Nikki's live chops. The reviews of her shows echoed the accolades of her performance in Stinkfoot. Subsequently, Stancho received praise for both his work as Nikki's mentor and for his original compositions. After Nikki's successful concerts, Vivian took her to Steve Winwood's studios to work on some ideas. He then shopped Nikki to several record companies, hoping to generate interest in both Nikki and his own music. In a May 24th letter to author Jeffrey Giuliano, Stanchel relayed the news of his recent rediscovery. Now that more people in the business believe me to be not only still alive but capable of work, I am in unaccustomed demand. The address on the letterhead read, the still standing house. Although Nikki's predicted meteoric rise never came to fruition, she would gradually carve out a successful musical career and currently fronts the popular group Never the Bride. In July 1986, Steve Winwood released the album Back in the High Life, featuring Vivian's My Love's Leaving. The song's stark, plaintive lyrics articulate both Vivian's personal unhappiness and his intense love for Kai during his days alone aboard Searchlight. Back in the High Life proved to be extremely successful for Winwood, producing the top ten hits, Higher Love, and Back in the High Life. Later that year, the album took the Grammy for Record of the Year. The album's enormous success provided Stancha with further artistic recognition and much-needed royalty checks. Back on board, the non-stop work of running the old profanity and taking care of Vivian finally caught up to Kai. In August, she collapsed from nervous exhaustion. Realizing she was physically and mentally incapable of taking care of both herself and Vivian, she asked Viv to leave until she became well again. He obliged and returned to London, where, with the help of his ex-wife Monica, he took up residency in a small bedsit in Muswell Hill. Much has been written and many stories have been told about Vivian's Muswell Hill digs and the madness and creative clutter strewn within its small walls. As with his previous homes, Stanchel's bedsit spoke volumes about the man it housed. Those daring to take a visit would witness Vivian holding forth amongst ukuleles, a starter pistol, miscellaneous horns of different shapes and sizes, gold and platinum discs, mainly stemming from his work with Winwood, books on just about any obscure subject that might pop into your noodle, works of Vivian's art in various states of unfinish, a large menacing dagger, no doubt to keep pesky journalists in line, a prosthetic leg, and, of course, scads of wet rot. If you were to ring Vivian while he was out or unable to come to the phone, you might hear the following message. I'm working at the moment, so I'm ignoring the phone. But I won't ignore you if you leave a jolly message. And if you're going to say anything filthy, please speak clearly. Shortly after Vivian moved into Muswell Hill, an ad agency contacted him with the idea to rework Terry Keeps His Clips On as a jingle for Toshiba. He thought the idea was rather clever and decided to give it a go. Pete Moss was enlisted as producer, and the sessions went well. To stop those wasps and creepy crofties crawling up your trousers became You Don't Want Hisses and Fuzzy Buzzes Crawling Up Your Ears. The commercial was a hit. Its success led to a nomination for a prestigious Sony Award. With the success of the Toshiba ad came another offer from the Cadbury Company, 
The idea was to sing Mr. Cadbury's Parrot to the tune of Mr. Slater's Parrot for a television commercial pitching Cadbury mini-eggs. Vivian accepted the offer and once again called upon musical director extraordinaire Pete Moss to help him put the project together. Sadly, when the time came for the recording of the jingle, Vivian had fallen so deep into drink that he had been temporarily committed. He was in no shape to sing, and the session was a wash. I tried to get him to sing it, and he just couldn't, explains Pete moss he had no idea what was going on they wanted to drop him and i said no 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 no. give him a chance by in time pete finished up the backing tracks and recorded a dummy vocal of it himself singing the tune for those of you familiar with the jingle pete's voice can still be heard introducing the piece but when the time came for vivian to perform the vocals they were unable to get him out of the hospital losing patience the agency hired a new singer to do the spot Although Stanchel's replacement had the vocal chops, the tune never really came together properly, and luckily for Vivian, the agency deemed the end results unsatisfactory. Pete, always a loyal friend to Vivian, persisted in his support and finally managed to convince the agency to give Viv one last chance. We finally got him out, and the third time was indeed the charm. He did do it, but he didn't do it very well, I have to be honest. It wasn't quite as successful as the Toshiba thing. It was a very, very sad time. Though the jingle may not have reached the standards of Stanchel's inspired performance for Toshiba, the ad came together well, and in 1988 the UK was introduced to Mr. Cadbury's parrot, who has now become quite a cult star in his own right. In October of 1987, Steve Winwood released a Greatest Hits compilation entitled Chronicles. Of the ten tracks that appeared in the collection, three, Vacant Chair, My Love's Leavin', and Ark of a Diver, were collaborations with Vivian, which, in Viv's words, is not so bad. Vivian's productive momentum continued. After nearly a decade, Viv returned to the BBC studios on February 23, 1988, to record yet another segment for The John Peel Show. The episode, entitled Rawlinson and the Crackpot at the End of the Rainbow, aired April 18, 1988. Amongst those recruited to join Vivian on air was his right-hand man, Pete Moss, and violinist Dave Swarbrick of Fairport Convention. Viv's return to the airwaves was warmly welcomed and well-received. He returned to the studio on August 9th to record another segment for the John Peel Show entitled The Eating at Rawlinson End which aired on November 23, 1988. Amongst the memorable passages included, In the blue wardrobe of heaven there are many unused clothes, too tight-fitting, yet too beautiful to throw away. And in that wardrobe we hang our likenesses, yellow diaries, yellowed with yesterday, thumbs smeared with tomorrow. But the now, the present, like the hollow screech of flamingos in search of shrimps, is still vibrantly, shockingly pink. Adding to Stanchel's resurrection was the video release of Sir Henry at Rawlinson End on November 7, 1988. The film, which had already gained a considerable following, had by now blown up into a true cult classic. Still, Vivian remained critical of his work. I was extremely disappointed with the film, he confessed. Although my work may appear even now to ramble, it's actually quite structured, but the film was disordered. In surreal work, it's most important to have, and to be seen to have, a coherent structure. Otherwise, the average person will have nothing to measure it against. Ultimately, the television commercials, radio appearances, and the release of Sir Henry on video paled in comparison to Vivian's major undertaking of 1988. In the spring of 88, Vivian was given a chance to bring Stinkfoot onto dry land and into London. A commercial producer had offered to rent London's Bloomsbury Theatre and finance the show, but by early summer these plans had fallen through. The producer did not, however, abandon Vivian as had others in the past. Instead, he introduced him to Andy Arnold, who at the time was the director of London's Bloomsbury Theatre. Stanchel had been a hero of Arnold's from a very young age, so when he heard Vivian wish to bring Stinkfoot to London, he was happy to accommodate him. Nevertheless, Andy, after reading the script and watching the Bristol performance on video, was still indeed very keen to do the show and offered Stanchel the opportunity to put Stinkfoot on at the Bloomsbury. Vivian happily agreed, and Stinkfoot was slated for a two-week run from December 12th to the 31st. 
Stuncher recognized the significance of the opportunity. If Stinkfoot had a successful run in London, it could lead to many new opportunities. If Stinkfoot is even marginally successful, if it breaks even, or if it makes money for someone, I can probably get more adventurous, he remarked at the time. Not that I'm saying that Stinkfoot was particularly unadventurous. Would there be any changes in the production? Yes, I've cut an hour and a half, Vivian explained. I suppose you could say that that's a change. Sadly, the Bloomsbury production of Stinkfoot would never approach the magic of the production aboard the old profanity. From the beginning, the show was wrought with problems. First came the decision to have Stanchel and Andy Arnold share directing responsibilities, which only led to a great deal of confusion and miscommunication. The problem was he wasn't in rehearsals every day, and his concept of it was something in his own head, and he often didn't explain that to me properly, explains Arnold. So I would explain something in a particular way to the actors and so on, then he'd turn up the next day and say, no, you've got it all wrong. Then suddenly you're not in control of it, you're trying to second-guess something rather than positively going forward with your own vision of something. There were also significant problems with the musical direction. Stanchel once again called upon the dot man, Pete Moss, who agreed to come down and whip the band, a nine-piece troupe of buskers, into shape. The trouble was that there was no actual musical director for the singers, Vivian sometimes brought his ukulele to rehearsal and take the cast through the tunes, but most of the time the cast was struggling to work from a taped recording of the first production. "'Who is taking care of the singers?' asked Moss, with understandable frustration. "'Well, um, the singers,' replied Vivian. "'Yes, well, Vivian, but it doesn't quite work like that, does it? I mean, somebody has got to rehearse them.' Undeterred, Moss did what he could to help the cast with the songs." Vivian always had this thing about spontaneity and character, he recalls. His attitude was, you don't want to iron the character out of the part. And I would say to him, well, that's all very well, but they have to know what they're going to do in the first place. Afterwards, I'd sort of side up to the singers and say, any problems? They'd always look at me, roll their eyes up at the ceiling and say, I don't know what we're doing. Then I'd give them copies of the basic notes I'd given to the band, and we'd run through it together. I used to try and work it out like that very quietly, so Vivian thought the character and the input was still there from his side. Throwing a more humorous wrench into the works was the arrival of the costumes, which turned out to be surprisingly homoerotic. "'Where's the costume maker?' demanded Vivian. "'His boyfriend has just died, and he's gone to his funeral,' explained one cast member." "'I won't have dead boyfriends in the wardrobe,' boomed Vivian. "'Officers must not wear lipstick whilst dancing together.' The set, too, caused its share of problems. Stanchel, who designed the set, planned for a ramp that was too steep for the actors to properly stand on. It was an absolute nightmare, remembers Arnold. We had to, on the day of the show, suddenly clawed bits of rubber onto people's shoes so they wouldn't slip off the goddamn stage, or, as Vivian put it, we spent a lot of time putting stick soles on their shoes. Such difficulties began to weigh heavily on Stinkfoot, and the cast soon became extremely frustrated with the entire production. Andy recalls, to be honest, all of their anger they vented on me rather than Vivian, maybe because they regarded Vivian as an eccentric genius and they were expecting me as the director to really hold the ship down, as it were. I think I relied on him and I lost my way in so doing. I think the lack of experience on my part, then, I mean, I wouldn't have gone into it on that basis, co-directors. I became the fall guy, in a sense, because all the frustrations of not having the score there, of the whole thing not being tight enough, the set being crazy, not being able to give a clear enough indication to the performers of what they're after, it all became very exasperating. They still maintained their affection for Vivian, but the show became a bit of a chore, really. When asked if the cast were keeping a good heart, Stanchel replied, "'Apart from a great many tears and a number of suicide notes dotted around the dressing rooms, I suppose they are.' Through it all, Vivian, Andy, and the cast tried their best to hold it together and have a good time. After all, wasn't that one of Stinkfoot's major themes? "'It's all about dealing with the horror of being gloomy,' explained Vivian. "'It's a celebration of life. It's great fun. It would have to be, as we're all on sixty quid a week.' Indeed, Stinkfoot, which was terribly underfunded to begin with, was running into major financial problems. 
Stanchel, in an effort to secure extra funding, decided to call on some of his more financially successful friends about contributing a thousand pounds or so to the project. He first turned to old friend Steve Winwood, who was performing in London at the time. Approaching Steve backstage at the show, Vivian chatted with him briefly, but Winwood wasn't at all interested. He then rang the office of another friend and supporter, Pete Townsend, who happily replied with a check for a thousand quid. Hoping to secure additional funding, Stanchel turned to Stephen Fry. Fry had always been an admirer of Vivian, or Sir Viv, as his worshippers called him. In his 1997 autobiography, Fry lauds Vivian as one of the most talented, profligate, bizarre, absurd, infuriating, unfathomable, and magnificent Englishman ever to have drawn breath. Needless to say, when approached by Vivian, he was more than happy to cough up some well-needed pounds for his comic hero. As a further show of his support, he quietly attended a couple of the rehearsals in addition to seeing the show twice. It's a marvelous piece, Fry stated at the time. I've worshipped Viv from afar for years, and so I couldn't believe it when I got the opportunity to be associated with him, albeit as a sleeping partner. I think he's a unique and inspired comic genius, he later remarked. Where I'm concerned, it's a simple case of old-fashioned hero worship. Sadly, the generous donations provided by Fry and Townsend did little to help save Stinkfoot. The already overwhelming chaos continued right up until the curtain came up. Artist and friend Mark Milmore, who originally came on as a scenic artist, but ended up doing all the design work by himself after the original designer reportedly drank herself into a nervous breakdown, spent the last week before opening night working 24 hours a day to finish up the sets. I remember the very last night before the curtain went up, ten minutes before the curtain went up, still painting one of the flats, laughed Mark. I think some of the flats were actually wet on the first night. Andy Arnold also recalls the last-minute chaos. We were due to open the show at eight o'clock, and we had a full house of people waiting in the foyer with the doors of the theatre closed. We finished our dressed rehearsal at a quarter past eight. Then the actors rushed off stage, exhausted and panicking, and then we let the audience in, and ten minutes later we started the actual show. Vivian and I went into the bar and had a few drinks. Stinkfoot ran for its scheduled two weeks. On the whole, the 550 seats of the Bloomsbury went half full and the theatre lost money. Reactions from the audiences were mixed. Some left the Bloomsbury invigorated. Some were simply nonplussed. Some left after the first act. Critics generally enjoyed the production, though most were honest in pointing out its low points. Mark Steen of The Independent wrote, By the finale, whose lyric in total is bugger off, frequently repeated, most of us were reluctant to go. The show will undoubtedly leave many people cold, but if you stick with it, it's both entertaining and moving. For Stanchel, the show was an enormous letdown. His hopes for even a marginally successful run of Stinkfoot, which would have brought the artistic and financial liberties to truly test the bounds of his work, had gone unrealized. Stinkfoot's failure had a profound emotional effect on the already unsteady Stanchel. Though, as always, he bravely accepted the criticism of his work. I'll never forget how courageous he was, remembers Kai. He never did what the ordinary person would do. Maybe even what I myself would do, which is stand in front of the media and find reasons why it wasn't his fault. It was horrible. It was badly done. And he never denied it. You know what I mean when I say he never denied it. Like saying one denies his own son, he took it on the chin. That kind of moral fiber and artistic fiber, that impressed me very much. It also broke my fucking heart. For Andy Arnold, Stinkfoot was also a tremendous disappointment and nearly drove him to quit the business. I actually almost gave up theater directing as a result of that, admits Andy. It was ridiculous, actually, because I loved the piece. I loved the music, but I hated the production so much. It became so stressful I wanted to walk away from it and walk away from that theatre. Andy, now the theatre director of the singular Arches in Glasgow, still firmly loves and believes in Stinkfoot and has tried unsuccessfully to get permissions to revive the piece. He is not alone. Many artists and fans would like to see this extraordinary piece of work Chapter 12 Bouts of Sobriety 
Last words, 1990-1994. Vivian stepped up to the microphone and, in a deep, menacing tone, began to slowly recite, Men wanted for hazardous journey. Men wanted for hazardous journey. What are you doing? What is all of this? exclaimed Pete Moss. Shackleton, replied Stanchel. Indeed it was, Sir Ernest Shackleton. It was the text of the famous, though probably apocryphal, ad the explorer was said to have placed in several London newspapers. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. 1990 was a year of celebration for Glasgow, as the city was designated the European City of Culture, when Andy Arnold was asked to produce a street theater promenade of historical moments in Glasgow history, he turned to Stanchel to provide the music for the different vignettes. Vivian happily obliged, finding a great deal of enjoyment in the unique historical elements of the project. He did some lovely stuff, remembers Arnold. The most bizarre invention was on Ernest Shackleton's expedition to the Antarctic at the turn of the century. I gave him some historical notes and background material. This included a copy of an advert Shackleton placed in the Times. Viv made this into a song. Stanchel's enthusiasm for such a project comes as no surprise. He had always been particularly interested in the histories of various explorers, and was especially fond of the lives of men such as Sir Richard Burton and Ernest Shackleton. Arnold was able to incorporate most of Stanchel's contributions into his sketches, but unfortunately one of the tunes which had to be cut was the wonderful Shackleton piece. Stanchel entered the new decade creatively, but he'd begun it very much alone. Kai and Silky moved back to the States, returning to England only intermittently for brief visits. The separated couple did manage to carry on some semblance of a relationship by phone, and Viv often mailed art, postcards, and other bits and pieces to Silky. This, however, was nowhere near enough for the often dependent and increasingly lonely artist. Remarkably, he even went so far as signing up with a dating agency— he had two meetings that, as writer Robert Chalmers so eloquently stated, many who knew him would have given anything to have witnessed, if only to discover what kind of a partner a computer allots to a man who keeps his father's false teeth superglued to the breadboard. In July, the New Music Express released The Last Temptation of Elvis. This two-disc, celebrity-soaked compilation released in support of Nordoff Robbins' music therapy consisted of covers celebrating the King's not-so-golden Hollywood years, even in the company of tracks provided by such diverse heavies as Paul McCartney, The Pogues, and Aaron Neville. It was Vivian's loony rendition of There's No Room to Rumba in a Sports Car that stole the show. David Frick of Rolling Stone aptly noted that Vivian and the Big Boys created the real fun on the album, rendering his cover with hilarious Monty Python-esque panache. The moniker of Big Boys Stanchel had given to his backup band was telling. The success of There's No Room to Rumba added to a growing desire within Stanchel to return to the stage, not as he had with Stinkfoot, mind you, but as he had in his early years as a menacing rock and roll frontman. He still desired to prove himself as a showman, to be one of the big boys at last. He felt perhaps it was his final chance. Fast approaching his forty-eighth birthday, Stancho realized his hip-swinging, gold lame days were numbered. Kai remembers. He despaired that he hadn't used his talents properly all of these years, that he had hidden in an alcohol fuzz and drug-riddled angst. He felt that his youth had passed him by, and he had no more time to do the kinds of things a young man would do. He still felt he was like a young man, you know, because he missed middle age having spent it in an altered state. He really wanted to live. He wanted to do all of the things he should have done earlier. He felt time was running out for him, by which I don't mean he thought he was going to die soon, but in terms of being in rock and roll. He was getting to be a very old man, and if he wanted to do things he always wanted and spend twenty years blowing it by drinking and pills, well, he'd better do it now. 
In an effort to stage such a comeback, Stanchel arranged a series of six performances entitled Rawlinson Dog Ends at the Bloomsbury Theatre from the 9th to the 14th of April 1991. His backing band was composed of old friends Pete Moss, Dave Swarbrick, and Jack Bruce of Cream, all of whom Vivian managed to hire for only fifty quid a night. That is, except for Bruce, who decided he'd waive his fee altogether and do the gig for expenses. This made Viv very happy indeed. However, when Bruce showed up to rehearse on the day of the show and wanted a couple of hundred quid for the night, Stanchel became outraged. Bruce stormed out after the first performance, and he did not return. Bruce's departure wasn't the show's first mishap. The afternoon rehearsal prior to the premiere had been awash with confusion. Stanchel's band tried to tighten up the music, but ended up in a row. Subsequently, opening night went down terribly. A 48-track mobile studio had been brought in to record the show, but the tapes were all but useless. In an effort to save the remaining gigs, Pete Moss was once again asked to step up as musical director. He remembers... I ended up for the rest of the week playing bass for Jack and standing in front and MDing everybody. And it really got good. By Thursday night, it was a cracking show. I think Thursday night was one of the best shows Vivian had ever done, period. It really, really worked out well. Stanchel fans were eager to witness his return. He and his band played to full houses on all six nights. Enthused by his success, Vivian immediately began plans to take the show on the road for a brief tour. Convincing the musicians to continue to perform, however, wasn't quite so easy. For the Bloomsbury gigs, the band had generously agreed to perform for fifty quid a week under the condition that they'd be paid in cash by Friday night. When Friday's show ended and the boys hadn't seen any cash, Moss was elected to talk to Stanchel about getting their pay by Sunday night. Pete approached Vivian, who replied, "'Don't worry, old boy. I'll go to the building society Saturday morning.' When Sunday evening came, Stanchel still hadn't gotten the money. The band was furious and again turned to Pete for help. They came to Pete as an old chum of Vivian's, remembers Kai. They all came to Pete and pleaded their case. "'Could you get Vivian to pay us, please?' So Pete had to go to Vivian and stand over him and make him write the checks out to these people." I really had a problem with that, remembers Moss. We had a sort of parting of the ways after that, I have to say. This is why, when he was trying to get the group up, he did phone me up at one point, but I never got so closely involved again. Quite a lot of the others, too, shied away, because they're not going to go out on the road and not get paid. This was a problem that Vivian did have with money. He was cheap, agrees Kai. He was mean with money. Still, Vivian did manage to round up an impressive band to take out on the road for a short tour and various gigs over the next couple of years. The personnel included violinist Susie Honeyman of the Meekins, Rodney Slater, and John Beadle, who'd starred in Stinkfoot on piano. The shows were very successful, a sober stanchial performing in top form. It was the first time I performed sober. I was paralyzed with nerves, he admitted at the time. It was a bit of sauce because I extemporized wildly. In effect, I was saying, come along, give me six quid, and I've no idea what's going to happen. However, I received an embarrassingly laudatory review, and after the concert in Manchester, a woman of eighty-seven sent me a frankly lewd note written on a seed catalogue. I came home expecting the phone to be jammed with offers. Unfortunately, there were none. It was an enormous letdown for Stanchel, who considered these performances his last stab at the big time. He'd worked so hard and gained so much momentum, only to be left with nothing but disheartenment. He thought something would happen, that he would get a record contract, something, remembers Kai, that because of the reviews, and he was seen to be publicly functioning on stage, the music offers would start pouring in. He was just gobsmacked. He had spent his own money to do this tour, and nothing happened. Over the past years, Stanchel had shown a remarkable ability to recover from blows that might normally have sent him headlong into depression. Given time, he might have completely rebounded from the failure of this tour as well. But this was not to be. Vivian had watched many of his closest friends die young. Dennis Cowan, Keith Moon, John Lennon, David Rappaport who had committed suicide in California in 1990. 
In the spring of 1991, he lost the one person that he couldn't afford to lose. Not yet. Just months after he completed his successful Rawlinson dog ends at the Bloomsbury, his father Vic passed away after a battle with liver cancer. Vivian was a complete and utter emotional wreck. I remember taking him down to father's funeral, recalls younger brother Mark. I collected him in the car, and he got in with a half a bottle of brandy. This at ten o'clock in the morning, but Vivian was pissed out of his mind. Pete Moss, too, recalls his friend's state of mind and a rather telling gesture. I remember he was very, very cut up about his father's death. I think he paid me the ultimate compliment in a strange way. He tried to give me his father's shoes, which I couldn't bear to take. Anyway, I wouldn't have done it in a million years. They weren't even my size. Later that year, Vivian recounted his youth in an autobiographical playlet produced for the late show entitled Crank. Backed again by his touring Dog Ends band, Vivian delivered an honest, revealing monologue punctuated with intermittent musical numbers. He described his childhood, his dissatisfaction with the Catholic Church, and even directly addressed his broken relationship with his father. I was downright terrified of my father. I still am, and he's been dead for more than a year. Everything I did was a disappointment, and everything I didn't do, sport, math and so on, was unnatural because he could do it. And when it became clear to him that I was incorrigibly to become one of them, that is to say an artist of some sort, he disowned me. He even refused to hold my hand after the age of five. It was the beginning of the beginning. Adding a wry touch of humor, he further quipped, Meanwhile, my father spent the last twenty years of his life vigorously watching television. Tragically, Vivian's broken relationship with his estranged father would never be mended. Kai recalls, He was still trying to please his father until the day he died. He went to the hospital, and his father's parting words to Vivian were, You do realize that I never liked you. It was almost one of the last things Vivian had to endure on this earth, and I am convinced it went a long way to taking out what little heart he had left to continue to exist. All his life he hoped his dad might see him, really see him, and by this to perhaps have the old man acknowledge his right to live. But it never happened. And by dying, and by going to see him in the hospital in the last days, Viv knew that it never would. It broke his heart. As Stanchel lay wounded from both the loss of his father and the failure to land a record deal, a ray of opportunity sprung from the not-so-distant past. A condensed Bonzo Dog Band reunion in 1987 had resulted in the song No Matter Who You Vote For, The Government Always Gets In, Hey Ho. Gus Dudgeon had produced the track, which featured all of the principal Bonzos, Stanchel, Innes, Slater, Smith, and Spear. They intended to release the song in conjunction with the 1987 general election, but complications had led to the project being shelved. Now, five years later, the Bonzos' first new single in nearly two decades was finally seeing the light of day with a release on China Records. The reggae-inspired tune was Neil's brainchild, though Viv does share writing credits for his lyrical contributions. The release should have done much to lift Stanchel's spirits, but overall the experience was a letdown. He was quite happy with the song itself, but utterly disappointed with the final mix. Evidently, the mix Vivian left the studio with differed greatly from what was finally released. In addition to his verses, Viv also provided a clever growling bit, both in the background and over the fade-out. These contributions were either mixed down or taken out completely, as Kai recalls. Vivian took home his mix, which we have a copy of, but when he left, unbeknownst to him, Neil stayed and pushed all of his stuff to the background, even against Gus Dudgeon's advice. So it came out his normal twee little Neil thing. Stancha was hurt. He sincerely felt the bits he added to the track would have given the single a better chance at becoming a hit, which unfortunately it was not. Stanchel's moments of sobriety were again becoming fewer and fewer, his behavior more and more erratic. Stanchel's moments of sobriety were again becoming fewer and fewer, his behavior more and more erratic.
In the summer of 1992, Stanchel disappeared for an unplanned holiday in Sicily. Vivian had always been very reluctant to travel by plane, but one morning he simply walked out of his Muswell Hill bedsit, boarded a plane, and flew south. Upon arrival, he checked into a hotel where he spent the next three weeks drinking heavily and chatting up the owner. Somewhere along the way, he became utterly convinced his host was the head of the local mafia. Furthermore, he believed that because this man was giving him the royal treatment, that he had somehow become a made man, remembers Kai. Vivian was convinced to the end of his life that he was a made man because the hotel owner was the head of the local mafia and all of Sicily, and he was very, very proud of this being a made man. Regardless of what really happened, until the end of his days, Vivian often talked about returning to Sicily, where he was respected a made man. Shortly after he returned from Sicily, Stanchel's substance abuse entered a more destructive phase, taking its toll on his professional life. In September of 1992, Mike Oldfield released Tubular Bells II, a sequel to his massively successful landmark 1973 album. This time around, actor Richard Rickman provided his voice as the master of ceremonies. Vivian's absence was immediately noticed and questioned by fans of both Stanchel and Oldfield alike. Oldfield indicated that Rickman's participation was nearly a change in creative direction. However, in Mark Allen's article, The Sweet Essence of Giraffe, producer Tom Newman explained that Stanchel had actually been slated for the part and revealed the reason why he ended up not appearing on the album. We had the studio booked. Everyone was standing by, and I went to collect him from his flat in Muswell Hill. I banged on his door, hung around. No answer. And then I got worried that he'd done something to himself in the night, and I was banging on the door wondering if I should call the police. Eventually, this feeble little voice came down the intercom thing, and he pressed the buzzer. He was in such a state it was unbelievable. He'd gotten completely drunk and fallen down into the bath, knocking a load of potted plants in with him. So he'd gone to bed covered in this potting compost, but he was so utterly knackered he didn't realize it. He was covered in this shit, lying there in the bed. I managed to get him dressed. Then he fell asleep again, and I just couldn't wake him. Gone. Dead to the world. And that's why he wasn't on Tubular Bells too. Tubular Bells too was an enormous missed opportunity that speaks volumes of Viv's savage addictions. Despite Vivian's determination to make a comeback, he'd reached such a point where he couldn't really curb his drinking and Valium intake, even enough to participate in a highly publicized and eagerly anticipated project such as Tubular Bells 2. He did, however, appear in a video for the track The Bell. Here, miraculously in top form, Vivian introduced Oldfield's instruments for the last time. After years of brief visits, Kai returned finally to London in January of 1993 and moved in with Stanchel. It was a mutual attempt to give their relationship one more chance. They even began searching for a new flat in Hampstead. This was mainly due to Kai's urging. She was constantly warning Vivian that his small bedsit was a fire trap. Throughout what would become only six short months together with Kai, Vivian managed to curb his drinking and remain sober. In turn, he grew increasingly productive. While offers might not have been coming in from the music industry, he was approached by an ad agency about reviving the Rawlinsons for Ruddle's bitter television advert. When Stanchel arrived at the agency, he found their idea a tad daft and began rewriting their ad campaign off the top of his head. The head of the agency was blown away and immediately hired Vivian on as the advertiser for the whole production, which he wrote entirely himself. Vivian had a great amount of experience doing voiceover work, but this was his first opportunity to create an ad himself, on top of which he was also giving a starring role, another first. Stanchel faithfully poured all of his energy into the campaign and even admitted a slight fascination with the world of advertising. It seemed a bit odd, those meetings, sitting around a table being served coffee by pretty women, says Vivian, but the manipulative process greatly interested me. I've always much admired Gobbles. Not for what he said, of course, but for the way he said it. My God, it would be some agency if he ran one. 
The campaign was coming together brilliantly, and a buzz began to grow around London. T-shirts printed up for the campaign were popping up in local boutiques, and comedian Don French signed on to appear in the spot. With Stanchel at the helm, the campaign was turning out to be no ordinary ad. It was shaping into a short, surreal work of art. To all involved, Stanchel seemed to have it completely together. In reality, he was coming apart at the seams. As the project grew closer to fruition, he was growing more and more terrified that the finished product wouldn't be quite good enough. It was the same recurring primary fear that drove his perfectionism and blinded him to the value of his art. One evening, while on his way home from work, Stanchel decided to pop into the Centaur Gallery, the location of Vivian and Kai's first outing together. Vivian spent the entire evening visiting with an old friend, chatting about art. When he was offered a glass of wine, Vivian accepted. His last period of sobriety had ended. Kai remembers. He arrived home that evening and poured out of the cab. He'd been sober, and everything was cooking for him, and here he comes again. I watched him get out of the cab, and I knew it. He came up the stairs, and that evening, for the first time, he told me what he really thought about all that he'd done and all which he had created. He felt like a total failure. Nothing meant anything to him, because what he was was a painter. That all of the rest of it was fruit, veg, and frou-frou. It was so easy. He wasn't afraid of it. He consistently chose to do it because people applauded him. People called him a genius. But he avoided what he knew to be his real calling, which was painting. That was partly what was eating him up all those years. He was frightened at not being good enough at the one thing he valued, which was painting. And that evening he recognized that and ran for the bottle. All the stuff was coming back to him, all the business. He was standing there sober for months and months, and then he would make a decision to change all of that. That decision was made, the one that slid him right into death, started in June of 1993. A few days later, Stanchel reaffirmed his return to the bottle. He and Kai had gone out to a restaurant for dinner. When the waiter arrived, Viv calmly ordered a glass of wine. I couldn't fucking believe it, remembers Kai. There was always the idea, always the pretense, that I've been so good for so long I've had nothing to drink that I can now control it. I can be like other people. I can have a couple of drinks every once in a while. But he knew, and I knew, that that wasn't true. He simply could not drink at all, ever. And by ordering that, we had gone through so much now, so many years, eighteen years, right, that by ordering that single drink at the restaurant, it was almost like, I give up. I can't do this anymore. I can't be sober. And I was saying to him, I can't be with you if you're not sober. You understand that, right? But I had such sympathy for him by then because I knew that I was asking too much of him to be sober. It was more than he could bear. It was more than his life was worth. His life was unbearable without the numbness that would come from the alcohol because he was defenseless without it. It took me a long, long time to learn that. It broke her heart, but Kai knew it was time to return to the States. The last time she saw her husband alive, he was headed to the off-license. Meanwhile, the Ruddles' campaign was nearing completion. All that was left was the final voiceover, but Stanchel was drinking again. He was on the verge of blowing it, but managed to pull himself together long enough to see it through. The campaign was an instant success. Stanchel, of course, was abundantly proud. Though only thirty-odd seconds in length, you can get the sense of what might have perhaps come out of a Sir Henry film if given more time and a suitable budget. Based around the familiar milieu of the Rawlinson dinner table, the ad is brilliant. Stanchel's rich, syrupy narration is a wonderful bit of nonsense about Malcolm the Porcupine, who grew to Humpty of Ruttles, which he dumped in puddles and licked up whenever it snowed. The melodic lilt of Vivian's voice and the richness of his words transcended anything remotely like an ordinary television commercial. One wishes that he'd written the children's books which he'd often planned. 
and he certainly had the requisite sense of wonder to pull it off. The classic spot is now truly a feast for the eyes and ears. The following summer a lonely and frail Stanchel lived on and off with his mother in her tiny bungalow in Leon Sea. Of course life with Mum wasn't without its hardships. I had to endure the floral carpet, the floral postery, and the floral wallpaper, laughed Vivian at the time. Truth be known, it was no laughing matter. Viv was putting a great deal of strain on his mum. Aline Stanchel was in her eighties now, and hardly in any shape to take care of her eldest son. Mark Stanchel remembers. He came down to stay for two or three months, but my mother never told me. She knew that I would come down and throw him out. He was just wearing her out. He was a great worry, you know. My mother, who was then eighty, was running around looking after him. Meanwhile, he's hiding half-bottles of vodka here and there and dropping things in the floor. After returning to his Muswell Hill bedsit, Stanchel's dependence on his mother continued as he'd phone her at least twice a day. He was, however, estranged from his kid brother, Mark. Well, it wasn't really a relationship, explains Mark. It was a sort of sibling rivalry. It's a shame, really, because you only get one brother or sister, and you should really make the most of it. So often it's true that we don't. Kai, too, recalls the strained relations between Vivian and Mark. He had no time for his brother. God damn it, he was not generous towards other people's weaknesses. He was not. He admired talent. I do, too. So I understand this dreadful human weakness. He admired talent, and he had all the time in the world for talent and gifts, but no time for human weakness. And his brother exhibited human weakness all the time, especially in Vivian's presence, and Vivian wouldn't tolerate it. Vivian was and is intolerant. It was based on intolerance and impatience with his brother's pain, and his brother was in pain. Perhaps it was because Vivian himself was in so much personal pain that other people seemed minuscule by comparison. Pushed away by Vivian's self-absorbed behavior, Mark hardly ever saw his brother in the final years of his life. I think I only met one person who was more completely self-centered than he was, explains Mark. I mean, if you ever had the misfortune of calling him on the telephone, or he rang you and said, Hi, how are you? He'd start with, Oh, I'm not so good, and you might have gone and made a cup of tea, because five minutes later he'd still be talking about himself. They always say that people who are rather clever are rather selfish, and that's the way they keep it together. You see, I made the most of the effort, and he didn't. So you get to the stage where you just don't bother any more. Indeed, even reports of his brother's substance abuse came to Mark second-hand. I had occasion to use our local doctor a couple of years ago. He said, "'Yes, I recognize your name.' I said, "'Oh, do you?' He said, "'Oh, I think I might have treated your brother.' And I said, "'Oh, did you really?' And he said, "'Yes, he's the only person ever to have left an empty bottle of gin in my surgery.' Professionally, Stanchel was doing as well as he had in years. The Ruddles ad was a financial success and had propelled him back into the public's consciousness. Among those reminded of his underappreciated talents was Warner Brothers' Rob Dickens, who approached Vivian about recording another Sir Henry album. I immediately got a call from Dickens of Warner's, who I'd known for twenty-five years, recalls Stanchel. He said, "'Let's do Sir Henry, too. I think I miss plaything.' He thought it was so tiresome making millions from Sting that he'd have some fun with me. The idea of resurrecting Sir Henry didn't sit terribly well with Stanchel, who loathed the idea of rehashing his art. Friends said to me for years, "'Why don't you do a follow-up to Sir Henry?' He stated at the time, "'By heavens, I've written seventy songs. I've got a screenplay, hundreds of paintings. It's just getting someone to put their hand in their trousers to finance the thing that's so goddamn difficult.' Years later, in a conversation with Geoffrey Giuliano concerning the continued success of derivative acts, Stanchel discussed his desire to never repeat his art. They're walking around with dead parrots on their shoulders, metaphorically and literally. I don't find that terribly impressive. I wouldn't want to do it. Liverpool poet Adrian Henry said to me at one point, You'll be singing canyons of your mind when you're fifty-five. Will I bugger? It's a terribly dangerous thing to do. At the same time, you feel you've let people down somehow, as it's almost incumbent upon you to be coming out with one-liners and cracks all of the time. 
Well, I'm not going to subscribe to it. I'd go crackers. Still, Vivian did confide in Kai that the Warner's deal was a miracle and gratefully accepted Dickens' offer. In December, Warner Brothers gave him a £20,000 advance for the new Sir Henry record. As part of the contract, Dickens had Vivian promise that he would not see the other Vivian Stanchel. Viv responded, Don't worry, mate. Chapter 13. Calypso to Calypso. Our Friend Ends. Vivian holds the responsibility for his self-destruction, but he wasn't alone in it. He was born without skin. He really was. He was born without the kind of protection most people had against the world. In the end, he became totally dependent upon Monica because he was falling apart rapidly. She was paying his bills and feeding him. She was very good to him. I'm going to be as nice as pie about Monica because I'm very, very grateful for what she did to him in the last year of his life. Kai Longfellow Stancho As far as I'm concerned, my father died of Viking's death. Rupert Stancho After life, after shave, I don't hold with any of it. Sir Henry a newly invigorated Vivian went to work on the new Sir Henry album, but his heart really wasn't in it. He already received a £20,000 advance and would receive another 30000 when the album was complete. Viv was keenly aware that £50,000 was a very good bit of money for what he'd been hired to produce. Recording a Sir Henry album was in itself a rather inexpensive venture. Realistically, he only needed a decent facility and a few hired session musicians for the incidental music. Furthermore, most of the material had already been written from the last few sessions done at the Beeb. Stanchel's plan was to record the album with as little cash as possible and then use the leftover bread to record a proper rock LP as he'd spent the last few years struggling to do. It was where his musical heart remained. When, in an interview at the time, he was asked if he had any regrets, Vivian replied, that I can't wiggle my hips, that I can't play King Creole. To help with the recording of Sir Henry, Stanchel turned to friend and former Grimm's pianist, bassist, John Meganson. Mego, as Vivian liked to call him, became Stanchel's new right-hand man, playing the musical role formerly filled by Neil Innes and Pete Moss. He could do the dots, add intermittent music, and, most importantly, produce the project in his home studio. Moreover, he had the respect and patience it took to work with Vivian. Progress on the album was painfully slow. Stanchel's perfectionism had only worsened over the years. Meanwhile, he continued to devote himself to projects in other media. He was still wholeheartedly dedicated to painting, and spent a good amount of his day at the easel. He'd also finished work on a treatment for a film on his late friend Keith Moon and hoped the project would come to fruition. And there was also another film role. In the summer of 1994, Stanchel flew to Madrid, where he was cast as himself in a radical adaption of Thomas Middleton's The Changeling, a film featuring the talents of Billy Connolly and his old friend from the Central School of Art, Ian Drury. Unfortunately, Stanchel's role would be reduced to more of a bit part. At the time, the film's director, Marcus Thompson, explained to journalist Robert Chalmers that Vivian's contribution would be shorter than expected, as he experienced logistical problems completing his main scene, steering a moped down the beach, wearing an Elizabethan ruff and heavy motorcycle boots. The project, which had already been a long five years in the making, would further require another three years for completion. By the time it came to add sound, Stanchel had already passed away, making his appearance a sadly silent presence, as noted by Sight and Sound's review of the film. Viv returned home to an awaiting Sir Henry, however little or no progress was made. He immediately embarked upon yet another monumental drinking binge. Viv returned home to an awaiting Sir Henry, however little or no progress was made. He immediately embarked upon yet another monumental drinking binge, his drinking worse than ever. Under these circumstances, any work on the record, which was already bordering on impossible, was now completely inconceivable. All that was and ever would be finished of the new Sir Henry record was the music and a smattering of guide vocals. 
It was around this time that American author Vrinda Davy paid a visit to Vivian's cluttered home for what would be one of his final interviews. Amidst all the ethereal bric-a-brac of Viv's ever-dwindling world, they had a very pleasant chat. I wanted to ask you how the rest of the Bonzo dog band were doing. Are they well? Vivian. Well, one's dead, so he's pretty well, the bass player Dennis Cowan. The only one I see regularly is Rodney Slater, who is doing extremely well playing in four bands, as the bass, sax, and clarinet player. I see him nearly every week. He was out on tour with me throughout December last. Roger Ruskinspear has basically given it up. He designs skateboard rings and makes videos on how to do it, but his day job is lecturing in sculpture. He phoned a few years ago and asked if I wanted a thousand tons of topsoil. I said, why, of course I would, dear boy. The reason for this was he decided to further his explosive experiments and needed a completely concrete garden, which he achieved. Then when his kids grew up and wanted to skateboard, he sculpted that. Now he's commissioned to design skateboard arenas, or whatever the hell they're called. Vrinda, you know there are a number of diehard Bonzo fans I've run into. Vivian, well, we've still got the fan club in America, one over here. I've got a personal one, and Neil's got one as well. Vrinda, is there anything you've read or heard lately that particularly excites you? Vivian, the only things I listen to are the projects I'm working on at the moment. I do feel, and indeed broke up the bonzos, because we hadn't read or gone to exhibitions and no longer knew what we were talking about. I'm on sabbatical now and have only been reading for the last few months. Vrinda, what do you think of the music today? Vivian, well, I couldn't comment, as I don't listen to any of it. I occasionally hear things, but I can't put names to these people. I'm very selective about what I watch, so I tape things so I can watch them when I want. As with practically any book or fodder, I can somehow wedge it into a song, story, or what have you. Some bands, Christ, not Casey Kasem, that's another horrid thing we get from America. I'm either writing songs or lyrics or writing, writing, in which case I can't listen to Radio 4 or Radio 1. The only reason I have any other albums around is to exercise in the morning. If I looked at the charts now, I wouldn't have any idea who anyone was unless they're all releases. Vrinda, is there anything that grabs you these days? Maybe rap? Vivian. Well, I thought punk was exciting initially, and I feel the same way about rap. Rap could be our liberation, or might even bludgeon us to death. It seems as though thousands of people think they can do it, and do it well. Maybe they are making a monkey out of themselves, but at least they're doing it. It would be totally unfair to start running off names. I have been impressed with Simply Red and Paul Young, but this is all years ago. I have a son, Rupert, who is twenty-one, and he plays Cream a lot once he discovered them in my collection. The records have been thrashing around the house for years, but their albums had depth. You could play the damn things over and over. I'm sure there are records made today with the same depth. Before you came in, I was listening to Link Ray. I could listen to Link Ray until the cows come home, or Captain Beefheart. Though up until now he had proven himself indestructible, Stanchel's physical health dropped well below where he'd ever allowed it to fall. Even friends who'd grown to endure his periods of self-destruction were taken aback. Mark Milmore remembers. I remember saying to Vivian, you know, you're not going to live much longer. He said, I'll outlive you, Milmore. And I said, well, I bloody well hope not, because that means I don't have long to live. We used to have this sort of banter going on between us. We could be quite brutal to each other, but it was all tongue-in-cheek and a bit of fun. But the last time I saw him, I thought to myself, Oh, dear. This was about six months before he died, and I thought, Oh, dear. Oh, dear. So I came back to Bristol, and I didn't want to think about it, but thought, Vivian is going to last. He's going to be all right. He'll just go into hospital again, and he'll come out again. Neighbor Robert Keenan witnessed Stanchel's erratic behavior firsthand. He would go out to the off-license in just his dressing gown with nothing underneath and only sandals on his feet, observed Keenan at the time. He almost got frostbite because of it one winter. He told me he suffered from panic attacks and he used to get very drunk and stagger all over the place. He often had drinking binges lasting months at a time and then he would stop for months at a time. He was on one of those binges from the end of last year. I think it was probably to do with his flat being burgled. 
Ironically, this burglary was brought on by a typically philanthropic gesture. Despite all the theatrical bombast, Stanchel could often be a soft-hearted person and willing to help out others in time of need. Over the last year of his life, he'd grown concerned with the homeless who lived in an abandoned church up the road from his flat. One evening, while walking home, he came across a couple of begging homeless youths and invited them to stay at his flat for a while. Taking full advantage of their gracious but unhealthy host, the two began to steal from Stanchel. As Keenan recalls, I became aware that there were people visiting his flat who would take things and then sell them back to him because he was incapable of telling what they were doing. I'm sure he wouldn't have allowed them in if he'd been sober. Initially, they only stole a few items, but when Viv checked into the hospital at Christmas time, the situation grew much, much more grave. As Robert Chalmers reports, the couple took advantage of Viv's absence and, using a stolen key, ransacked his flat. This time, they stole nearly all of Viv's possessions, everything from his collection of instruments and paintings to the wrapped gifts he had purchased for friends and family at Christmas. At the time, Stanchel told Mojo's Mark Allen that he had reported the crime to the police and was subsequently informed that, although the authorities knew who the thieves were, they could not be charged with the crime. Devastated by the burglary, Stanchel felt unable to return to Muswell Hill and took temporary refuge with Monica. In early April, he revealed to reporter Vincent Graff, I've just had a break-in, and I can't face it at home. Although the homeless pair had ruthlessly taken advantage of him, Stanchel confided to Monica that given the chance... He would take them in all over again. He said they were cold, and they looked as though they had nowhere to go, Monica revealed to Robert Chalmers. He was someone who liked people, most people, except yobs and men in suits, maybe. I really believe that he wanted to offer people other ways of looking at things. He didn't ever want to believe that anyone was really bad. When Stanchel finally got up the nerve to return home, a man who had been lurking around his bedsit, approached him. He offered to return some of the stolen property to him for fifty pounds a pop. The man intimidated Vivian by yielding a hammer and bragging about having murdered a man. In a later conversation with Mark Ellen, Vivian seemed rather thrilled by this shadowy gangland cartel, explaining, "'He's like a sort of Dickinsonian fence.' He may have seemed cool on the surface, but he was extremely frightened. Under the threat of violence, he did not return to the police for help. Instead, anxious to get back his belongings, Stanchel followed the stranger to a housing project where he found all of his beloved possessions arranged neatly on a bedroom floor. There he would buy a few of them back. On Saturday, March 4th, the same man returned to Stanchel's flat, accompanied by a friend, and told Vivian there was a chance that he would be able to get back more of his possessions. Vivian let them in, but the three never went to collect any of the stolen goods. Evidently, Viv sent the visitors to the off-license. Shortly thereafter, they returned with a sizable supply of liquor. No one knows for sure what followed. Early the following morning, March 5th, 1995, a fire broke out in Vivian's bedroom. Sven Patterson, one of his neighbors, rushed upstairs and knocked on the door. When there was no response, he bravely kicked it in, but couldn't get into the burning flat through the roaring blaze. He desperately rushed downstairs to get a towel to cover his head and begin filling up a tank of water. By the time he returned, however, the firefighters were already on the scene. It was too late. The fire had completely consumed the bed on which Vivian had been sleeping. The unseemly circumstances surrounding Stanchel's death have left many questions for family, friends, and fans. An inquest into Vivian's death revealed the fire was most likely started by either the ignition of paper or clothing by a bedside lamp or perhaps a discarded cigarette. Fire investigator Nigel Davidson believes that a fire, which had smoldered for up to an hour, violently burst into flames and quickly consumed Stanchel's bed. Forensic pathologist Professor David Bowen concluded, 
It seems likely that Mr. Stanchel had been overcome by the effects of alcohol and drugs, which made him very drowsy and unable to respond to the presence of fire. I don't think he would have suffered. Because he was very drowsy and the fire affected him so very rapidly, I think he was unconscious and unaware. Vivian's blood alcohol level was found to be four times the drink-drive limit, and it's estimated he'd consumed two bottles of vodka, a few cans of beer, and a prescription level of Valium. Coroner William Dolman recorded a verdict of accidental death and had this to say. Some twenty-five years ago, here was a man of some fame as lead singer of a well-known band. At the very least, it can be said that here was a very colorful character, a man who lived life, but who clearly for the last twenty years followed a downward spiral because of the effects of alcohol and drugs. As for the seamy crew that dogged Stanchel in his final days, their involvement was never really properly investigated or explained. In the end, like so many who took so much from poor Vivian, they walked away scot-free, the true extent of their crimes forever unknown. The coverage, predictably, was immediate, detailed, extended, and global. Evening Standard, June 13, 1995. Vivian Stanchel burned to death in drunken sleep. The eccentric leader of 60s group the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band died in a fire at his London home after falling unconscious through drink and drugs. An inquest heard today. Coroner Dr. William Dolman said it was a sad ending to a colorful life. The 52-year-old singer, regarded as a comic genius, had become a Valium addict with a serious drink problem dating back perhaps 20 years. He had been drinking heavily and had taken tranquilizers on the night before his death in a one-bedroom flat in Muswell Hill in March this year. Stanchel, whose sole hit I'm the Urban Spaceman reached number five in the charts in 1968, died as a result of extensive burns after a smoldering fire exploded into flames engulfing his bedroom. A neighbor told the inquest how he had kicked the door in but was beaten back by flames as he tried to get into Mr. Stanchel's flat, Recording a verdict of accidental death, Dr. Dolman, coroner for the northern area of Greater London, said, We have heard evidence of a fire which brought to the end a life of someone who had certainly been a true character in the entertainment world, but whose life had spiraled downwards since then. The talented writer and musician had admirers and friends which included John Cleese, Eric Idle, and John Lennon. Fire investigator Nigel Davidson told Hornsey Coroner's Court how the fire may have smoldered up to an hour before exploding. Although the coroner heard that a discarded cigarette could have caused the fire, it was also probable that a bedside lamp may have ignited paper or clothing. Rupert Grant, who told how Mr. Stanchel would occasionally join in with his busking in Muswell Hill, said the pair had been drinking companions for a number of years. I always liked the Bonzo Dog Doodah band as a child, and Viv hated me talking about them. I often quoted things from his records, but when he was drunk, he hated me doing that. At the time of his death, Stanchel had been about to start recording an album. He was working on a variety of stage and film projects, and had been involved with the distinctive Ruddles Air television commercials. He was a prolific painter and poet, and his distinctive voice was immortalized as the narrator on Mike Oldfield's classic Tubular Bells album. Press Association News File, June 13, 1995. Accident Verdict in Bonzo Dog Singer Inquest. The life of eccentric 1960s cult figure Vivian Stanchel had degenerated into a spiral of self-destruction before he died in a blaze at his home, an inquest heard today. Musician and comic innovator Mr. Stanchel, 52, of Hill Field Park, Muswell Hill, North London, was found burned to death in bed on March 5th after neighbors called firefighters to his blazing second-floor flat. The night before the fire, Mr. Stanchel, lead singer of the 1960s group, the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, had been drinking vodka and beer with friends at home. Fire investigators believe the blaze was started either by a lamp placed too close to rubbish on the bedroom floor or by a discarded cigarette. Hornsey Coroner's Court was told Mr. Stanchel was so badly burned that he had to be identified by dental records. On March 4th, Mr. Grant and another friend, Ricky Campbell, arrived at Mr. Stanchel's flat for one of their regular drinking sessions. I think he was drunk before I got there. 
He'd often have a couple of bottles of vodka on the side, and he had some beer as well. He was lying on the bed when I left and was smoking. Because he was drunk, I rolled a cigarette for him. Mr. Grant said he left around 1 a.m. Twice married, Mr. Stanchel was living alone when he died. The Observer, April 23, 1995. The World According to Viv. Robert Chalmers. Vivian Stancho, leader of the Bonzo Dog Duda Band, was the greatest comic talent that British pop music ever produced. His death, caused by a fire at his home last month, left behind a legacy of surreal creations, the most memorable of which was Viv himself. Robert Chalmers mourns the passing of the last English eccentric. As a young man, Vivian Stancho would ride trains on the Piccadilly line, absent-mindedly knotting a length of rope into a noose. When it was finished, he would attempt to hang himself from the overhead handrail. Each time he hurled himself to the floor, the rope would prove too long. Stanchel, seemingly irritated, would return to his seat and struggle to fashion a new knot that would shorten the drop. The failed suicide was one of several diversions he contrived for the entertainment of his fellow travelers. In another, the obvious thief, he kept a pair of artificial hands folded on his lap and blatantly picked the pockets of an accomplice who was dressed as a clergyman. While the vicar was engrossed in a biblical tract, he would be relieved of secular encumbrances such as his wallet, spare spectacles, and pocket watch. Stanchel insisted that at no stage in these routines, even when he was making the final adjustments to his noose, did anyone intervene. "'Nobody tried to save me,' he said." Nobody ever said a damn thing. These words must have an uncomfortable resonance. Even before his death in a fire in his Muswell Hill home, the concept of self-destruction in public had long ceased to be a source of casual amusement to those close to Vivian Stanchel. The one great comic talent British pop music has produced, Stanchel rose to prominence in the mid-1960s as singer with the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. Stanchel would croon his vocal lines with the languid refinement of Jack Buchanan, apparently oblivious to accompaniment, which, on songs like Jollity Farm, would typically include parts for exploding prosthetic devices and speech balloons. An early exponent of the surreal comedy later advanced by Monty Python's Flying Circus, Stanchel was admired by figures such as Michael Palin, John Cleese, and Stephen Fry, who described his attitude to the singer as one of old-fashioned hero worship. Word quickly spread of Stanchel's death. One by one, friends and family began receiving the tragic news, which took a little longer to reach his wife and daughter in America. We were all living together in a little farmhouse in Vermont, remembers Sidney. I took the phone call from Steve Howe, a good friend of ours who had heard it via the news and wanted to call us as fast as possible in case no one had told us yet, which was very good of him. In fact, he was like the only person who thought of doing that, it was just a normal day. I remember feeling, oh my God. There was shock, but not surprise. It was the news you'd been waiting for, like the relative dying of cancer. You know, they're going to go some day, and here it is at last. Then, of course, I had to tell Kai and Silky. Kai, of course, was, well, it was instantaneous devastation. The very first second I found out, I screamed and cried like it broke my heart, remembers Silky. Kai has still not gotten over it and perhaps never will. She can't bear to bring it to mind or even talk about it. Strangely enough, she does remember that for months prior she'd been obsessed with fire and had received an eerie premonition. Vivian always called me at any given time of the day or night, but something about the last few months must have told me more than he ever said, because a month before he died, two things happened. I lived in a small schoolhouse in rural Vermont, heated only by a large wood stove, which we all called stove. This thing could get red hot, heating up the living room to over a hundred degrees if filled too full. But for the years I lived there, I thought little of it. Yet starting in early February, snowed in and freezing outside, I began to obsess about stove. How hot could it get before it blew up? Before it started a chimney fire. Our little wooden house, a hundred and fifty years old, would burn in minutes. I began to smell smoke day and night. My bedroom was in the converted attic. I couldn't sleep up there anymore. 
I had to be where I could see stove to do something if a fire started. So I began sleeping on the couch in the living room less than ten feet away from it. I slept on the couch until the night of Vivian's death, and each night I'd awake five or six times in terror of fire. I was driving Sydney and Silky quite nuts with all this nonsense. When the call came in early March telling me that Vivian had died, I stopped thinking about our fire. The fear vanished, just like that. Of course, it was replaced by something much worse. During one of those nights on the couch, I dreamed I was alone, walking in a wide, empty street of London. I knew the street. I knew the street was one that began with an H and an O and an L, and in the way of dreams, I decided it was Holborn, even though I knew it wasn't, but Holborn would have to do. Everything was in black and white, dreary and ominous, a kind of film noir dream. There was no one else on the street, no cars, no people, no shops, nothing but myself and a short, bulky man in a long, dark coat and a hat. The man was carrying a small wooden box. I knew Vivian was somehow in the box. I remember my heart beating in the dream. Was it really beating, or was it I dreaming it was beating? The man seemed confused, as if he'd been wandering for some time in this black and white world, as if he might continue wandering for ages to come. I asked if I could help him with his task, which was finding somewhere to take the box. He seemed grateful for the offer. That's all I recall except for waking up and feeling terrified something had happened to Vivian. I called him immediately, and he answered, not jovial, but alive, quite alive. I set the dream aside until it came back with a horrid snap the next day. I stood outside the cremation with Vivian's ashes in a small wooden box. The name of the crematorium was Hoop Lane. Stenchel's death was a devastating blow to friends, family, and fans. Though many who knew him were not surprised by his death, he was built like an ox, you know, explains Mark Milmore, so I reckon that most people who burnt the candle at both ends like Vivian would have died long ago. I mean, he was a very strong fellow, a very big fellow. He could take a lot of punishment, but obviously any human being can only take so much self-abuse, can't they? He was the accident waiting to happen, agrees Vivian's younger brother Mark. I wasn't surprised, but I was very shocked and sad, explains longtime collaborator and friend Pete Moss. It really did shock me, and it shouldn't have really, because how the man survived the drink and drugs the way he'd carried on in his life, nobody knows. Apparently he'd been to the doctor with heart palpitations for years, but the doctor said, I don't know why you're coming to me. You've got a heart stronger than an ox. He'd become like a brother to me, I suppose. I don't want to romanticize too much about it, but it did shock me pretty badly. I was quite hard hit about it, really. It took me days to sort of come to terms with it. There was one final Stanchillian twist. Police investigating Vivian's death discovered that the real Sir Henry Rawlinson, an officer in the Indian Army, had died March 5th, 1895, precisely one hundred years ago to the day of Stanchel's untimely death. To a few, this last twist was a little too unbelievable, and served as further evidence that Vivian may have taken his own life. However, most believe it's purely a strange coincidence, agreeing that Vivian would certainly have enjoyed such a bizarre turn of events. A small funeral was held for Stanchel's family and close friends at Calder's Green Crematorium. In deference to Vivian's mother, the Mass was traditionally Catholic. Among those in attendance were Mark and Aline Stanchel, Silky, Kai, Rupert, and his wife Sandy, Rodney Slater, and John Meganson. A public memorial was held on March 21st at St. Patrick's Church in Soho. Among the many friends and admirers that had come to pay their respects were Jack Bruce, Steve Winwood, Roger McGough, and the remaining Bonzos. Neil Innes delivered a stirring eulogy that questioned whether Stanchel was immensely brave or merely reckless. He remembered his friend and collaborator as a man who bequeathed to us all the comedy and tragedy in his life in order to illuminate our own. Perhaps the most touching moment came with Steve Winwood's acoustic rendition of Ark of a Diver. Its brilliant lyrics, truly a reminder of Vivian's poetic grace, moved many to tears. For many... 
The memorial was less a somber farewell and more a celebration of the extraordinary life of an exceptional artist and man. Mark Milmore remembers, When Winwood played Ark of a Diver, it lifted the spirit a bit. I thought, well, yeah, this is a celebration of Vivian's life. We're not getting too sad here because it wasn't a wasted life. You could say in one sense that the potential was never fulfilled because of the self-destructive element in him, but it wasn't a wasted life. Of course, a celebration of Vivian Stanchel's life would not be complete without a touch of comedy. Many of Stanchel's contemporaries in attendance were members of the Chelsea Arts Club and recognized his brother Mark Stanchel only as the club's weekend doorman. As I came with Ma, Mark recalls, I could see all these members that I knew who obviously didn't realize that I was Vivian's brother. I imagined them saying, Why does the doorman get such a good seat at the front? After the service, Kai and Silky took the ashes back to the States. About a year later, Aline Stanchel realized that her son's ashes had gone missing. After a bit of negotiation, the ashes were returned to England, finding their final resting place in a local cemetery, the exact location the family keeps to themselves. Shortly after his death, Stanchel received tribute from one of his greatest and most devoted fans— John Peel in a BBC Two late-night obituary special entitled Diamond Geezer. The name of Vivian Stanchel is probably familiar to far fewer people than it should be, lamented Peel. In his day, Viv was as funny as anyone ever has been, and far funnier than most. Much of the rock media followed suit, devoting both airtime and ink to mourn Stanchel's death and celebrate his incredible life. The praise was perhaps too little too late. Even now, articles celebrating Stanchel continue to sprout up. One has to ask where was the praise when Stanchel needed it the most. One thing I do feel for him is a tremendous relief, explains Vivian's first wife, Monica. Relief that he is out of it. Because life was not peace for him, life was torment. Now he is out of it. All of the pain is gone. The way it happened, he didn't have to make the decision, and he didn't know anything about it, which is a blessing. I know he often felt desperate and alone. I just feel sorry that he didn't really understand how much he was loved, because so many people had so much love for Vivian. I would like him to have known that. Indeed, many did have a tremendous love for Vivian Stanchel. He was unquestionably a major inspiration to countless musicians, performers, and artists alike. His humor, uncanny wit, and extraordinary colorful imagination touched many in an intensely personal way. Those that came to know his art feel an inextricable bond and allegiance to him. But did Vivian ever realize this? Or did his overwhelming anxieties and perfectionism blind him to it? Whether he realized it or not, this love for him, his art, and his panache was, and will continue to be, unquestionably profound." Mark Milmore remembers the man who inspired and pushed him to follow his own artistic dreams. He changed a lot of people's lives, even for me, for instance. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. I wouldn't be in the place I am now if it weren't for Vivian. He actually diverted me from one course. I would say that if I hadn't met Vivian, I would be a boring school teacher now, probably aged 43, feeling rather regretful, saying to myself, what life might have been if I'd done this or I'd done that. But Vivian prevented me from going down that road. I think he did this for a number of people as well. Whether he did this inadvertently or whether he did it on purpose is beside the point. He cared about people. You understand that? He cared. He was concerned and he cared about others. I don't know who else he helped in that way. But from my point of view, I owe a debt to Vivian, which I can never, ever repay. I think for me anyway, he had an effect on my life, and I shall always love the old bugger because of that. I suppose we all remember the good times, the funny times, says Pete. To be honest, I remember in the early days just talking quite like normal people, talking about ridiculous things he used to find in newspapers, or ridiculous topics that nobody else would have dreamed people like us would ever talk about. That's how I remember him. 
quite a calm person, really. If I look back on him, I never have any bad feelings, even though he drove me mad and I could certainly have cheerfully killed him on several occasions. I always look back on him with a warm affection. I'll remember what he did, explained Sidney. It was that magic he created, that incredibly intensity, color, humor, pathos, music, and painting. The way he dressed and the way he looked, that was all of it, in its entirety, an artwork. His life was an artwork. So that's what I remember, the consummate artist. I think one of the biggest causes of angst in his life, besides his own personal needs and emotional problems, was that life could be so ugly in places and that people didn't care. You know the sort of banality of modern life, the ugly buildings and the ugly clothes. I'm still in denial, confides daughter Silky. I think someday he's going to call up and say, Hey, it was all a big mistake. I've been in Sicily with my mafia. I'm a made man, you know. I really do think he's going to call, you know. I really do. I always had the knowledge that I could call him at any time of day or night collect, and he'd always answer the phone, and he would always be there for me. I don't have that anymore. Overall, what will most be missed is Vivian's engrossing art. Despite the fact that interest in his work continues to grow, Stanchel's artistic legacy is in danger of being overshadowed by the constant focus on his so-called eccentricities. This was his struggle in life, and it would be a horrible disservice if it were to become his struggle in death. As much as he produced, the unrealized potential is in itself the real tragedy. In the end, Stanchel lives on, a genius for the ages, not in one medium, mind you, but in life, the consummate life artist, and no one knows this better than Kai. I said he was and is a national treasure. He should have been taken care of. He should have been valued. Part of his failure was not just a personal failure, but a failure, I believe, on the part of society— the way they view an artist, the way they treat an artist, the way that he was exploited, he was kicked when he was down, often. He wasn't offered helping hands from people with lesser talent and lots and lots of money. They knew and did nothing but talk about how wonderful he was. Yes, I would say that Vivian holds the responsibility for his self-destruction, but he wasn't alone in it. He was born without a skin. You know, he really was. He was born without the kind of protection most people have against the world. He was totally aware of all of it. The sensations and pain he felt were so overwhelming that he masked everything in alcohol and drugs. It helped him not to feel these things. It helped him to get through the day. It helped him to create it something like 25% of his capacity, but it also killed him. He recognized, in the end, that he had created demons that were unnecessary and that he'd spent his whole life fighting them. He would love to be seen as the gentle soul he really was, that behind the puffery and the bombast and the monster he created to face people, which was his protection, the genuine heart that was behind all of that. God, he was so soft, really. He was so sweet. And the rage he had was the rage against self. I remember once him howling in the dark. He looked up at the moon and howled like a wolf. He yelled, Why me? Why me? The end. Thank you, Vivian. I love you too. Gee.